Hello everyone, I am Siddharthan. In this YouTube channel, I teach about artificial intelligence and machine learning. Recently, I planned to make a complete machine learning course with both conceptual topics and hands on part in Python. Uh, this will be a 60 hours long course with 5 parts, and each part will be around 12 hours. And uh, there will be several use cases and projects in each of these uh, parts. And I have tried to add as much topics as possible that are like very important. So all these videos are already present in my YouTube channel individually and I wanted to combine all these things together so that it is easier for a person who is just starting to learn about machine learning. So I hope you have a great time learning this and all the best to you. So let me just quickly uh, tell you what are all the topics that will be present in this first part. So uh, we totally have about 10 modules in this machine learning course and this first module will be machine learning basics where I explain you about what is the difference between artificial intelligence, machine learning and deep learning. Then the next topic will be what are all the different types of machine learning such as uh, supervised learning, unsupervised learning, reinforcement learning and we will discuss in detail about each of these topics individually and I explain you about what is meant by deep learning and how it differs from machine learning and what are all the different applications of it. So this is more of a theoretical part where we understand the very basics of ML. And the second module is again a very important one on Python basics for machine learning. So all the use cases and uh, programming that we do in this uh, you know, course will be in Python. So it is important for us to understand some of the basics of Python. So there will be uh, you know, how to use Google Collaboratory. So Google Collaboratory is the platform that we use for our coding again in this course. So I have given you the basic understanding of how to use this Google Collaboratory and what are all the features. Then there are uh, topics such as like various data types, list, dictionary, tuple, etc. And uh, you know how to use loops in Python and how to create functions in Python. So those topics will be covered in the second module. And third module is again an interesting module where we discuss about some of the important libraries that we need uh, in machine learning such as NumPy, Pandas, Matplotlib and Seaborn. So NumPy is more of a uh, 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 library that supports this numpy array where we do several mathematical operations and pandas is more of a data frame which you can consider about like a tables and matplotlib and seaborn are mainly used for data visualization where we build this uh, you know plots and graphs and this is like a very important uh, library that is like widely used in data science applications where we need to build this plots to understand the data better and the fourth module will be data collection and pre-processing where I will explain you about where you can collect this data, what are all the reliable sources that we have for this data collection and how to do various data processing uh, like uh, handling the missing values and, and uh, you know how to handle uh, imbalance data set, train test split label encoding and all these topics will be covered here and also I have explained about how to handle textual data as well. So these are all the four modules that we have. And uh, once all these modules are uh, completed, so there will be three use cases video. So the first use case will be on rock versus mine prediction where we train a machine learning model to predict whether an object is a rock or it is a mine. So that will be the first use case and the second use case will be predicting whether a person will be having diabetes or not. So this will be the second use case and the third one is an uh, interesting one regarding textual analysis where we try to build a machine learning system that predicts whether a male is uh, a normal mail or it is a spam mail. So this will be the topics that we will be covering in this first part of this machine learning course. So once this part is completed, so I'll uh, upload videos on the upcoming parts where you have like more advanced and complex topics on machine learning such as uh, different machine learning models, processes like cross validation, hyperparameter tuning, etc. Okay. So again, all the very best. So I hope you have a great time and uh, I'll create a GitHub repository and put all the code and Jupyter notebook files that is uh, done uh, in all these videos so you can like refer that as well and most importantly i will also give you timestamps for all these individual topics so if you are interested in a specific topic you can like skip to that part okay so let's get started artificial intelligence machine learning and deep learning so when you start learning about ai or machine learning this is one of the most basic and inevitable question you need to answer and uh, often interviewers ask this question to know whether someone really knows about this topic or he is just making things up. So let's try to understand what is the relationship between these terms and then we shall try to understand what these three concepts mean. Okay. First of all, so there is a picture which clearly represents the relationship between these terms. So as you can see this image, this Venn diagram, artificial intelligence is a broader field. 
and machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence and again deep learning is a further subset of machine learning okay so this is the relationship between them now let's try to understand about these topics separately so what happens is people sometimes think that all these three terms mean the same thing but that's not the case so as i said earlier ml is a subset of ai and deep learning is a subset of ml okay now let's try to understand these topics separately so what is artificial intelligence artificial intelligence is a branch of computer science that is concerned with building smart and intelligent machines so what does intelligent machines mean and what does non intelligent machines mean let's try to understand this with some examples so examples of non intelligent machines can be you know it can be a watch or it can be a bike because these machines cannot think these machines cannot make decisions or do new things they are given a set work and they just do that work repeatedly and what are intelligent machines so example for intelligent machines are autonomous cars example you can consider a tesla car and you can also consider google assistant which we you know encounter it in our daily life so a tesla car is more you know intelligent than a normal car because it you know it doesn't require any input from the driver and it can uh, drive the car autonomously and google assistant is something that uh, you know it uses ai for its function so when we you know text google assistant in our phone we don't feel like it is a computer software we feel as if it is a human being so these are intelligent machines because they can think and give you an answer they can do new things they can make their decisions of their own which is not possible in the case of non intelligent machines so artificial intelligence is all about making these intelligent machines okay now let's try to understand about machine learning so what is machine learning machine learning is a technique to implement artificial intelligence that can learn from the data by themselves without being explicitly programmed so machine learning is all about the data okay so let's try to consider an example so i want a system to detect whether the image is the image of iron man or captain america okay so this is the task i set for the system okay so we need to make this system so when we take a machine learning approach what we will do is for the machine learning algorithm we will feed numerous images of both iron man and captain america and we will tell that algorithm that these images are of iron man and these images are of captain america so now the algorithm without our input it just finds the pattern between the images and when you give a new image it can predict correctly whether that image is of iron man or captain america so this is all about machine learning okay so what we do is we just give the algorithm a lot of data to learn from okay it is just similar to a child seeing something and learning from it so we just give it data and we don't need to do anything else so it can find the patterns and learn from itself so this is called as machine learning and uh, this is how we implement ai okay now let's try to understand about deep learning deep learning is again a subfield of machine learning that uses a special type of algorithms called as artificial neural networks to learn from the data so this is a pictorial representation of the artificial neural network okay so these artificial neural networks are, are modeled from our human brain from the neurons present in our human brains there are numerous uh, neurons in our brain that are interconnected so each neuron processes the information and sends the output to another neuron so this is the same concept used in the case of artificial neural networks so they are nothing but a mathematical model that are connected like uh, the neurons in our brain okay so there are different layers in uh, those artificial neural networks so as you can see here the first layer is an input layer then there are several hidden layers and then there will be outer output layer okay so we can discuss about this in more detail in the future videos but you know in this video the idea is to give you a short idea about what these three terms mean okay so first we see what is meant by artificial intelligence so then we saw what is meant by machine learning so machine learning is a technique to implement artificial intelligence and again deep learning is one of the subset of machine learning which just uses artificial neural networks okay so that's it about the difference between these three terms intelligence machine learning and deep learning in this video i would like to explain you about the different types of machine learning okay so first of all i'll explain you what is meant by machine learning with an example then we will look into all the different types okay so machine learning machine learning is a technique to implement artificial intelligence 
that can learn from the data by themselves without being explicitly programmed okay so the ultimate goal in machine learning is to make intelligent machines right and how we do is by making the machine to learn from the data okay so we don't do explicit program which means we don't tell the machine exactly what it has to do so it has to you know find those ways by itself so i'll try to explain this with an example okay so we want a machine to see an image and to recognize whether the image represents a dog or cat okay so this is the goal for the system we are building now in machine learning what we will do is we will make the model or the machine learning model to learn from the data here the data will be several images of dogs and cats okay so we will feed this images of dogs and cats to our machine learning model and with the help of these images it tries to find pattern in these images and when you give a new image it can recognize whether the image represents a dog or cat okay so this is how machine learning works so it basically learns from the data okay now let's discuss about the different types of machine learning okay so there are three main types of machine learning one is supervised learning the next one is unsupervised learning and the third one is reinforcement learning okay so in supervised learning there is some supervision to the machine learning algorithm by the programmers or by us and in unsupervised learning there is no supervision for the machine and reinforcement learning is completely a different type and it it is not related to each of this supervised or unsupervised learning okay so let's try to understand this in more detail first of all supervised learning in supervised learning the machine learning algorithm le learns from labeled data so we already see that uh, you know uh, in machine learning the model learns from the data right so what is what is meant by labeled data set let's say that a machine learning model has to see an image and recognize whether the image represents an apple or a mango okay so now what we will do is we will take several images of apples and mangoes and we will tell the machine that these images belongs to apples and these are the images of mangoes okay now these apples and mangoes so this uh, name is called as labels and we feed this label data set to our machine learning model now our machine learning model or machine learning algorithm tries to find the patterns between these images okay and once it it has learned from the data when you give an unknown image it can correctly recognize whether the image represents an apple or a mango so this is how supervised learning works so we are telling it it is uh, you know known as supervised learning because we are giving a supervision in terms of labels okay now let's discuss about unsupervised learning so in unsupervised learning the machine learning algorithm learns from unlabeled data here we won't tell what that data represents okay so we won't give any labels let's consider a similar example so we will give several images of apple and mangoes to our machine learning model and we won't tell that these images belong to apple or these images belong to mango so we feed all these images without telling what it is to our machine learning model and what it does is it tries to again find the pattern and it tries to group all these images and it will group the images into group 1 and group 2 okay so all the apples will be grouped in one group and all the mangoes will be grouped in another group so when you give a new image of an apple or a mango it tells you whether it belongs to the group 1 or group 2 so this is called as unsupervised learning because we are not giving any supervision in terms of labels okay so this is called as unsupervised learning and the third one is reinforcement learning okay so the reinforcement learning is not similar to you know supervised or unsupervised learning it's quite different from both other types okay so let's try to understand this in more detail so this is the definition of reinforcement learning reinforcement learning is an area of machine learning concerned with how intelligent agents take actions in an environment to maximize its rewards okay so it can be a bit difficult to understand but i'll try to break down this you know definition into a simple steps so there are four main aspects in reinforcement learning they are environment agent action and reward okay so there will be an environment and what we need to do is we need to build an agent that acts in that environment okay so that agent in that environment it tries to take some actions and for that action it gains some rewards okay so let's try to understand this with an example we want to make a computer software or a computer program that can play chess like a human being okay so here our chessboard becomes the environment 
and our computer become the agent okay so in the environment of chessboard our agent which is the computer tries to take actions so the actions represents the move the computer takes okay so in the chess and uh, for each step it gets a reward so the ultimate reward is winning the chess game okay so for each step it takes closer to winning it will get a positive reward okay so if it takes a bad step or bad move so it will get a negative reward so by this the machine tries to learn how to play that game okay so several applications are there for reinforcement learning for example you know several game playing artificial intelligence are based on reinforcement learning and uh, at uh, all the autonomous uh, systems like cars and uh, automatic drones are based on reinforcement learning okay so these are the different types of machine learning so first we have discussed about what is meant by supervised learning where we basically give the machine learning algorithm labeled data set and in unsupervised learning we give unlabeled data set and reinforcement learning we will try to make an agent that acts in an environment to increase its chance of winning okay so this is the three main types of machine learning what are the different types of supervised learning okay so this is the agenda for today's video and uh, i want this channel to be more interactive so from now on i will give a link for each video in the description and in that link you will find a google form containing mcqs for that particular topic for example so in the description of this video you will find a google form link that contains mcq on the topic supervised learning okay so once you uh, complete watching these videos you can try to answer those mcqs okay so let's get started supervised learning so supervised learning is a type of machine learning in which the machine learning algorithm learns from the labeled data set okay so here the most important thing to note here is the algorithm learns from the labeled data okay so what is this labeled data so in machine learning generally we feed the machine learning algorithm a lot of data and we tell the algorithm that that this data represents this label okay and the algorithm tries to map the labels and the data so that it can recognize it okay let's try to understand this more deeply with an example so we want our machine learning model to see an image and recognize whether it represents an apple or a mango okay so this is the task for a machine learning algorithm so in the case of supervised learning what we will do is we will feed the images of apples and mangoes and we will tell the machines that these images represents apples and these images represents mangoes okay and we feed these images to our ml model and what it does it, it tries to find the relationship between these images and it maps it to the label which is apples and mangoes okay now it knows uh, you know how a apple looks and how a mango looks okay so once it learned from the data when you give an unknown image it can predict co correctly whether it is an apple or a mango so this is how supervised learning works so the important point to note here is we are training the machine learning model with data which is labeled okay so in case of unsupervised learning we don't give the machine learning algorithm the labels okay so that is the difference between supervised and unsupervised learning okay now let's discuss about the types of supervised learning there are two main types of supervised learning one is classification and another one is regression okay so what is meant by this classification and regression so classification is about predicting a class or discrete value okay so there is just the, these class or labels okay so there is not continuous values like numbers so it will predict whether you know the problem statement we have to predict whether it's a male or female true or false like that okay so there will only be classes and in regression we try to predict a continuous values for example like the salary age and price okay say for example um we need to predict salary of a person from his work experience okay so the salary will be in a continuous number right so those kinds of problem statements are done using regression models okay in classification we just predict it's you know whether true or false or male or female say for example the example we have seen before where our model classifies the images into apples or mangoes whereas in regression we find a particular number okay so let's try to understand this with another example so first of all classification so we want our machine learning model to see an image and recognize whether the image is you know a dog or cat so what we will do is we will give the labels and the data to our machine learning model so it maps with that label and the images 
now we can tell whether it is a dog or cat so this represents classification because we are just classifying the image into either dog or cat okay so there is no middle values right so there is not any decimal values here it is just binary in this case now let's discuss about an example for regression let's say that we need to predict the rainfall in centimeter value for a given temperature or pressure and different factors on which the rainfall depends okay so what we will do is we will train our machine learning model with this data like for example so we will tell the machine learning model that for this temperature there will be this much amount of rainfall and for uh, you know uh, different cases like this and uh, when the model is learned from the data when we give a new temperature value it can tell you how much rainfall we can expect so the rainfall in centimeter will be a continuous value it can be a decimal value right so this is called as regression so in classification we try to uh, you know predict the class or type but in regression we try to predict or we try to find a number okay so that is the difference between classification and regression so there are a various lot of different types of application on classification and regression so which we will see in our later videos in our project videos okay now let's see what are some most important algorithms for classification and regression decision tree classification random forest classification k nearest neighbor classification so these are some examples of classification algorithms and uh, regression model algorithms includes logistic regression polynomial regression and support vector machine regression so it's okay if you don't understand what is meant by these algorithms so we will be working on each type of algorithms once we start doing the hands on part so i'll be explaining about them in more detail once we start those are the types of unsupervisioning so if you haven't watched those videos do check out them now let's discuss about what is meant by unsupervised learning and what are the different types of unsupervised learning tasks okay so unsupervised learning in unsupervised learning the machine learning algorithms learn from unlabeled data so this is the difference between supervised and unsupervised learning where in supervised learning we use labeled data so we will tell our machine learning model that this data represents this item like that and we won't uh, say those things in unsupervised learning so we will train our model with unlabeled data okay so let's try to understand this with an example so we have several images of apples and mangoes and uh, so once we feed this data to our machine learning model so what happens is it can group the uh, uh, group the data so group these images based on uh, you know similar patterns so it can uh, group the apples in one group and it can group the mangoes in the second group okay so what happens here is we are not telling the model that these images represents apples and these images represents mangoes so we are not giving that label whereas in supervised learning we will tell the machine that these images represents apple okay so that's the difference between supervised and unsupervised learning so what happens is it automatically finds the pattern between those images and it groups the similar items in one group and uh, another uh, items in another group okay so this is the idea behind unsupervised learning so now let's try to see what are the different uh, types of unsupervised learning and actually one more thing so why we are calling uh, this as unsupervised learning is that in supervised learning we are giving uh, supervision to our machine okay so there is like a supervisor who gives the machine the labels okay but we are not giving any labels or supervision here hence this is called as unsupervised learning so what are the types of unsupervised learning there are two types of unsupervised learning so first task is clustering and the another task in unsupervised learning is association okay so what is meant by clustering and association then so clustering is an unsupervised learning task which involves grouping the similar data points so this is the example which we have discussed right now which is uh, the apple and mango uh, example where we group the similar data points and in association supervised learning test we just try to find some important relationship between data points okay so in a, in a big data set we try to find which data points are associated so which are similar okay so let's try to understand these two tasks in more detail first of all clustering okay so let's say that we get a project from from a mobile network company so they want us to su suggest some ways on how they can increase their user base and how they can increase their revenue okay so they are giving us uh, their user data and uh, what we find is so we are feeding it to a clustering algorithm so unsupervised learning algorithm and this model is uh, clustering the data into two clusters so okay so this is one possibility where people who are having high call duration may have very less internet usage and people who are having high internet usage 
may have i call duration okay so this is a possibility and uh, now what we can suggest that network company is that they can give uh, offers on uh, internet usage for those people who are having i call duration and less internet usage okay and uh, we can give offers on call durations for people uh, who are having less internet usage and vice versa by this you know people tend to use both these features more okay so this is one way by, by which they can increase their revenue by you know where people can uh, opt for both the plans so this is one clustering example where the machine learning algorithm can, can cluster the data based on the user experience based on the user data okay now let's try to understand about association so let's consider there is a supermarket and there are several customers who are buying these products specifically so a customer buys bread milk uh, you know fruits and wheat so there is another kind of customers who are buying bread milk rice and butter okay so the important association between all these customer is that if someone buys bread that customer obviously is buying milk okay so this is one of the important uh, you know relationship we have found and this is this can be used really well and uh, when a customer buys uh, bread we can suggest them that they have, they can buy milk so the third customer is most most probably is going to buy milk also okay so this is one of the method where we can use association so i would like to give you another interesting example in this case so we are all uh, you know uh, used to the famous ott platforms like netflix and amazon prime so those ott platforms use this kind of algorithms to suggest us movies okay so let's say that i am watching uh, avengers movie okay so now uh the netflix can suggest me uh, movies uh, regarding you know the superhero movies because someone who have already watched avengers may have watched other superhero movies so it associates those uh, user behaviors and it can suggest me movies watched by that user so this is one of the interesting uh, applications of uh, unsupervised learning so these are some interesting examples now let's see what are some uh, important unsupervised learning algorithms so Uh, so apart from these five algorithms there are also several unsupervised learning algorithms but these five are very important algorithms so we have k means clustering hierarchical clustering which are examples of clustering examples and uh, there is another uh, algorithm called as principal component analysis which is used to reduce the dimensions of our data let's say for example we have a data set where it contains 1000 rows and 100 columns so we want to reduce this dimension okay so the columns represent the features so we can use this principal component analysis algorithm to find which columns or which features are very important for our application okay so that is where principal component analysis is used and it is a type of an unsupervised learning algorithms where we won't give the uh, machine learning algorithm any labels okay and there are other two algorithms a priori and eclat so these two algorithms are example of association task okay so these are some of the important uh, unsupervised learning algorithms discussing what is meant by deep learning what is meant by neural network what are the important applications of deep learning and also we are going to discuss about some important events that made deep learning so much popular okay so these are the topics we'll be discussing so let's get started first of all what is meant by deep learning so deep learning is a subfield of machine learning that uses artificial neural networks to learn from the data so we have already seen the difference between artificial intelligence machine learning and deep learning so we know that artificial intelligence is a subfield of machine learning right so in machine learning we basically use several data and we feed this data to our machine learning algorithm to make predictions right so in deep learning what we do is we feed it to a specialized algorithms called as artificial neural networks okay so this is the difference between machine learning and deep learning okay so now let's try to understand how this uh, you know artificial neural networks is inspired so this is the diagram of uh, neurons present in our human brain okay so this neuron consists of eight and the eight consist of a nucleus okay so this is where the information is processed in our brain okay so once the information is processed it passes through the neuron body through the axon and from there it is transferred to another neuron and the pathway goes on like this so this is how the information is processed in our brain and it is transferred to some part of our body okay so this is the exact principle that inspired artificial neural networks as you can see here this is the diagrammatic representation of the artificial neural network code so basically what happens is we have individual neurons connected to each other which forms the neural network okay so each neuron has a mathematical function assigned to it so this uh, neuron processes the data say for example we uh, want to 
you know recognize what is the image represents so we want to basically do an uh, image recognition task so we feed the image to this neural network and uh, in the input layer this image will be splitted into it, its uh, respective pixels so there will be a lot of pixels and each of these pixels will be given to several neurons and in the input layer this uh, information this pixel value will be processed and it will be transferred to the eaten layer and then uh, again there will be some processing happening in the eaten layer and then it will be transferred to the output layer where the image is predicted okay so this is how the uh, neural network works so as i told there are three main layers in the neural networks so first one is the input layer then is the hidden layers and finally we have output layer okay so there can be any number of hidden layers in a neural network depending on the task we are doing, doing okay so each neuron has a mathematical function so as i have told you and this process the information and each neuron in the input layer is connected to each neuron in the hidden layer okay and this is how the information is passed and uh, the respective prediction is made okay so this is all about artificial neural networks now let's try to understand what is the difference main difference between machine learning algorithms and deep learning okay so rather than difference it is you know deep learning has one main advantage over machine learning so that you know difference is feature extraction okay so what is meant by this feature extraction let's say that we want a machine learning model to predict whether an image represents a car okay so when you are giving it to a machine learning model we need to tell the model that these features are important for a car okay for example if it is a car it should have four wheels and it should have a shape like this and all that right so we need to give those features to our machine learning model we have to manually tell them that these features are important but we don't need to do that in the case of deep learning because the neural networks are so much powerful than any machine learning algorithms they can determine those feature uh, by uh, themselves okay so that is the main advantage of deep learning or machine learning where we don't need to uh, extract the feature manually okay now let's uh, try to understand the events that made deep learning so much popular okay so there is a famous deep learning company called as deep mind so it is based in uh, united kingdom so it was started around 2010 so deep learning was there you know from that point of time and even before that so what happened is in 2014 google acquired this company so uh, deep mind basically made game playing artificial intelligence system okay so uh, there is this famous game called as go so this go this uh, board game like chess but it is so much complicated and so much you know uh, deeper than chess because in chess there is limited number of uh, moves one can make but the possibilities in go is so much more so there are several moves one can make based on the configuration of the game okay so in 2016 they made a machine learning sorry a deep learning system that can play this go game and they challenged the world champion lee sedol so he is 18 time uh, world champion and they challenged him for a five match tournament okay so that game playing system was made based on deep learning okay so they have been developing this uh, over you know five or six years and uh, they challenged him and what happened is in the tournament of five games so alpha go which is the system deep mind build has beat lee sedol for four is to one okay so it has won four matches and lee sedol won one matches and that is where people started to look at deep learning and realize that deep learning is so much powerful than any other algorithms in machine learning okay so after that several researches were made and several modifications have been done to the neural networks and several different types of neural networks have been uh, you know invented after that so this is the point from which deep learning got so much uh, you know popular and it was used in several kinds of fields after that okay let's try to understand one such example for this so diabetic retinopathy so diabetic retinopathy is a condition where a patient may lose his eyesight lose his vision due to diabetes mellitus okay so this deep mind developed a system uh, based on deep learning that can determine whether a person has a diabetic retinopathy from uh, the eye scans okay so how this is basically made is the deep learning model will be trained with several normal eye images which does not have any disease and uh, the model will be again trained with several images which has diabetic retinopathy okay so once it trained when a new image is fed to this model it can predict whether the person has diabetic retinopathy or not so the interesting thing that happened here is it doesn't only uh, predict whether the person has diabetic retinopathy or not it also predicted the gender of uh, the patient whether uh, you know the image 
of the uh, is of a male or a female it also predicted whether they have some uh, some other medical conditions or not so this is one of the fascinating thing that happened where the deep learning also predicted several other things rather than only the uh, patient has diabetic retinopathy or not okay so uh, these events led to the boom of uh, deep learning after that it was used in several other fields now let's discuss about some of the important applications of deep learning first one is healthcare okay so the example which we have seen now is an example of healthcare application so apart from this uh, deep learning is used in several diagnostic departments where it is used to predict whether a person has a specific image, a specific disease or not based on their scans images and other data so another example where deep learning used is uh, the field of autonomous cars so autonomous cars like tesla doesn't need uh, much driver input to drive the car right so they can drive the car by themselves and it is powered by deep learning models then we have computer vision so computer vision is one of the important application of deep learning so it is based on image processing techniques where the neural network is uh, trained with several images so one such example is face recognition system in our phones so it is based on computer vision then there is natural language processing so natural the example of natural language processing is uh, chatbots which we most of us would have come across and other virtual assistants like google assistant siri and alexa all these technologies are powered by deep learning or neural networks okay so these are some of the important applications of deep learning this video is the first video in our second module which is python basics for machine learning so in our machine learning course the first module we have discussed about the machine learning basics and this module is all about python basics for machine learning and now let's see how we can access google collaboratory so to use google collaboratory you don't need to install any software so you don't need to install any python software or other applications you just need to have a, a good web browser so you know google chrome is uh, better suited for this one so just go to google and search google collab so here you will see this uh, web page called as research.google.com so go to this welcome to collaboratory so this is where we are going to do our python programming in most of our projects in this channel so here you can give this new notebook so you can also see this uh, you know topics here so your google drive will be connected to your google collaboratory account so you can access your uh, google collaboratory files from google drive as well so i'll create a new notebook from here so if you are starting new with a project or with a, with a program you can go to this new notebook and uh, this will take you to the site so this is the interface of google collaboratory so yeah so first of all let's change the name of this file so you can see here it shows untitled zero so this is where uh, you know this is the name of the file and let me change this to google collaboratory basics so we call this in a short form as google collab so you can see this here i p y n b so p y n b means python notebooks there is another type of uh, notebook files called as uh, jupyter notebooks you can also download uh, this uh, google collaboratory files so you can see this uh, download option here so you can download this as either python notebooks or uh, .py so .py means python files so you can open this uh, python notebooks in your jupyter notebooks as well so after this we need to connect our system so you can see this connect option here so google collaboratory is uh, basically a cloud based uh, you know application where we can run python programs so what happens is when we connect our system our uh, you know python environment will be connected to google's back end server and that is you know in that servers our codes will run so this is how it works and you will be allocated a ram and a cpu so you can uh, check the details of your ram here so it says 12 GB of RAM and uh, we have about 100 GB of storage. So 12 GB of RAM is really good for us. So good for uh, doing several machine learning and uh, deep learning projects. So now let's see what are the different features of this. So you can add text in this Google Collab. So this is called as a cell. Okay, so in this cell we uh, run our codes. So you can also create text here. So in this text you can give the description about your code. So here I'll just uh, give the code like now we are going to check the specifications of the system allocated to us so i'll just uh, mention this as system specifications okay system specifications and uh, in order to run one cell and go to the next one you can press shift plus enter so uh, here let's see the system allocated to us for this i'm going to use a system command which is cat 
forward slash proc slash cpu info so basically you know google collab runs on uh, unix so you can run unix commands here and whenever you, you are running a system command we need to precede it with an exclamatory mark okay if we are running python programs we shouldn't include any uh, exclamatory mark so that is one important thing to note here so when you run this uh, cpu info it will tell us the details of the cpu allocated for us so you can see see the processor details here so you know we have this intel xenon processor and this is our first processor with index 0 and this is the second processor and you can go through all the details here and then you can also check the ram allocated to you by using this command which is cat proc slash mem info okay so let's run this so you can press this which is run cell or you can press shift plus enter to execute the cell okay so you can see here 13.3 which is about uh 13.3 gb of ram allocated to us okay so this is how you can check the system specifications now uh, you can go to this files option here so in this files there will be an option called as upload to session storage so we can upload some files here so this is a example of a data set file which is uh, you know boston house price data so uh, i'll upload this to my google collaboratory environment so this will upload this file here so you can use this upload to session storage or you can right click here so there will be this upload option okay so you can click this to view the file in a preview here so this will give you the preview of the file and this is how you can upload a file to your google collaboratory so in machine learning we often deal with data sets right so this is how you can upload a file to your google collab and start working so there will be another option called as mount drive so if you give this mount drive your drive will be connected to your uh, google collab and you can access all the files in your google drive from your google collaboratory so the importance of this is in some cases we may need to work with data sets that is large so the data sets uh, with size of about 1 gb or 2 gb or even more than that so in that cases uploading it to google collaboratory takes a lot of time so in that cases what we do is upload it to our google drive account and uh, we need to mount this drive after that and then we can uh, access the file from google collaboratory like this so this is how you can access the files from uh, drive to your google collaboratory okay so uh, the interesting thing and very important thing in google collaboratory is that most of the libraries in python most of the machine learning and data science library in python are already pre-installed and uh, we don't need to install it separately so you know one or two libraries may be missing and now i'll show you how you can install uh, libraries in uh, google collab so i'll just make a text here as installing libraries let's say that we want to you know install pandas library so we know that pandas library is used in python to make uh, data frames right so if you want to uh, download or if you want to install any libraries in collab just go to google and search as pandas pypa so pypa means python package installer so you can see this pandas pypa so this is the command to install the library pandas so you can copy this library uh, uh, copy this command come to your google collaboratory paste it and you need to proceed it with exclamatory mark as this is a system command so let's run this shift plus enter so here you can see a requirement already satisfied so that means the library is already installed in our uh, google collab environment so in, some of the libraries may not be installed so in that cases this is how you can uh, you know install your libraries and uh, now we can uh, just import our library pandas as import pandas as pd so this is how you import uh, your library and after you have imported it you can load the data set file to a pandas library so i'll just uh, copy the path so i'll just i'm just giving you a demonstration on how you can run python programs so this is an example of you know python syntax right so i have copied this path now let's load this file to a pandas data frame so i'll name this data frame as df so df is equal to pd dot read csv okay so inside this parenthesis in the quotes we need to paste the path of our data set file okay so this uh, pd dot read csv read csv function will read the csv file and unload it to a pandas data frame here i have uh, imported the pandas library in a short form as pd and now i am using it in a short form so that's why we are importing it as pd so I'll run this. 
Now it will load the data from this CSV file to a data frame. So here you can see a data set file is a CSV file, which means comma separated values. Now you can, uh, you know, print the sample of this data frame using df dot so this dot .ed function will print the first five rows of our data frame. So this is how you can run Python program. So these are all Python programs, importing pandas and loading it to our data frame, etc. So let's run some simple uh, programs like print. We know that uh, print is the keyword, right, for Python. So in the coming videos, I have explained about several uh, Python programs and uh, what are the important data types and other things that are important for us to know in Python for machine learning. So let's try to print something. So I'll print machine learning, shift plus enter, shift. okay, so that will print your line. So this is how you can use Google Collaborate and you know that we have already uploaded this file, right? Let's say that we want to print all the files that are present in this environment. So for that, we need to, you know, type exclamatory mark ls. This will list all the files that are present in our environment. So you can see here bostonhouse.csv sample data. So these are the files and folders we have in our, in this files section. So this is how you can print this files. So this is a basic introduction on what is Google Collaborate and how you can run this. In the previous video, we have seen how to use Google Collaborate for Python programming. In this video, we are going to discuss about the most basic concepts in Python such as constants and variables, data types, print function and input functions. Okay, so if you have any doubts on how to use Google Collaboratory, you can watch the previous video. So the index of the that video is 2.1. Okay, let's get started. So when it comes to machine learning and data science, two programming languages are widely used. They are Python and R programming language. So R is mostly statistical based and hence Python is preferred over R because Python is a general purpose language where we use it in other applications also, such as web development and other cases. It also has several ready-made libraries for machine learning. And it is also very easy to understand and easy to use. These are the reasons we use Python. Okay. Now let's try to understand the basic concepts in Python. So I have connected my Google Collaboratory. So first let's discuss about the print function. So I'll make a text here. So I will be giving the link for this collab file in the description of this video. So you can download it from th there. And uh, once you complete watching this video, do practice these codes in Google Collaboratory. Okay. So print function. Print. So if you are an engineering student in your first year, in your C program class, you would have came across the function printf okay so in c program this printf function is used to you know print some text in your screen okay so print some message on the screen so this print is also similar to that okay so in c program we use the keyword printf in python we use the keyword print okay so now let's try to print a string let me print machine learning so now we are going to print the text machine learning okay so as you can note here i have enclosed this uh, two text machine learning in quotes right so you can use either quotes either a double quotes or single quotes okay so all the strings in your code should be enclosed in double quotes strings are nothing but text and sentences okay so either you can use double quotes or single quote but you cannot start with a single quote and end with a double quote like for example you can use a single quote here and a single quote here okay so this will print that text in your screen or you can use double quotes so this tells our python interpreter that this is a string okay but you cannot use single quote and end this end it with a double quote this will throw a error as you can see here so we have to use either single quote or double quote So to run this particular cell, you need to press Control plus Enter or Shift plus Enter. So Shift plus Enter will run this cell and automatically goes to the next cell. Okay. Now let's see how we can join two text. So print parenthesis. So again, we have to put the text in quotes. Machine learning. 
plus projects okay so this will concatenate these two terms okay so the machine learning and projects so concatenates means joining so as you can see here it prints machine learning projects so this is how you can join several strings in a print function okay so you can note here that i have given a space here if you just print this without a space there won't be any space between them okay so that's why i have made a space here so this is how you can join multiple strings okay now let's try to print some numbers so i'll just type print parenthesis and 8 okay so this will print the number 8 so as you can see here i haven't enclosed it in quotes because only the strings need to be enclosed in quotes so this will print that number okay we can also do some arithmetic operation so if you give print and inside the parenthesis if you give 8 plus 3 so what you will get so as you can see here if we use plus sign between two strings it will join the two strings but in the case of integers if you put plus so it will add the two numbers okay so it will add the two numbers and it will uh, print the sum of those two numbers okay so these are some basic things we use print for apart from this there, are, there will be a lot of places where we need to print something to, uh, to in the screen so sometimes uh, we need to print the entire data in our screen and uh, there will be several other cases where this is very useful okay so these are some basic uses of a print function okay let me put this in a single section okay so in order to make a section in this text you just need to precede it with a hash so this will make a section and if you click this down arrow it will enclose all these cells in this section okay so if you press this again so it will expand it okay so we have five cells under the text print function okay now let's discuss about some very basic data types in python okay basic data types so the three basic data types in python are integers so we represent integers as int int and floating points so floating points are nothing but okay floating points are nothing but decimals and we have strings so strings are represented by str so str represents strings which are nothing but text and uh, sentences okay so let me clear this cell so now let's try to understand about these data types so apart from these data types there are also several other data types but these are the most basic ones so example for integer is you know the numbers like 8 10 or 19 so things the your numbers without any decimal points okay so let's make a variable called as okay let's try differently type 8 okay so here what i have done is i have used the keyword called as type and i have enclosed the number 8 here so what happens is sometimes if you are not sure about what is the type of the data you can use this type keyword and this will show you what is the data type so as you can see here it shows int okay now let's try it with a floating point so as i told you floating point are nothing but decimals so let me put 5.3 here so it will show float and now let's try with strings so type so i hope you remember that we need to enclose the strings in double quotes so let's put english what is this type so this is called as string okay so these are the most uh, basic data types in python so apart from this there are also other data types like list sets dictionary etc so we will be uh, discussing about that in a later video so but uh, by now you just need to know about these three basic data types okay now let's discuss about another topic which are constants and variables
and create another section for these data types. Okay. So we have two sections as print function basic data types. Now let's discuss about the constant and variables. So as the name suggests, variables are something whose values can be changed, but we cannot change the values for constants. Okay. So constant is constants are not much used in Python, but we have a lot of usages for variables. Okay. So now let's try to understand more about variables. So let me create a variable name as superhero. Okay, so this is called as a variable and let's give a name for this superhero variable. Let me put Iron Man here. So basically variables are like a container in which we store some value and these values can be changed in case of variables, but we cannot change these values for constants. Okay, so that is the important point to note here. As you can see here, here superhero is that container. So superhero is that variable and Iron Man is the value in that container. Okay, so now you can try to print this term superhero. So this won't print just superhero in your uh, screen. This will print Iron Man because we have given this value to this variable. Okay, so this will print Iron Man. So we can use this as our variable name or you can also use an underscore. So if you have multiple words in a variable like you, you want to um, represent this as let's say marvel superhero marvel superhero okay so if you run this you will encounter a error because the variables should be a single name or it should be connected with underscore so let me try to run this marvel superhero so this will throw a error because it is not a single word, right? So if you want to have multiple words consider as a single word, you just need to include underscore between them. So Marvel underscore. So now you can print this. So this will work fine. Okay. So I'll print this. So we got Iron Man. Okay. So as I told you for variables, we can ch change these values. Okay. Now let's try to change that. So Marvel superhero. So I'm using the same variable name, which is equal to now I am mentioning Captain America. Okay. So let me print the print this now. So Marvel superhero. So as you can see here, we can change the value of these variables. Okay. So but in the case of constant, we cannot change that. So these are about constants and variables. We can also give uh, the values for multiple variables in a single line of code. Okay. Let's try to understand this. Let me create variables as so you can also use digits in the variable names. So I'm using ERO one, but there should not be any gap like this. So there should be no gap between them. So I'm creating ERO one, ERO two, ERO three. Okay, so we have three variables here. The first variable is 0, 1, second variable is 0, 2, and the third variable is 0, 3. So we need to enclose the strings in quotes. The first zero will be Iron Man, second will be let's say Captain America, and third, let's include a DC superhero Batman. Okay. So what happens here is this ERO1 will take the value Iron Man and ERO2 will take the value Captain America and ERO3 will take the value Batman. Okay. Now let's try to print this. So print ERO1. Print ERO2. And print ERO3. Okay. So as you can see here, I'm not using quotes here because these are not strings. These are variables. We just need to uh, put quotes for strings and not for variables. So let me print this now. As you can see here, the hero one is Iron Man and the uh, name for hero two, which is a variable is Captain America and hero three is Batman. Okay. So here you can just include a space before or after after this comma, or you can just leave it as such. So there is not any much differences in 
python so in some programming languages you would uh, encounter some error but python doesn't give errors for much spaces okay so if you run this code it will also give us uh, the correct output and we won't get any errors for these spaces okay now let's try to see how we can give multiple uh, variables the same data let's say for example let's take these variables x is equal to y is equal to z so it is not that the variable should be a word it can also be let letters okay so here we are taking three letters x y and z x y and z is equal to let's say 23 and i'm going to print all of them so print x print y and print z okay so this line will give the value 23 to x y and z now we will get all this as 23 okay so this is how you can give a single value to multiple variables and another important point to note here is you cannot just give a capital x here and try to print a small x here okay so python is case sensitive and you have to use the same uh, uh, you know either caps or small letters okay so python is case sensitive and that is one of the important point okay so these are some basic things about variables and constants now let's try to understand another function which is input okay input function now so in the previous code we have discussed about the print function okay and now we are going to discuss about input function so what is this input function so in c program you would have came across the function called as scanf okay so print is a, an output command where something you know some, we get some output out of it and input is or scanf is an input command where the user will give an input to it okay so let me try to explain it to you with an example so i'm creating a variable called as number one so number one is equal to input so i'm using the keyword input here so input so you need to open a parenthesis and let's say enter the first number okay and let's say number two is equal to input enter the second number So what happens is this will ask the user for their input. So now we need to give the input to this uh, command. Let's say I'm giving a number 23. So I'm pressing enter. Now we need to give the second number. Let me also give it as 23. Okay. So if you are aware of or if you have practiced C programs, so you would have came across that scan of function and it is very much similar to this input function. Okay. So we use this input function where we need to get some data or some value from the user. Okay. So this is why input function is used. Now let's try to do some more things. Now what we are going to do is we are going to get two numbers from the user and we are going to add the two numbers and we are going to print the sum of those two numbers so i am creating another variable called as sum so sum is equal to number one plus number two okay so what happens here is so this will get two numbers from the user and it will get the uh, sum of these two numbers and now we need to print this sum so print sum so what do you expect the output of the code would be okay so if i'm giving the two numbers as 23 and 23 so the sum of these two numbers is 46 right but we won't get it we won't get 43 as the 46 as the answer okay let's see let me give 23 as the first number 23 as the second number so we expect that these two numbers should be added and the output should be 46 but it won't be the case as you can see here it is not the expected value so we get 2323 as our output why is this case okay so this is one interesting thing to note here so what happens is so when you use the input function 
it assumes that this value given by the user is a string okay it doesn't know whether it is an int integer value or float value okay it just assumes that it is a string that is why it uh, let's say for example when we give 23 as uh, the value it thinks that 23 is a string and the 23 is also a string and it just try to concatenate the two uh, two strings as we have seen in the print here so plus will join the two strings so that's why it has joined these two numbers which is you know strings for the for that program and it will print that number okay so we get 2323 now how we can rectify this you can include int here okay so int and another parenthesis and so this will convert this string value to an integer now let's try to run this so i'm giving 23 again and 23 now as you can see here the output is 46 now so the important point to note here is so the input function will assume that the value is a string and we need to convert this value to what it is actually okay so here we are expecting the value to be integer so i'm using this integer value so you can change the data type by using this uh, method okay let's say for example changing the data type in python okay let me show you how you can change these data types let's say that num is equal to 5 okay mm. now let's try to print the type of this num so this will output that it is an integer so as you can see here now what you can do is you can change this integer to a float by mentioning that keyword and giving that variable name inside this parenthesis so what happens is the value of num is 5 and this will create this 5 which is an integer value to a float value okay and now let's try to print this num okay let me include that in the print function itself As you can see here, this integer 5 is converted to a float value 5.0. So this is how you can change the data types in Python and it is the same thing I have used here. So I am converting a string to a integer. Okay. So these are some very basic things you need to know in Python. Okay. So let's do a fast recap now. So first of all, we have uh, seen some basic functions in print okay so how you can print strings so we have seen that we need to include the strings in uh, double quotes or single quotes so we have seen how we can join two strings and how to print numbers and sum of two numbers inside the print function so and then we have seen some basic data types of python which are integer float and string okay so then we have seen how to find the data type of a value so we need to mention the keyword type here okay then we have discussed about constant and variables so we have seen that we can change the value of a variable and we have seen how to uh, give multiple values for multiple variables and how to give the same value for multiple variables then we have discussed about the input function which is used to get input from a user okay then then we have discussed how we can change the data type of a value okay so I'll give this collab file link in the description of the video. In the next video, we will be discussing more basics of Python like data types, operators and other Python. And uh, the second module of this course is Python basics for machine learning. And this is the third video in this second module. So let's get started with today's video. So I'll be doing my Python programs in Google Collaboratory. I have already made a video on how you can access Google Collaboratory. So you can check that out. So let's get started. So these are the five data types in Python. Okay, so they are integer, floating point, complex, boolean, and string. So these are the basic data types. We know that integer is a, a real number, right? So integer are uh, numerical values, and floating points are decimal numbers. And we know that complex number is uh, something that has both a real number and an imaginary number. And boolean is nothing but true or false values. So it contains only two type of values. One is true, and the other one is false. And the string is nothing but text or statements. Okay, so these are the five basic data types in Python. Apart from these basic data types, we have other complex data types such as uh, 
list, tuples, etc. So we will discuss about that in a later video. So these are the basic ones. So let's get started and let's try to understand each of uh, these basic data types. First, let's discuss about integers. So in Python, you can uh, write comments using, you know, this hash symbol. Okay, so I'll uh, make a comment here as integers. Okay. So integers, I'm going to create a variable as a. Okay, so in the previous video, uh, with index 2.2, I have explained what is meant by variables. So we are just declaring a variable here as a, and a is equal to 8. And uh, now let's try to print this a. We know that 8 is an integer, right? So let's print uh, a. So in order to run the cell, you can press shift plus enter. So it will execute the cell and go to the next one. So you can see here, we have printed A and it has printed 8 because we have given the value for A as 8. We know that 8 is an integer, right? So let's say that in some cases, you are not sure what is the data type of a particular variable. In that case, you can use the keyword type. Okay, so type is a keyword in Python, which tells you the data type of a particular value. Here, let's mention A in this parenthesis. So this will return uh, what is the data type of a okay so let's run this press shift plus enter okay here you can see here i and t which means int so int represent integer values right so this is how you can print integers value so you can give a uh, integer value to a variable and you can print it now let's uh, discuss about floating points so i'll make a comment here as floating point and uh, let's take the variable as b and let's give a value like 2.3. So we know that 2.3 is a decimal value. So we know that floating points are nothing but decimal values. And now let's try to print this B. And let's also, also try to find the data type of B. So type B. Okay, so let's run this. So you can see here 2.3. So we have printed B whose value is 2.3. And we have found the data type of B as float. Okay, so short form for integer is int. And for floating point, it's float. Now let's discuss about the third data type, which is complex numbers. So complex numbers. So we know that complex numbers has both a real term and imaginary term. So let's uh, name this variable as C and I'll give a complex number as one plus three J. Here, uh, one is the re real term and J is uh, the imaginary term. So J square will be equal to minus one. So that is meant by complex number where, you know, we can also use I. So I or J is, uh, you know, Square of this j is equal to minus 1, that is the imaginary part, and you can print c. Okay, so let's also try to print the data type of c. Okay, so this prints the complex number which is 1 plus 3j, and also it prints the data type of c which is complex. So these are the first three basic data types in Python. As we have discussed about these three data types, there is another interesting thing that we can do we can convert one data type to another. Okay, so I'll mention a text here as conversion of one data type to another. So here I'm going to convert two data types. So let's try to convert an integer into a floating point and let's convert a floating point into an integer. So this will be integer to float. So let's uh, name the variable as, okay, so I'll give some other variable name, which is x. So let's say that x is equal to 10. And let's try to print x first. And let's also try to print the type of x, the data type of x. So I'll run this. Okay, so you can see here we have printed x. The value of x is 10 and it is an integer. Now let's try to convert this to a floating point. So let's uh, name this variable as y. And to convert uh, integer into a floating point, we need to mention the keyword float. And inside this parenthesis, mention the term which you want to convert. Here, x is an integer, right? And let's convert this x into a floating point. So you need to put x in this parenthesis. So this will convert. Okay, one second. So this will convert x to a floating point value, and that floating point will be value will be stored to y. And let's try to print both y and the data type of y. So type y. 
here you can see here now we get the value as 10.0 so we know that 10 is an integer and 10.0 is a floating point or decimal value and uh, we have successfully converted this integer value using this keyword float and we have tried to you know print the data type of y and it has printed float so this is how you can convert an integer to a floating point value now let's see how we can convert a floating point value to integer okay so float to int and uh, I will take the variable as x, as x in this case. Let's give some random floating point value 5.88. And let's print x and also the data type of x. So type x. So the value of x is 5.88 and uh, the data type is float. Now let's see how we can convert this. So y is equal to, so previously we have used this keyword float, right? In this case, we are going to use the keyword int which will convert the value to an integer value. So now mention uh, x in this parenthesis. Okay, so x. And uh, once we have converted it, let's try to print y and also the data type of y. So we can see here this 5.88 decimal value is now converted to an integer value which is 5 and we have found the data type as integer. So that is one main thing which you need to take note of in, in this case. So when you convert this uh, floating point into, into an integer value, it doesn't round the value. It doesn't convert this 5.88 to 6. It just removes you know, this uh, decimal values and it will give only this integer value. So this 5.88 won't be converted into 6. but uh, this you know this uh, point 88 will be removed and we will get only 5 okay so this is what happens when you convert a floating point to an integer now uh, we have the fourth data type which is boolean right so here i'll just mention a text as boolean so as i have told you earlier boolean has two values one is true and the second one is false so i'll mention it here true and false okay now let's uh, create the variable as a and let's put a is equal to true. So this is a boolean value. Okay. So there is another main thing here. So this t should be in uh, uppercase letters. So it shouldn't be in lowercase letters. So this will give us an error. So this is a predefined uh, value. So it should be, uh, you know, as such it is in this case. So the t should be in uppercase letter. And uh, let's try to print this a now. So print a and let's try to print the data type of a as well so type of a sorry so type of a so this a is printed as true and uh, we got the data type as bool so bool represents a boolean okay so let's create another variable as b and b is equal to false and uh, let's print b now also the data type of b So you can see here so this is how you can uh, you know assign a boolean value to a variable and you can print it and find the data type of it and uh, the final thing which we have is, is string right so before that let's discuss one more thing about boolean so let's see where we can use these booleans so i'll create a variable as a and let's say that a is equal to 8 is uh, you know let's say that 7 is less than 3 so we are just you know checking whether 7 is less than 3 so you know that 7 is not less than 3 so this is this statement is actually a false one right so this will return a boolean value when you just compare two values so here we are checking whether it is less than uh, 3 so we are checking whether 7 is less than 3 when you run these kind of codes it will uh, return a boolean value now you can try to print a okay so let's also try to print the data type of a okay sorry so p shouldn't be in uppercase letter okay so you can see here 7 is not less than 3 so it will give a boolean value which is false and uh, we have tried to print uh, print the value of a which is false and we have also tried to find the data type of a so similarly i'll just copy this and let's change this symbol okay so let's say that 7 is greater than 3 and this condition is true right so let's call this as a condition so let's check whether this condition is true of course 7 is greater than 3 so this will return the value as true 
so let's see so yes so true and it is a boolean value so we use these kind of uh, you know conditions in uh, loops and in the case of if statements etc so in that cases uh, we will get a boolean value so this is one main application of a boolean data type and the final data type which we are going to discuss is string so strings are nothing but text and statements uh, you know and uh, let's try to print some statements so i'll print machine learning okay so machine learning is a string so these two words represents a string and let's try to print this so this will print you this string the main thing about the string is the strings should be enclosed in quotes okay so here i have used double quotes right so instead you can also use single quotes so i'll just copy and paste this here and replace this double quotes with a single quote and i'll run this this will give you the same result okay so the main thing here is if you start with single quote it should end in uh, you know single quotes as well if you start in double quotes it should end in double quotes as well so the quote shouldn't change but you can use either double quotes or single quotes so let's discuss some uh, basic operations in strings that we can use so i'll give a variable name here as my string okay so let's say that my string is equal to so as i have told you earlier strings should always be enclosed in quotes whereas we don't have to enclose uh, you know values this integer values and floating point values in quotes so only the strings should be enclosed in quotes and here boolean is a different data type hence we don't enclose it in quotes only the strings should be enclosed in quotes either uh, single quotes or double quotes and i'll give the value as the same machine learning and uh, i'll print this my string here we have created the variable as my string and i'm printing it and let's try to find the data type using the type keyword this type function so my string so let's run this now you can see here our string which is machine learning has been printed and we found the data type as string so str represents string and uh, let's try another thing print hello and five okay so i'm using this symbol here this uh, you know star symbol let's see what happens we know that this represents multiplication symbol in python right so when you use uh, this line of code and let's try to print this what happens here is your uh, string will be printed five times if you mention five so if you mention four your string will be repeated four times so this is uh, how you can replicate your string using this line okay so now let's see how we can slice a string Mm, this process is called as slicing. I just make a text here as slicing. Okay. Let's create a new string as let's name this variable as my string and let's give the value as programming. So this word programming has totally eleven letters. Okay. And I'm going to slice this string. Slice means getting, you know, only a particular portion of this string, this particular word. So let's print my string, but I don't want to print the entire thing. I just want to print a part of this word. And uh, you can mention the values such as 1 is to 5. Okay. So let's understand indexing in Python. So indexing or the numbering in Python starts with zero. So the index of this first letter P is zero and uh, the index of the second letter R is one and uh, two and so on. So P will be zero, R will be one, Z, uh, O will be two and so on. So zero, one, two, three, four and, and it goes on. And we can mention the letters based on their index. So one means the second letter R, right? Because uh, the indexing starts with zero and one represents this second letter, which is R. And I want to print all the words from the first index R to the fifth index five. Let's see which is the fifth index. So P is the zeroth one. So R O G R E. So uh, zero, one, two, three, four, and five. So A is the index five. So when you use uh, this particular line, one is to five, the values from this uh, first index one will be printed all the way to this fifth index but this fifth letter won't be printed this fifth index value which is a won't be printed so let's run this and try to understand this okay so we got the values as r o g r so this first index value will be printed which is r 
and this second index value phi won't be printed so you will get the values from r o g r so this second index value will be uh, you know neglected so this is how you can slice a string so the main thing to note here is the first value up to the last value minus one so here the values will be printed so i'll just make uh, a note here so the values from index one to phi minus one so phi minus one is four right so will be sliced will be sliced so in every indexing cases so this second index won't be included so that is what you need to take note of in this case and uh, there is another process called as step so we can also uh, you know slice the words having a step value here let's print my string and my string i'll mention 0 to 10 let's take a step as 2 so i'm going to print from a 0 so the 0th index is p right all the way up to 10th index so 10th index is this n so 10 you know 10th index is n and uh, sorry one second so this is a 0 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 so 10th index is g let's try to print this step so what happens when you mention uh, 2 here is so p will be printed and r will be uh, you know removed o will be printed g will be removed so that means uh, you know step of 2 that means every second letter will be skipped let's try to run this okay so here you can see here the 10th uh, index value is cn so as i have mentioned you here that the second index value won't be uh, involved or it won't be included in this uh, slicing so we will get the value from this zero index to the index nine and every second letter will be removed here uh, when you take p as the zeroth index the second letter r will be removed and we will get o g will be removed and uh, r will be printed and a will be removed and so on so this is how you can slice a string by mentioning the step which we want okay so that is another uh, thing which you can do with string called as string concatenation string concatenation so concatenating is nothing but joining two strings so let's uh, name this variable as word one so let's give the value as word one is equal to machine so i'm mentioning single quotes here and let's take the second value as word 2 so word 2 is equal to learning okay now i'm going to create another word so uh, let's let's print this so print word 1 plus word 2 so when you use this plus symbol so these two words will be joined so this process is called as string concatenation so you can see here there is no space here right so uh, you cannot get a space uh, with you know when you mention this plus so if you want to have a space you can just mention a space here and let's run this so this will give a space between them so this is how you can concatenate or join two strings so these are some basic details of uh, the data types in python and basic operations on the data types that we can do so i'll just give you a quick recap on what are the things we have done here so we have discussed the first uh, you know the five basic data types in python which are integer floating point complex boolean and string we have tried to print uh, we, we tried to give uh, you know give a value of integer to a variable a and we printed it and we have also tried to find the data type of a and then we have tried the same with a floating point value and we have also tried to create a complex number and then we have seen how we can convert one data type to another using their respective keyword so in this case we have used this float keyword to convert an integer value to float here we have used uh, you know integer keyword to convert a floating point value to an integer and we have discussed about the two boolean values which are true and false and uh, we have seen how we can use these uh, boolean values in the case of conditions and then we have discussed about strings and uh, how you can uh, replicate the strings and how you can slice the string by mentioning their indexes and how you can slice a string by mentioning a step value and finally we have seen how you can uh, you know concatenate two strings so these are some basic details about the data types in python hello everyone this is siddharthan in the previous video we have discussed about the basic data types in python which included integer floating points string boolean and complex numbers so in this video we are going to discuss the remaining special data types in python okay so these data types include list tuple 
set and dictionary okay so basically there are two types of objects in python so immutable objects and mutable objects immutable objects are those whose value cannot be changed once it's created and mutable objects are those whose value can be changed once it's created okay so, and the examples of immutable objects are integers floating points strings boolean values and tuples okay and mutable objects are list set and dictionary okay so in this video we are going to discuss about these four data types which are list tuple set and dictionary okay so first of all let's discuss about list okay so list should be enclosed in square bracket so i'll mention it in the comment here so list okay so list should be included in the square bracket okay so list are nothing but they are like arrays in c program so they can store multiple values okay so all these data types which are going to see today uh, can store multiple values whereas the previous uh, you know data types we have seen which are integer float and strings can store only one value okay so these list set and dictionary can store multiple values okay so i'll create a list and name it as my list so my list is equal to so we need to put all the components in the square bracket so let's say 1 2 3 4 and 5 so this is my list and let me print this so print my list okay now i'll also check the data type of this so if you are not sure about what is a particular data type you can use the keyword type and you need to mention the variable which you want to find okay so i'll put my list here so this will return the data type of this particular variable okay so as you can see here our list is printed in square bracket and so we have checked the data type of my list and it has written that it is a list data type okay so this is how you can check the data type and now let's discuss about some important properties and operations that can be carried out on list okay so list can so list can store multiple data types so here we have only integer values right so similarly it's not the case that only integers or only floating points should be present in a list so we can have integer values floating point values so strings and boolean in a single list okay so i'll mention this list can have multiple data types okay whereas some of the data types such as set does not allow this okay so they can uh, have only one type of data okay so my list is equal to let me put two three so two and three are integers so let me put a floating point now let's say 1.8 and let's now include a string let's say english so english is a word so it is a string value so and let's also include a boolean value true okay so we have multiple data types here now let me print my list okay so as you can see here we have different data types in list and multiple data types are supported in a single list okay now as i've told you earlier that list are mutable okay so list are mutable so mutable means they can be changed once they are created okay so they are changeable okay so now let's see how we can add elements to a list so add elements to a list okay so first of all let's copy this list here okay my list so i copy this okay so you can use the function append to add a add an element into a list okay so let me mention my list okay so dot append is the function that is used to add any element so let's say 
that we want to add six to our list okay so this will add the element six at the end of our list okay now let's print our list so print my list okay as you can see here in our original list a new value is added which is six so that is why we are using the function dot append okay so each of these elements has a particular index in the list okay so as i've told you earlier in the previous video that indexing in python starts from zero so the index of this first element is zero and the index of this second element is one and third is two and it goes on okay so you can print the several elements in a list using their index okay so now we are going to see how we can print elements of a list using their index okay so let's print this so print mention my list and you need to specify the index in square brackets okay so so when i mention the index as zero it will print the first element which is two okay now let's print the third element the third element is 1.8 right so my list the index of 1.8 is 0 1 2 okay now let's print and see this as you can see here it can print the individual elements once we mention the index okay so this is how you can call the specific elements in a list using their index okay so another important property of list is that it allows duplicate values so list allow duplicate or repeated values whereas set does not allow duplicate values so in the case of set it removes the duplicate or repeated values so we'll be seeing that when we are discussing about set okay so here let's create a list as list one and let's say list one is equal to so we want to put the elements in a square brackets say one two three four five and again one two and let's say two and three let me print this print list one okay i'll run this as you can see here it allows uh, the duplicate value so here we have the duplicate values as two one three okay so it is one main properties of list okay now we can check the number of elements in a list using one function okay so let's check how many numbers are there so totally one two three four five six seven eight so totally we have eight numbers in this list okay so you can check the size of the list here so using the function length okay so the short form for length is len len and inside the brackets inside the parenthesis mention the list name so list one so this will count the number of elements present inside the list one okay so i'll print this so as you can see here it has printed the number of elements present in the in this list which is eight okay now let's see how we can initiate an empty list initiating an empty list so let's say that list 2 is equal to square bracket so you need to mention the opening square bracket and the ending square bracket so this is nothing but an empty list so we can print this empty list as you can see here it, it is a list but it does not contain any values and you can add values to this using the function list two dot append which we have seen already let's say we append the value five to it okay so now let's print this print list two so this is how you can create an empty list and add a value to it so this feature is very important because in lot of cases we will create an empty list and we add values one by one okay so this is how you can initiate a list so as i told you earlier lists are mutable right they are changeable so hence we can delete the element present in a list okay so delete an item in a list but we cannot do that in the case of tuples and other immutable data types okay let's say that list 2 is equal to let's copy the elements from this list okay we'll copy these elements okay and i'll 
put it in this list and let me print this list so print list 2 okay now you can delete the elements present in a list using the function delete so del okay so mention the list name and mention the index number which you want to delete so let's say that i want to delete this 1.8 the index of 1.8 is 2 so index of 2 is one, uh, 0 this is 1 and 2 so it is in the normal uh, numerical order instead it starts with 0 okay so that's in about index so index of 1.8 is 2 okay so list and mention the index in the square brackets say 2 and now let's print our new list so list 2 so this basically prints the list without deleting any item in this line and then we will delete the third item using the index 2 and then we will print the deleted list okay so i'll run this so as you can see here the third element which has the index of 2 is deleted from this list so this is how you can delete items in a list and then one more interesting feature about the list is you can join two list okay so let me create the list as list 3 which is equal to 1 2 3 4 5 okay and i'll create another list as list 4 which is equal to 6 7 8 9 and 10 okay now we can mm, join these two lists okay so i'll create another list as list 5 and list 5 is equal to list 3 plus list 4 so the important point to note here is when i add these two lists it won't add these elements element wise okay so it will join the two lists so it will concatenate the two lists so let's print this list 5 as you can see here the list 3 and list 4 are joined together and they are stored in the list 5 so this is how you can join two list okay so these are some important features and properties of list okay now let's discuss about tuple so tuple are similar as list except the fact that they are immutable objects so once you create an element in a tuple you cannot change it hence it is called as an immutable data type okay so let's create a tuple as tuple 1 so tuples should be enclosed in parentheses or round brackets okay so let's put the elements as 2 3 4 and 5 okay whereas the list should be enclosed in square brackets so let me print my tuple so print tuple 1 and let's check the data type also as you know using the function type of tuple 1 so this will print the data type of this variable tuple 1 okay as you can see here the tuples are always enclosed in round brackets or parentheses and this type function is printed our data type as tuple okay now let's discuss some properties of tuple so likewise so you know similar to list tuples also allow multiple data types in a single tuple so you can have integers floating points strings etc in a single tuple okay so tuple allows multiple data types in a single tuple okay so let's create the tuple as tuple 2 which is equal to again parenthesis let's say 1 2 3.5 let's include a string as mm, machine learning and another boolean as false so boolean data types are nothing but true and false values so let's try to print this tuple 2 so it runs properly because it can allow multiple data types integers floating points um, strings etc okay now let's see how we can convert a list into a tuple okay so converting a list to a tuple so first of all let's create our list as my list and let's say my list as the elements so list should be enclosed in the square brackets let's say it's three four five and six okay now we need to convert this to a tuple before that let me print this list so print my list okay so now let me create another variable called as my tuple 
okay so my tuple is equal to so for converting a list to a tuple or other data types to a tuple you need to use the keyword tuple okay so tuple in the parenthesis mention this list name so the list name is my list right so i'll paste it here so this will convert this my list to a tuple and store it to this variable my tuple so now let's print this my tuple so print my tuple okay so as you can see here it has printed our list first and this list is converted to tuple so you can distinguish it using its square brackets okay so this is how you can convert a different data type to a tuple so similarly uh, we have printed the individual elements in a list by using by mentioning their uh, index value right so you can see here so we have mentioned the index value to print the elements of a list so similarly you can use indexing to print the elements of list as well sorry a tuple as well let's say we want to print my tuple the first element of my tuple so we will give the index a zero now let's print my tuple and now let's mention the index one so this will sorry index one this will print the first two elements which are three and four okay as you can see here this is how you can call specific elements using their index values okay so as i've earlier told you tuples are immutable tuples are immutable which means unchangeable so once they are created their elements cannot be changed so we can try this so in the case of list we have used the function dot append to append or join a value to a list but we cannot do that in the case of tuple let's say that my tuple dot append 6 so this will throw us an error because tuple values cannot be changed so as you can see here so tuple object has no attribute append so we cannot change the elements of the uh, tuple using this append or any function because they are immutable okay now we can also find the number of elements present in the tuple using the same function length so let's print my tuple length of my tuple okay so as you can see here this my tuple has four elements so this is how you can print the number of elements using the keyword length okay so this is about the important properties of tuple now let's discuss about another important data type set so set are also mutable data types and so we have seen that the list elements should be enclosed in square bracket tuple elements should be enclosed in parentheses or round brackets and set should be enclosed in curly brackets okay curly brackets so let me create the set as my set which is equal to so put the elements in a curly brackets let's say 1 2 3 4 and 5 and I'll print my set and let's check the data type as well so type my set so as you can see here the elements are printed in the curly brackets and we can found we can sorry we can find the elements and and uh, we can find the data type of the set and it is printed here using the keyword type okay now we cannot call an element present in the set using their index so we have seen in the case of list and tuple we can you know print specific elements using their index but set does not support indexing so let's try this let's say that we want to print the first element of my set so i'll mention zero so if i run this we will get an error because set does not support indexing so as you can see here set object does not support indexing so you don't have any index value associated to the elements of set so this is one main feature of set because uh, this is what distinguishes between list tuple and set okay now you can convert a list through sorry list into a set let's see how we can do that so convert list to a set 
let's say that let's create a list as list 5 which is equal to so list should be enclosed in square bracket let's say 4 5 6 7 and 8 so these are the elements of the list now I need to convert this to a set so what I'll be doing is I'll create the set and store it in the variable x okay so x so you can use the keyword set to convert one data type to a set okay so now we are going to convert this list 5 into a set so mention the list 5 here so list 5 okay now let me print this x so what happens here is so we have a list here and this list will be converted into a set using this set function and it will be stored in the variable x and now we are going to print this variable x as you can see here we got a set because we have curly brackets and in the list we have square brackets so this is how you can convert list or tuple into a set okay so and one important feature of set when compared to list and tuple is that set does not allow duplicate values whereas list and tuple do allow duplicate values or repeated values in it whereas set does not allow duplicate values okay so let's check this let's say that set 3 is equal to so i'll mention the elements in curly brackets 1 2 3 4 5 and again let me put 1 2 and 3 now let's print this so what happens is the repeated values automatically gets deleted okay so as you can see here the repeated values 1 2 3 are not printed because set does not allow any repeated values so this is about some important features of set and now we are going to discuss about the last data type which is dictionary okay so dictionary are special data types because they are quite different from the other data types list tuple and set okay so the peculiarity of dictionary is that it contains a key value pair so dictionaries have a key value pair so each element has a key in it and a value associated with that key let's see how is that so let me create the dictionary as my dictionary okay so my dictionary is equal to so dictionary values are also enclosed in curly brackets so first let's create the key as name okay so this is the first key and you need to put a colon there and let's say that the name of the person is David okay so David now this is the first element so this key so name is the key and David is the element okay so this is the first element now let's create another element as H okay so let's say H so H is the second key and H of David is 30 so this is the second element and now let's create the third element as country country of David so again colon let's put India okay so this set this dictionary has three elements so each element has a key in it and a value associated to it so in this third element country is the key and value is India okay so let's try to print my dictionary okay and also let's check the data type of this so put type and my dictionary okay as you can see here we have printed our elements in the dictionary and the elements are enclosed in curly brackets and we have got this data type as a dictionary okay now so in the case of list and tuple we have seen that we can call specific elements in a list or tuple using their index but in the case of dictionary we can call this value using their respective key so we can call a value using their key so if i want to print this david i need to mention the key which is name if i want to men sorry print the age i need to mention age and if i want to uh, you know print india i need to mention the country so let's see how we can do it let's say print my dictionary and in the square brackets enclose which you want to print so first i want to print the name and now let's print the age and lastly let's print a 
system key okay okay so this will print the, their respective values so as you can see here this is how you can call the values inside a dictionary using their keys okay so in lot of the cases dictionaries are very useful for us okay so and another important properties of dictionary is that dictionaries does not allow duplicate values so list and tuple allows duplicate values whereas set and dictionary sorry list and tuple allows and set and dictionary does not allow duplicate values or repeated values so dictionary does not allow duplicate values so let, let me create a dictionary as dictionary 2 which is equal to so I'll copy these key and value okay so I'll paste it here in the dictionary 2 and I'll again paste this so you can see here we have repeated values so we have duplicate values now let's try to print this dictionary 2 and see what happens as you can see here the duplicate values are removed so hence set and dictionary does not allow duplicate or repeated values so that is all about the special data types in python list tuple set and dictionary so the difference between the other basic data types is that these data types can store multiple values in them okay so these data types are very similar to arrays in c programming okay so to python do check out my previous videos so in this video we are going to discuss about one of the main topics in python which is operators so basically there are six operators in python they are arithmetic operators assignment operators comparison operators logical operators identity operators and membership operators okay so now let's discuss about each one of these separately okay so first of all arithmetic operators okay so So arithmetic operators are the basic mathematical operations that we can perform on integers and floating points and other uh, data types okay so let's discuss about this so this is one of the most basic operators so let's create a variable as number one okay so num1 is equal to let's say 20 and let's create another number so the second variable is number two which is 10 so we have two numbers the first number the value of first number is 20 and the second number is 10 right so now let's see what are the different arithmetic operators so first is the addition operators okay so addition operator is nothing but the addition symbol so let's say create a variable called as sum and let's add the two numbers number one plus number two okay so this plus sign we are using right so this is called as the addition operators okay so similarly there are uh, other operators in arithmetic type okay so you can leave space here or you can remove the space here so both are the same so it is not a significant point so you can do both the ways so uh, first is the addition operator so let me print the sum okay so let's say that sum is equal to okay so this will print the sum of the numbers okay so this is the addition operators which is plus sign and there is subtraction operator so these are nothing but the basic math operations okay so let's create a variable as diff which represents difference so number one minus number two so this minus symbol is the subtraction operators okay so print difference so this will find the difference of the two numbers and it will print it here so difference is given by tf okay so the third arithmetic operators is product or multiplication so multiplication operators let's say, say that pro so pro means product so product is equal to number one so so i'll just write the code with the space you can write with space or without space so this symbol represents multiplication operators okay so let me print it so print product so product is equal to pro okay the fourth operator is division of course okay so division so let's write q u o which represents quotient so number one 
for division we use this forward slash okay so number one and number two and let's print the quotient q u t okay so quotient and here we need to print it okay so apart from these basic four operators there are also other arithmetic operators so they are exponent so how we can represent exponent is let's create a variable as exp which represents exponent so we want to so let's say that uh, we want to find the exponent as 20 power 10 okay so we can write that as number one you need to mention this multiplication operator twice. it means number one to the power of number two okay so you can do this or you just can remove the space between them okay so this will so this is similar to you know Mm. 20 power 10 so it is similar to it okay now let's print the exponent okay so the exponent is equal to exp okay so then there is this modulus operation okay so let's create the variable as mod which is equal to number one so this modulus operator is represented by the percentage symbol so number two so this basically gives the remainder of this division so what happens here is so the this number two will be divided by number sorry number one will be divided by number two and instead of printing the quotient so the remainder will be printed okay so if you want to print the quotient we use the forward slash so if we want to print the remainder we use this percentage symbol okay so let me print reminder is equal to mod okay so let's print this so these are the basic arithmetic operators in python okay so some which represents the addition operators and then we have seen the subtraction operators multiplication operator division operator exponential operators and modulus operators okay so these are the arithmetic operators so the second operators which we need to discuss is assignment operators okay so let's discuss about it now so this is assignment operators so assignment operators as the name suggests it's assigning values to a variable okay so let's say there is a variable a and the value of this variable is 5 so i am basically assigning the value 5 for uh, this variable a here equal to sign is the assignment operators okay so let's print this a of course it prints 5 okay so there are other assignment operators as well let's say that again a is equal to 5 and a is plus is equal to 5 so basically what this means is so this is similar to telling our python interpreter that a is equal to a plus 5 so instead of writing a plus 5 so we can write a plus is equal to 5 so this will add 5 to this a okay so if we print a now it will give us 10 because a is already 5 and we are adding 5 to it okay so let me print this and we have 10 okay so similarly there are also other things we can do with it so it's equal to let's say 2 okay so this is similar to um, b is equal to b minus 2 okay so let's print first of all we need to mention b right so let's say that b is equal to 5 and print b okay so these are some interesting assignment operators so we have seen two assignment operators there are other assignment operators as well so let me mention them in this text here okay so they are so the first one as we have seen it's plus is equal to and next we have seen this and the next operator so you can do it with the multiplication symbol so you can try all these with different variables okay so it is similar to all these things and i'll just mention it here so you do practice this so another one is the exponent okay and then we also have this for division and for modulus okay 
okay so okay hmm. so i have just shown you two basic uh, assignment operators so you can practice all these assignment operators okay so now we have discussed about arithmetic and assignment operators now okay. let's discuss about the comparison operators okay so comparison uh, operators basically compares two variables or two objects okay so three is comparison operators okay so let me create a variable a is equal to 5 and b is equal to let's say 10 okay so we need to compare these two variables let's see what are the symbols used to compare the two variables or two objects okay so let's print this comparison operators returns a boolean value so boolean means it outputs either true or false okay so these two things are only we are expecting so it won't print any function but sorry it won't print any values but it will print this boolean values which are either true or false so let's say that a is equal to 5 so i have mentioned two equal to symbol this means it will check sorry so a is equal to b so when i mention this equal to equal to 2 equal to signs it, it checks whether a is same as b okay so this is nothing but equal to comparison operator okay now let me do another thing so a so i'm mentioning exclamatory mark and equal to so it, this means a is not equal to b so let's say that in the first case it will check whether a is this a is same as b so it is not same so it will output the value as false and now here we have we are checking whether a is not equal to b so a is not equal to b hence it will output false okay so this is nothing but not equal to print is greater than b okay so here a is less than b so it will output false for it so this is greater than symbol of course so this is greater than symbol so similarly we have other symbols right so other common symbols which is less than b so all these conditions will be compared and there is another two comparison operators which is less than or equal to b and a is greater than or equal to b okay so i'll run this so this will output either true or false so this condition will be checked and the output will be printed so first condition checks whether a is equal to b so a is not equal to b hence we are getting false and now we are checking whether a is not equal to b so it is the correct uh, condition so it gives true so similarly all these conditions will be checked so these are the comparison operators so these symbols between a and b okay now we are going to discuss about the fourth operator which is logical operators so i'll mention it here so the fourth operator is logical operators so there are three logical operators they are and or and not so they are similar to the logic gates which we, we would have studied in the higher secondary so let's say that a is equal to 10 okay so this logical operator also gives either gives boolean values so it will print either true or false and it won't give any values so numerical values okay so here we have given that a is equal to 10 so let's say that print let's say a is greater than 20 okay and a is greater than 5 so we have two conditions here and we have used a uh, logic logical operator and so what happened here is so these two conditions will be checked it will check whether a is greater than 20 so a is equal to 10 which is uh, this condition is false because a is not greater than 20 it is less than 20 so next this condition will be checked which is a is greater than 5 of course a is greater than 5 so out of these two conditions only one condition the second condition is correct and the second first condition is wrong so if we use the and operator it will give the output as true if both the conditions are true okay so in this case 
only one condition is true hence uh, we will get false as the output okay now i'll use or operator okay so i am just copying the same thing but i am just replacing this and with or okay so this or operators similarly check the two condition it will output the value as true if either one of it is true so it's it's obvious from its name so and means the both of them should be true or means either one can be true and there is another operator called as not operator so it is similar to the not get so it will inverse the values okay so let's say that a is greater than 8 so it is true and a is greater than 5 so both these conditions are true right so but this not operator will convert this or it will invert this output okay so if this uh, gives an output of true when it goes to this not operator it will be converted to false so let's run this so as you can see here we have used and operator so only one condition is true so hence we will get a false so in second condition also same that two uh, only one condition is true but we are using an or operator so we will get a true and this condition outputs a true but we are using a not so it will be inverted to false so these are the three main logical operators so and or and not okay so the fifth operator is identity operator so fifth one is identity operator okay the identity operator of is and is not okay so it again compares the value and gives a boolean output let's say that x is equal to 5 and y is equal to 5 so both are same right so it will compare this let's print so the operator is nothing but is right so x is y so it will check whether x is the same as y and it will give either true or false so it is printing true because both of them are same right if i just do the same thing and give different value to ten. so this will give us an output of false because both of them are not same right so false so this is the identity operator is so we can do the same thing but this time with is not function so the second identity operator is is not so you can do that so this is basically opposite to this is operator okay so x is not y it, it is false because x is the same as y right so again i'll do the same but in this case i'll change this value here of course x is not y so it will give us the boolean value as true okay so it will check whether both of them are same when we are using the operator is and here it will check whether the two values are not similar okay so this is nothing but the identity operator so the finally we have this membership operator okay so membership operator checks whether a particular value belongs to a sequence of elements like list so i'll explain you this in a moment so six this membership operator okay so there are two membership operators in and not in okay so i'll put a is equal to 5 and b is equal to 10 and in c i'm creating a list so we know that list are always enclosed in square brackets right so let's create a list with the elements 1 2 3 4 and 5 now we are going to use these operators in and not in okay so I'm, this is this also gives us boolean values so i am printing the a is so a in c and i am printing b in c so as you can see here a has a value of 5 which is present in this list c b has a value of 10 which is not present in this list so this fifth line gives us an output of true whereas the next line gives an output of false okay so as you can see here this is the membership operator so this basically checks whether the first element is one of the member of the second uh, object okay so it is the uh, not in function is similar to this but it's it's actually uh, the opposite of it 
so I'll copy this so this will give us an inverse answer so let's say that a not in and b not in so these are keywords okay so as you can see they are blue in color so it will give an opposite result so I am just checking whether a is not in c but a is actually present in c hence we are getting a false value and here b is not in c and we, hence we are getting true value okay so this is about the membership operators so we have seen the six basic operators in python the first is the arithmetic operator so the basic mathematical operators and then we have seen various assignment operators so after that we have seen the comparison operators the equal to not equal to greater than less than symbols and then we have logical operators which are and or and not and then uh, the identity operators is and is not finally the membership operators in and not in okay so uh, that is all about the operators in python hello everyone this is siddharthan this is the sixth video in python basics module in our machine learning course so in this video we are going to see what is meant by this if else statement and how we can use it in python okay so this if else statement is one of the basic things which we will start learning while we are getting started with programming okay so the use of if else statement is that in some cases we need to perform or we need to run only a specific part of the code and we want to neglect a specific part of the code so for that purposes we will be using this if else statement okay so in this video i'll show you how you can use this if else statement in python and what is the syntax for it okay so first let's create a simple if statement simple if else statement so there are more complicated ways of uh, using the if else statement so let's start from the most basic one okay so let's create a variable called as a and let's say that a has a value of 30 okay let's say that b has a value of 50 okay so now given two values or given two numbers we need to uh, find which is the greatest number okay so for this purpose we can use a if else condition let's say that if a is greater than b we need to print that a is the greatest number okay now else we need to print that b is the greatest number okay so basically what we are doing is we are checking the condition so if a is greater than b so we will tell that a is the greatest number else so else condition is that b will be the greatest number so we will be printing b is the greatest number so it may seem very simple so this is just for demonstration purposes so when we are uh, using if statements there will be a lot of complicated places so but this basic knowledge is uh, you know important for us to do those complicated things so i'll run this so now it uh, prints that b is the greatest number because b is 50 right so now we can also do this in a different way where a is equal to let's say a is equal to int input enter the first number okay and b is equal to int input enter the second number okay now you can just copy this here so basically what i am doing is so in this case we have uh, given the value for a and b in this code itself but in this case we will ask the value from the user so when i use this keyword input so it will get the value from the user and that value will be converted to integer okay so now let's run this so when we run this so the user will be asked to give two numbers and the greatest number you know this uh, code tells us whether the first number is greater or the second number is greater let's say that the first number is equal to 150 okay i'm pressing enter so let's say the second number is um, let's say 100 so it obviously prints that the first number is uh, the greatest so here a is the greatest number because we have just used it so you can just put here that 
first number is the greatest okay in this case second number is the greatest so this is how you can get some values from the user and you can print which is the greatest number okay so let me print 16 here and let's print 20 so as you can see here the second number is the greatest so this is a simple way of using if statement okay so this is a simple method there is another thing called as else if condition so this is if else if and else statement okay so else if which means else if okay so the short form for else if is else if so let's say that we have three numbers in this case let's say that a is equal to 15 and b is equal to 25 c is equal to 30 okay so in the previous case we just add two numbers and we just wanted to check two conditions whether a is greater than b so if a is greater than b this code will be printed so it won't go into the sales condition so if this condition is proven wrong so this condition so sorry this statement will be printed okay so here we just have two conditions right but when we have three conditions or you know more than two condition we can use this else if uh, statements okay and there is one important point to note here that if there is this if else pair so either one of this will be uh, printed so like uh, how can i say this is in no condition both of these statements will be printed okay so only this condition can be true or the else condition can be true never both the conditions can be true for a if else pair similarly in this case let's say that in this case we have three numbers and we need to compare these three numbers and print which is the greatest number okay so for this purpose we can use if else if and else statement let's say that if a is greater than b which is again greater than c okay so let me put it this way a is greater than b and it is also greater than c okay sorry okay so a is greater than b and it is greater than c so in that condition i want to print that a is the greatest number okay so now i want to have two other conditions now i should use if else sorry else if so else if so the keyword is l if so e l i f if hmm, b is greater than a and greater than c i want to print that b is the greatest number okay so and finally we have the else statement okay else print so if both these conditions are false that means c will be the greatest number so i'll mention that in the else condition so c is the greatest number so there is no need that you need to mention the condition for uh, else so if both these conditions are failed there is only one condition so that is that c is the greatest number so you don't need to mention the condition for else okay so here as i have told you earlier in this uh, you know triplet only one conditions will be true either a is greater than b and c or b is greater than a and c or c is greater than a and c in no cases two conditions can be correct or three conditions can be correct so in this triplet only one statement will be printed okay so i'll print this so it should tell that the c is greatest number okay so c is the greatest number so this is how you can use if else if and else statement so there is another method of or another variation of this uh, if else statement so it's called as nested if condition so nested if uh, let's say statement okay so nested if means using a if statement inside an if statement so that is called as nested if condition so let's say that similarly we have three values let's say that a is equal to 20 and b is equal to 40 and c is equal to 60 okay and let's say that if a is greater than b okay so i want to check which is the greatest number so what i'll do here is first i will check whether a is greater than b so if a is greater than b i should check whether a is 
greater than c also okay so if a is greater than b i need to check that if a is greater than c also so in this condition a is the greatest number because it is greater than b and it is also greater than c so here i can print that a is the greatest number okay if this condition is false which means if a is greater than b but a is not less than not greater than c means c will be the greatest number so else i hope you are getting what i am telling so print so in this case c will be the greatest number so c is the greatest number okay now so this is for this pair okay so this is for this if else is this pair and there is another if here so we are we are using one if else statement inside a if condition hence this is called as nested if okay so there is another thing we need to note here so if a is not greater than b or else if b is greater than a this condition won't be satisfied and these statements won't be printed okay so the interpreter control won't go into this statements so in this case else so else means if else here means b is greater than a okay so in that condition we need to again check whether b is greater than c as well so in that condition sorry if b is greater than c also we need to print that b is the greatest number okay and now we need to include another else condition so which means in this condition c is greater than c is the greatest number okay so so what we are basically doing is first we are checking whether a is greater than b so if a is greater than b we need to check whether a is greater than c also now i am checking whether a is greater than c if these two conditions are satisfied that means a will be the greatest number and this particular statement will be printed or else if a is greater than b but it is not greater than c that means c is the greatest among all the three numbers so in that condition i want to print this statement which means c is the greatest number then we have the sales condition where so when this condition will be uh, you know carried out is if this condition this if is false okay so which means if a is not greater than b or b is greater than a so it will go to this statement because it is unsatisfied so it won't go into this statements so the control comes here okay and check these conditions so now we know that b is greater than a right and now it should check whether b is also greater than c as well now it checks it if b is greater than c this line will be printed or else this line will be printed which is c is the greatest number okay so let's run this so we got that c is the greatest number because it has a value of 60 so this is a simple example for nested if statement where we use if statement inside an if statement so you can see here among this fifth line you know and tenth line so only one conditions can be satisfied and among this sixth line and eighth line only one condition will be satisfied okay so you would have noticed this indentation so when you mention a semicolon here in the if statement line so there will be indentation or space so we call this space as indentation so this is very important in the case of uh, these if statements and for loops and while loops okay so so this indentation means this particular uh, line of code comes under this if condition so this indentation means it comes under this else condition so whenever you use this colon here so there will be an indentation in the next line okay so in collab it automatically creates that indentation in some of the basic uh, python consoles you need to give that indentation or you need to give that space okay so these are some variations of if statements okay so we have seen a simple if else condition and then we have seen how we can use uh, the input feature to get the numbers from the user and print the greatest number and we have seen how we can use this else if condition by uh, get having more than two conditions then we have finally discussed about the nested if statement where we can use a if statement inside an if statement so that is all about the if else statement so
in this video we are going to discuss about loops in python okay so there are basically two important loops in python they are for loop and while loop okay so in this video we will see where we will be using loops and what is meant by this these loops okay so before starting the video if you want to learn data science you can check out my hands on data science course with python i have given the link for my course in the description of this video okay so getting started with today's video first of all let's understand about for loop okay so so i'll give you an example of where this is used so first of all let me create a variable as laptop one so in this laptop one variable we want our user to type an input okay so laptop one is equal to input enter the price of the laptop okay so if i run this this will ask the input from the user so enter the price of the laptop so here we can uh, give some price let's say the price of the laptop is 20000 okay so this is how you can get input from the user using this input function okay so when you get input from a user it will consider this input as string so strings are nothing but text okay so we need to convert it to integer so even though it is an integer or it is a number so this input function will think that this input is a string so we need to convert it by putting this int keyword here so this will convert this string into an integer okay so i'll run this again now it will be considered as an integer okay so now what i'll do is let's say that we want to get the price for five laptops okay so for that what we will be doing so we will type this lines five times right so laptop one so i have pasted it five times so i'll change this variable to laptop two laptop three laptop four and laptop five so when i run this so it will ask for the price of the laptop let's say again it's twenty thousand for the first laptop and there is another laptop and the price of that laptop is thirty thousand and next it's let's say 40,000 and 50,000 okay and the fifth laptop will be let's say it's 60,000 okay so this is how you can get price of five laptops right so with this data you can add all those prices and tell the user that what is the total price of the five laptops right so this is how we can get five inputs but you can look the code here this is not an efficient way to write a code so in this i have just repeated the same line of code again and again except this change in the variable name right so in this case only we will use loops so loop is used to repeat a certain action again and again okay let's see how we can use loop to do this same action so we want to uh, ask input from the user five times about the price of the laptop but we want to do it in a concise way in a short way okay so for this purpose of reducing the size of the code we can use loops and to repeat the same action again and again okay so for this i can use the for loop as for i in range 5 okay so laptop let me put as laptop price so laptop price is input so again you can just copy this here so i'll explain you about the syntax in a minute okay so just wait a minute okay so what i have done here is okay so this is the syntax for for loop so we will use this keyword for and i is a variable so for i in range 5 so range 5 means it's nothing but uh, 0 1 2 3 and 4 so in python indexing starts from 0 as i have told you in the previous videos so it starts from 0 so 5 means 5 numbers so the 5 numbers are 0 1 2 3 4 okay so totally we have 5 numbers okay so this will count 5 times and i takes the value of these five numbers okay so when it runs this loop for the first time it will take the value of zero and then one two three four so totally we have five times our loop running okay so if i run this okay 
so it is not defined so i should just made some spelling mistake so it is int okay so i'll run this so now we can enter the price of the laptop in the same way as we did so let me put 20000 again 30000 40000 50000 and 60000 so now you can see here in the previous uh, piece of code we have did the same action in five lines of code but here we have did that in a in two lines of code so this is the uh, advantage and use of loops so we can do the same thing again and again and it will reduce the size of our code and it will be a very efficient way to do that so this is the syntax so we will use this for i in range so instead of i you can use uh, j or anything like that so this is just a variable name so this in is, rep is important okay so what happens is for i in 5 so when this loop runs for the first time this i will take the value of 0 okay so 5 means these uh, 5 values which are 0 1 2 3 4 so this basically counts the number of times the loop is running okay so for 0 in range 5 so the first time this code will run okay and uh, this first line will be printed once we have given the price of the laptop so this will again go to the start now this i will take the value of 1 and again this loop will be uh, performed so again this third second line will be printed and when i give the value for this particular line it again goes to the top of the loop and now i will take the value of 2 and this continues as long as it gets the first five values so that is why i'm, uh, I'm mentioning the value as 5 okay so if i put uh, something like 7 here so if i run this so it will ask us for seven uh, values so let's say the price of the laptop is 3k so it's 3000 okay so let me put us three just consider it's 3000 four five six seven okay so i've just typed the enter so that's the problem so let me run it again quickly six seven eight nine two three four okay so as you can see here it has printed this seven times so that is the use of this particular range okay so when you give seven so it will take the values as zero one two three four five and six okay so this particular number will be excluded because the number is starting from zero so this is the use of loops and this is how you can use loops okay so there is another uh, way of using this okay so i hope every one of you is familiar with list Okay, so let me create a number list. So I create the list named as numbers and it contains the numbers as 50, 100, 50, 100, 150 and 200. So this list contains four values 50, 100, 150 and 200. Now what I want to do is print these individual elements. So for that you what you can do is you can Put this print function and you can mention the name of the list which is numbers and inside that you can mention the index values okay so i'll just copy this so i want to print all these four numbers so one two three okay so because indexing starts from zero as i have told you earlier so index of 50 is zero 100 is one 150 is 2 and 200 is 3 so let me run this this will print the individual elements okay as you can see here so instead of doing this what we can do is use a for loop similarly as we did in the previous case and print these individual numbers okay so this is the list we have and now what we can do is use a for loop like for i in numbers so this for and in are the two important keywords for for loop so for i in numbers print i okay so as you can see here so we have this list which contains four elements so what happens when we run this for loop is so when the loop runs for the first time this i will take the first value which is 50 and it goes inside this loop so inside this we have one statement which is to print i so for the first time the value of i is 50 so once this i is completed it will take the second value okay and now it will print the second value which is 100 and 150 and 200 so this is how loops are okay now let's discuss about the second important loop which is for while loop so we have discussed about for loop and now we will discuss about while loop okay 
now what is the difference between for loop and while loop so you can see in this case so in this case we know that we want to print this uh, lines seven times right so before we know that we have to print that five times so in this we are pr printing it seven times so there will be cases in our program or in our code that we may not be sure how many times we want to run a particular statement so in, in that particular cases we can use while loops but when we are using a for loop we should mention the number of times we want to print a function okay so that is the difference between while loop when you are not sure about the number of times an action has to be executed so this is how you can create a while loop so you need to initiate value for i so it can be any uh, variable so i will use i is equal to 0 and y i is less than 10 okay so while i is less than 10 i want to print i so let me explain you in a minute what this code does okay so what i'm doing is so this is I, i'll just put the syntax of while loop here so it's while condition while if the condition so there is condition here okay so this is the while loop while loop condition sorry syntax okay so so we will include this while keyword and there will be a condition if this condition is true then this statement will be carried out okay so in this case you can see here so we have this while keyword and then we have a condition which is i is less than 10 okay so if this condition is satisfied this uh, program will go into this statement okay so you can see the indentation here so you can see the indentation in the case of for loop also so that means this particular statement is inside the loop okay so basically what we are doing is first of all we are initiating i is equal to 0 and we are checking the condition i is less than 10 so as long as i is less than 10 this loop will be carried out again and again okay so first of all i will take the value of 0 now it will check the condition so i is less than 10 so we have the value of i is 0 so 0 is of course less than 10 so the condition is true and now this will be carried out so i will be printed then we are incrementing i with 1 so this basically means so what this basically means is i is equal to i plus 1 so the short form for writing this particular line is i plus is equal to 1 so this these two are the same things okay so i just delete here so what happens once i is printed so it will be added with 1 so now the value of i will be 1 right and now it will again check the condition now 1 is again less than 10 so it will print uh, i which is 1 now and again it will be incremented so this process will uh, continue as long as i value is less than 10 so let's print this as you can see here so 0 1 2 3 so this will print i up to 9 because so if we have made the condition as i is less than or equal to 10 we will get a 10 right so that's why it has printed up to 9 only okay so this is how you can use while loop when you are not sure how many times the loop should run okay but in the case of for loop we will mention the number of times you want to run a particular action again and again okay so this is one case where you can use while loop okay so as i have told you if this condition is true only this while loop will be uh, carried out so let's see what happens if the condition is not true so i is equal to 5 while i is less than 3 print i and equal to 1 so i'll run this so nothing will happen as you can see here it just executed but we i is not printed because this condition is not true so you can see here i is equal to 5 so here the condition is i should be less than 3 but i is of course greater than 3 right so this condition returns a false value and hence uh, in the program won't go into this while condition in this while loop okay so that is why we won't get any outputs so this while loop will be skipped so when this condition is true as in this case we will be uh, you know the statements inside these uh, loop will be printed whereas when the condition is false the statement inside the loop won't be printed okay so this is about while loop 
so the important thing you that you need to know between for and while is so in for loops we know the number of times the code has to be uh, repeated again and again but we can use while loops when we are not sure how many times the code should be repeated so in these cases i have just made some very simple very basic examples so that you can understand and when we do various uh, projects and other programs in python so it will be very complicated very uh, complicated and complex loops will be used okay so this is for your basic understanding so i hope you understood the basic function of for and while loops in this video i'm going to explain you about one of the important concepts in programming so it is nothing but functions so we are going to see what is meant by functions and how we can implement functions in python okay so as you can see here i have made a description about function here so a function is a block of code that can be reused in a program so this is about function so let's say that we have a thousand line of code in python okay so in the thousand line of code there is a particular block of code which is then the length of that particular block of code is 100 lines and in our thousand line code we need to use this particular underlines again and again so what we can do is instead of writing this underlines again and again we can just create a function so by creating a function you can reuse it and you don't need to write the entire code again so you just need to mention a word and using that word you can call that entire hundred lines of uh, code okay so i'll explain you this with an example okay so what we will do is so i'll create factorial program of a number so factorial factorial of a number so you can understand about functions better with an example so i'll explain you how you can create a function for factorial of a number so so what is a factorial so i'll just give you a definition about it factorial of a number is the product of all the positive numbers the positive integers less than or equal to the given number okay so so factorial of a number is the product of all the positive integers less than or equal to number equal to the given number so we would have learned about this uh, in our uh, you know early classes in school so let me give you an example of factorial let's say that we want to find the factorial of 5 so factorial of 5 so as you can see the definition above so factorial is nothing but the product of all the integers of all the values that should be less than 5 in this case so it's nothing but so less than and equal to 5 so it's 5 into 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. So the product of all these numbers which are less than and equal to 5 will be the factorial of 5 and the value will be 120. So the factorial of 5 is 120. So this is how you can find the factorial of a number by multiplying it with all the numbers less than and equal to it. Okay. Now let's see how we can create or how we can find the factorial of a number in Python. Okay. So I'll create a variable as number. And let me put input enter a number to find its factorial. Okay, so this input function asks the input from the user. So the in user will give a number and we will find the factorial of that particular number. Okay, and we need to mention int here because. You can see the input function here so this input function consider that the value given by the user is string so strings are nothing but text so we need to convert that text to an integer okay so so number is equal to int so we need to find the factorial of this number okay so what you can do is create another vari variable called as factorial let's put factorial is equal to 1 as the initial value so as you would know that factorial of 1 is 1 and also factorial of 0 is one so there is this important point to note here that the factorial of zero is not zero but one okay so i'll create uh, this factorial vari variable and give it the value of one now let's say that if number if the value number is nothing but the value given by the user if 
the number is equal to 0. So you should put 2 equal to because it means the number if the number is exactly equal to 0. So if the number is equal to 0, in that case I want to print that the factorial of 0 is so as I have told you factorial of 0 is 1 ok so if the number is not equal to 0 if the user gives some other input input except 0 so what we need to do is we can make an else condition here so else we can use a for loop to find the factorial for i in range 1 comma number plus 1 ok so I'll explain you about this after completing this loop factorial is equal to factorial into i ok so what I'm basically doing is so you can see this step here so for factorial of i we need to multiply 5 by 4 3 2 and 1 so that is what I am doing in this for loop so let's say that uh, the number is 5 so what happens is so the value of number in this case will be 5 and you can see here we have mentioned the number here so th the range in this case will be so range of 1 comma number plus 1 okay so number plus 1 here the uh, number will be 5 so 5 plus 1 is 6 so basically a range of 1 to 6 means all the numbers between 1 and 6 and this is the important point to note here that it will include 1 but it will exclude 6 so when we mention the range here so it will include this first value but it will exclude this second value so what it basically means is so range of 1 comma 6 means it includes all the values from 1 2 3 4 and 5 so this 6 will not be included but the previous number will be included so 1 will be included and 6 will be excluded so as you can see here we have 1 2 3 4 5 and we need to multiply all these numbers which will give the factorial of that particular number so this is what we are doing in this uh, for loop so when i is running when this for loop is running for the first time it will take the first value in this range so the first value in this range is nothing but 1 right so it will take the value of 1 so as you can see here we have already initiated the value as 1 for factorial so 1 into 1 which is 1 so and as it completes this particular statement it again goes to the top of this loop now it will take the second value which is 2 right now it will again go here now factorial is equal to factorial into i now it's nothing but so when the for loop runs for the second time so factorial will be equal to already the factorial is equal to 1 and second time the factorial will be equal to sorry this i will be equal to 2 and as the for loop continues to run so in the third step it will be 1 into 2 into 3 in the third in the fourth step it's nothing but 1 into 3 into 4 and finally it's 1 2 3 4 5 so this 1 2 3 4 5 and the product of all these numbers gives nothing but the factorial of 5 so this is what we have done in this particular for loop okay so now i just need to print this factorial value right so let, let us print this but this print should be in this indentation same line of for because it comes under this else loop sorry else condition okay so by this for loop we will find the factorial of the given number so print the factorial of number Yes. So basically, I'm substituting the values. So the factorial of uh, the number given by the user is the value we have found here. Okay. So let us run this. Now the user should give a value. Let's give the value as five. Okay. So as you can see here, the factorial of five is one twenty. So this is how you can find the factorial of a number in Python. So let me run this again. Now let's say that the value is 10 so we need to find the factorial of 10 so the factorial of 
10 is this particular number so you can check it whether uh, the answer is correct or not so this is the exact factorial of 10 okay so now we have created this factorial function let's say that we want to find the factorial of some other numbers okay so we cannot write this entire all the lines of code okay so for this particular purpose we can use a function so this is why function is used because it can be reused so that is the application of function that it is a block of code that can be reused so i'll explain you how you can create a factorial function now so this is creating a factorial program and this is how to put that in a function so factorial function so for creating a function you need to mention the keyword def so def which means define so we are defining a function so let's name our function as factorial value okay so we are going to do the same thing that we have done here but we will do that in this function name called as factorial value and inside this i will mention that input value we are going to give let's say that input number or i'll just put num okay so you can see the indentation here also so so we have to do all the things we have done here so i hope you have understood how to find the factorial of a number so factorial is equal to 1 if the number is equal to 0 we have to say that the factorial is 1 so what we will do is let's not print but we'll return so this uh, function will return a value so if the uh, number given by the user is 0 so we have used this variable as num so we should uh, mention it here so if the value given by the user is 0 it should return the value which is factorial so we need to mention this also okay so we have already mentioned the factorial is equal to 1 okay now else so as you can see here then we have used this else condition right so i'll just do that else for i in range return factorial okay so i'm just copying this same piece of code but i'm putting this inside this function called as factorial value okay so this will return the factorial value so let's try to run this code so we have successfully created our function factorial value so what happens is if you call this factorial value and give a particular number it will print the factorial of that number so i'm going to print factorial value factorial value of let's say that 5 so i want to find the factorial value of 5 and now okay so sorry it has took the value from here so we just need to mention that so this is the part where i have made the mistake okay so i should give num because that is what we are taking here number means it takes this value so i'll just run this again now let's find the factorial of i so as you can see here now it will give the value of i so we don't need to write this entire piece of code again or we don't need to run this entire code we can just uh, again just call the function which is factorial value and you can mention some number let's say that we want to find the factorial of 10 and now it prints the factorial value of 10 so as you can see here so instead of writing this uh, 11 lines of code again so i have just put it in a single word so this word is now called as a function so as you can see here so inside this function and i have mentioned all the statements that can find the factorial of a number and when i call this function with a particular value in it it will give us the factorial value of that particular number so you can find any uh, factorial sorry factorial value of any number so factorial value of let's say 6 
so this is the use of function so as you can see here we have reused this particular block of code by defining the function as factorial value so what happens is when you mention this factorial value and mention a number inside it or a value inside it so this will call this function which is factorial value and inside this number the input which we have given will go and this particular uh, block of code will be carried out so this is the use of function so the advantage of function is that even under lines of code can be compiled to a single uh, function name okay so i hope you have understood about function and the advantage of using functions in our code first of all numpy so the full form for numpy is nothing but numerical python okay so this numpy is basically used for several new numerical operations and uh, other numerical things which we want to do in our uh, project or in our domain say for example in machine learning we will encounter large data sets so data set containing uh, lakhs and even millions of data points and numbers okay so this numpy library is used for processing that numerical values better and other such kind of things okay so hence it is uh, the short form for numerical python is numpy okay so numpy arrays has two main advantages over list and tuple so list and tuple are the inbuilt data types in python so they store more than one values in a data type say for example an integer or float can only store one value but in a list we can store multiple values so list and tuples are nothing but a collection of values okay and numpy arrays are you know they are just like a list and tuple but they are more advanced than, than, than that okay so the advantages of numpy array over list is that they allow several mathematical operations to be performed on them compared to list okay so we cannot uh, perform as many uh, operations that we can do on a numpy array on a list okay so and the other main important thing is the operations that we do on a numpy array are very faster as compared to list okay so these are the main advantages of it and so you can see this documentation here so you can just search for numpy documentation so you will find this numpy.org site so this is where you can find the explanation about the several functions and what is meant by numpy and what is meant by numpy arrays and all those kind of things so if you are uh, if you have any doubt while you are working on this okay so now let's get started with this so first in order to uh, use numpy you need to import this library okay so for that you just need to give import numpy okay so now what i'm going to do is i'm going to shorten this numpy to np so i'll import numpy as np so what happens is this will import the numpy library in the abbreviation np okay so you can run this so press shift plus enter to run this so this environment is called as google collaboratory so in this google collaboratory you can run python codes so if you are new to this google collaboratory check out my google collaboratory basics video and the index of that video is 2.1 so in that i have explained you how you can use google collaboratory and other features of google collaboratory okay so here we have successfully imported numpy okay so as i have told you earlier numpy is a python library so libraries are nothing but pre made functions and pre made classes which are stored in a python file okay so we can uh, access these functions which are pre made for our uh, programming say for example that can be uh, under line of code okay a particular function can be under lines of code so we don't have to uh, write the entire under lines of code so rather than what you can do is you can create a module or a library and store that under lines of code in a single word or a function okay so using uh, that particular library you can call that uh, call that function and this is the use of libraries so instead of just recreating the code you can just call it with a function or libraries okay so that is the use of libraries in python so and here we have this numpy library and i have imported numpy as np so as i have told you the one main advantage of numpy arrays is that the operations are faster in it okay so i'll just show you uh, i'll show you how we can find that so i'll create a text here as list versus numpy time taken okay so here what i'm going to do is i'm going to perform a simple task on both list and numpy separately and i'm going to find the time taken to do that uh, particular uh, operation okay so or that particular process okay so for this i need to import time so from time so time is another library so from time import process time okay so this process time is used to measure the time required for a particular process okay so i'll run this okay 
now let's see the time taken for a particular task in a list time taken by a list okay one second okay so what i'll do is i'll create a python list so i'll declare the list as python list so we are creating a list named as python list and so list should be enclosed in square brackets and what i'm going to do is i'm going to create a for loop to assign values to this list okay so i for i in range for i in range let's say 10000 okay so what i'm basically doing is i want this python list to have values starting from 1 to 10000 so that is what i have mentioned through this range uh, 10000 so i'm creating a for loop that will uh, give the list values from 1 to or 0 to 10000 okay so now what i'm doing is i'm mentioning this start time okay so start time is equal to process time so we are using this process time to measure the time taken by this particular process now what i'm going to do is so again i'm calling this list python list and in this list i'm going to add the value 5 to all the variables so we have uh, totally we would have 10000 values right from 0 to 10000 so i'm going to add 5 to all the values in this particular list okay so we can do that by using this line of code so i plus 5 for i in python list so this is the similar for loop as we have used it so the difference is that so i am taking all the values from this python list and for each value i am uh, adding the value 5 okay so this is the process i am doing doing and i'll just give a end time here okay so end time is equal to process time and let's print the amount of time required by this particular process so it can be found by end time minus start time okay so what i'm basically doing is i'm first initiating or creating a list and in that list i'm putting the values from uh, 0 to 10000 and i'm creating a start time error and an end time error and between that we have this uh, particular process happening which is to add 5 to all the values of this particular list so what happens is we have this start time and end time so this particular process time function process time fun uh, function will find the amount of time required or the amount of seconds required for this particular process to complete and we are finding the difference in it and this will print the number of seconds taken by this uh, process to complete okay so let's run this so as you can see the amount of time required for this particular process so it's uh, this is in seconds so it is around 1.7 milliseconds right so this is the amount of process taken by a list to complete this particular process now what we, we shall do is now let's create a numpy array and do the similar process and see how much time a numpy array takes okay so i'll declare the variable as np array and let's say np array is equal to np dot array so you can see here i have imported the numpy uh, library as np so i am just calling that numpy library here and this numpy dot array function is used to create arrays okay so numpy array I am just using the same code I have used in the previous cell which is i for i in range 10,000 okay it's the same code that we have used so I want to create a numpy array in this case with values from 0 to 10,000 and I will create a start time okay I will just copy the code from here so start time And now what we will do is we will add this 5 to all the uh, values in this numpy array. So it is the same process that we have done here. So np array plus is equal to 5. Okay, so this is similar to uh, just adding numpy array is equal to numpy array plus 5. So this line, 
so we have this line right so this is similar to this so npra plus is equal to 5 is similar to numpyra numpyra plus 5 so what i am basically doing is i am adding this value 5 to all the elements of this array okay so that's what i am doing which is very similar to this process we have done okay so the only difference is that in this case we have added 5 for all the elements in a list but in this case we are adding 5 to all the elements in a numpy array now we need to mention this end time okay so i'll just copy this end time and start time so this is basically the same process now this process again will take place and uh, for all the values in this numpy array 5 will be added and the amount of time taken for this process to complete is calculated okay so you can see the difference here so the time taken for this numpy array to complete is very much less as compared to this particular line right so it is almost 5 to 10 percentage uh, faster than the list okay so this is the significance of numpy array so you can say that this time difference is not much right but in this case we are just dealing with uh, you know 10000 values but there are cases where we will deal with uh, you know a million of data points or million of numbers so in that case the time uh, difference is quite significant okay so this is one advantage that i have mentioned to you that in uh, numpy array we can do operations much faster as compared to a list okay so now let's get into numpy arrays so let's see how we can uh, create numpy arrays and how we can perform several operations or functions on a numpy array okay so i'll create a text as okay sorry numpy arrays so let me show you how you can initiate a list so we are creating a list here so list one so i mean i'm declaring the name of the list as list one and let's say that the value of this list are one two three four and five okay so i want to print this list print list one and i want to check the data type of the list okay so type list okay so first let's create a list and see so as you know the list should be enclosed in square brackets okay so this type list will give us the data type of this particular uh, data type okay of this particular object so we you can us uh, okay sorry it's list one okay as you can see here we have uh, printed the list and we have found the data type of this particular object as list okay now let's do the same for numpy array i'll declare the numpy array as np array and this numpy array is equal to let's say np dot array which is equal to so you need to uh, pay attention to this parenthesis and square brackets so you need to uh, mention this parenthesis first and inside this you, we need to create a list and put the elements in this particular square brackets okay so we are going to create a numpy array and the values are same to this okay so one two three four five okay so now i'll print this numpy array so np array and also i'll check the data type ones type np array okay so this is an example of a numpy array so you can see here in list the elements are separated by a comma but in this case the values or elements are not separated by comma in the case of numpy okay and we have found the data type to be numpy dot nd array so nd represents n dimension array so arrays are similar to matrices okay so we would have studied about vectors and matrices in mathematics so this array is similar to a matrix in matrix okay so let's see now we can create uh, these kind of arrays and uh, more dimensional arrays okay so creating a one dimensional array so it is the same as we have done here so i'll declare the variable as a so the name of the array will be a in this case so a is equal to np dot array and let's say the values are one two three and four and now we can print a okay so we have successfully printed the numpy array here now what you can do is we can check the shape of this numpy array this particular function shape will give us the number of rows and columns in that particular numpy array okay 
so you can see here we have only uh, one value because this numpy array is one dimensional so this four represents we have four columns okay so now let's create a two dimensional array so i'll create or i'll declare the variable as b so b is equal to np dot array and what i'll do is let's say the values are 1 2 3 and 4 5 6 7 and 8 okay so now let me print b as you can see here this is similar to a two cross four matrix containing two rows and four columns right so this is how you can create arrays with multiple dimensions so in this case we have just created a one dimensional array containing one row but here we have created an array with two rows and four columns so now you can check the shape of b okay so the first value represents the number of rows and the second value represents the number of columns. So we have two rows and four columns in the case of the array B. Okay, so in this case, we have just only one dimension. So we have just one number here. Okay, so in this case, four represents the number of columns. But in this case, so the first value represents the number of rows and the second value represents the number of columns. So totally we have two rows and four columns in this case. Now, let's do another thing. I'll create another array as c is equal to np dot array and so as you can see here all the values are integers in this case right so now let's see how we can put values with float floating points floating points are nothing but the decimal values so np dot array which is equal to let's say 1 2 3 and 4 and 5 6 7 and 8 okay and now you can mention the data type as d type so d type represents data type float okay now let's print c as you can see here now we have floating point values which is this is uh, similar to 1.0 2.0 etc so by mentioning the data type float so you can uh, create an array with uh, floating point values so if you don't mention any uh, mention any data types the default value is integers so we get an array of uh, integer values okay so now let's discuss about placeholders in array so now we are going to discuss about initial placeholders in numpy arrays okay so these initial placeholders are nothing but in some cases we want to initiate arrays with certain values say for example in several cases we may need to initialize an array in which all the values are zero in some other cases we need the initial values to be one in all the values so such kind of things so that is meant by initial placeholder so initial placeholder placeholder means the initial values present in that particular numpy array okay so now Let's create a numpy array of zeros. So let's name the array as x. So x is equal to np dot zeros. So zeros is the function which is used to create an array containing the all the values as zero. So in this particular parenthesis, you need to mention the shape of your array. 4, 5. Let's say that we want to create an array of four column, four rows and five columns, and we need all the values to be zero. Okay, so that's what we are trying to do here. So you can note here that I have used uh, used two parentheses here. So inside this parenthesis, I have mentioned the shape of the array that I want. So now let me print x. Okay. Now, as you can see here, we have created an array with all the values as zero of four rows and five columns okay so you need to use this np.zeros function and inside that you need to mention the dimension of the array that you need now let's create a numpy array with all the values as one okay create a numpy array of ones so i'll create a, the numpy array as y so np.ones is the function that's used to create array with value 1 so now let's uh, put the shape of the array as let's say um, 3 comma 3 okay so i want a 3 comma 3 array with all the values as 1 let's print y as you can see here we have created a 3 cross 3 array 
with all the values as one so this is some example of initiating an array with the values as 0 and 1 now let's see how we can create an array of a particular value okay so particular value so let's say that the array is z and z is equal to np dot full this full function helps us to create an array with a specific value so first you need to mention the shape or the dimension of the array you want so let's say that i want an array of 5 comma 4 uh, shapes so five, it means 5 rows and 4 columns right and next you need to mention the value which you want to give let's say that i want a 4 cross 5 array or 4 cross 5 matrix with all the values as 5 and now let me print is it As you can see here, we have got a five rows and four column matrix with all the value as five. Okay, so this is how you can create an array with a specific value. Now let's see how we can create an identity matrix. So create an identity matrix. So we would have studied about this ident identity matrix in our uh, basic mathematics. So this identity matrix means all the diagonal values will be uh, having the value of one and other values will be zero. Okay. So this identity matrix is also used in various cases in our programming. So I'll create the numpy as a and for creating an uh, identity matrix, you need to use the function i. So np dot i. And in that mention the num the shape of your matrix okay now you you should not uh, mention the number of rows and columns because identity matrix have the same number of rows and columns okay so we cannot have a identity matrix of 5 comma 4 uh, array or we cannot have an uh, identity matrix of 4 comma 5 uh, array okay so in the case of identity matrix the number of rows and columns should be equal so example this case so the number of rows and columns is equal so in such case we can have an identity matrix or in case where the shape of the array is 4 cross 4 or 5, co uh, 5 cross 5 so those kind of things so you need to mention so let's say that we want a uh, identity matrix of 4 rows into uh, 4 columns okay so let's print a now as you can see here we got an identity matrix where all the diagonal values is equal to 1 and the remaining values are nothing but 0 so this is an identity matrix so you can just change this value and see so this will give us a 5 cross 5 matrix but it is an identity matrix okay so this is how we can create identity matrix using np dot i function okay so we have just uh, given this pre-made values in this case so we uh, we created array with all the values as zeros and then one and a particular value all those kind of things now let's see how we can create a numpy array so create a numpy array with random values so i want to create a numpy array with random values let's say that the numpy array is b and you can use the function np dot random dot random so in that you need to mention the shape of the array that you want let's say that we want a 3 cross 4 matrix uh, 3 rows 4 column matrix or 3 cross 4 column 3 rows 4 column array with random values so but there is one important thing to note here so let me run this first so we got these random values in our numpy array but the main thing to note here is all the values will be from uh, or all the values will be between 0 and 1 okay so let's run this again we will get some other value okay so we won't get the same value so we will get some other values but that value will be between 0 and 1 okay so this is how we can create a numpy array with random values now let's see how we can create a, a, an array with a random values but we need random integers okay so let's see that so random value random values array and in this case we want integer okay so random values array random integer values array and we can mention the range we need so random integer values arrays within a specific range okay so i'll create the numpy arrays as c so c is equal to np dot random so we have used this random dot random function to create numpy arrays with values between 0 and, uh, and 1. So now you can use this function np dot random dot rand int. So it means random integers. Okay. So now you need to mention the starting and ending point of your value. So here you just need to mention the range in between you want the values to be. Let's say that it's 
10 to 100 okay and next we need to mention the shape we want let's say that we want a three rows and five column array so basically what happens is we will get a three cross five array and all the values will be in the range of 10 to 100 okay so now let's print this so as you can see here in the previous case we got a decimal values between 0 and 1 and now we have got all the values between 10 and 100 okay so this is how you can create a random value array with specifying their starting point and ending point okay so if you run this again you will get some other value but the value will be in this range 10 and 100 okay so you can change this shape to get a different dimension array okay so next what we will do is let's see how we can create an array of evenly spaced values evenly spaced values So d is equal to for this you can use the function np dot lin space. Okay, so np dot lin space in that you need to mention the starting point and ending point or the range in which you want the values. Let's say that I want the values between the range 10 to 30. Okay, so I want five values in this particular array. Okay, so what I'm doing is I'm mentioning the starting point and ending point and the number of values I need. So let's run this and see. So we will get five values between this range uh, 10 to 30, but all these five values will be evenly spaced. So I'm running this. So as you can see here, we got five values and these five values are evenly spaced. Okay, so or you can just use uh, six and see. So I want uh, six values and they should be evenly spaced and that value should be like should lie between 10 and 30. Okay, so here we are uh, getting an array of evenly spaced values and here we are specifying the number of values you want specifying the number of values required. Okay, so there is another method of creating uh, evenly spaced values, but in this case we can mention the step number okay say so I'll, I'll just do this and explain you so array of evenly spaced values and now we need to specify specifying the step okay so i'll explain you what is meant by this step so let's create the array as e so e is equal to for this uh, you can use the function a range So a range, I want the values between 10 and 30 and I want the step value to be 5. Okay, so in this case you need to note here is, so we are not mentioning that I need 5 values. Here we are mentioning that the step should be 5. So the if the value starts from 10, the step should be 5. The other value should be 15, 20, 30, uh, 15, 20, 25 like that. Okay, so let's run this. So print E. As you can see here, we get uh, the step as 5. So here we are not mentioning that we need number of values. So here you can see we have only 4 values. So here we are mentioning the step value which we want. Okay, so we want the values to jump with 5 units. So that's what we are mentioning this using this CA range function. But in the case of lean space, you will mention the number of values you want. So let's say for example, in this case, let's mention 5. So these both are the same, but we are just uh, using different function. Let's run and see this. So it will uh, give us 5 evenly spaced values, but this will give us evenly spaced values between this particular range and uh, mentioning this step. So this is how you can create in, uh, uh, evenly spaced arrays. Now let's see how we can convert a list to an array. Convert a list to a numpy array okay so let's declare the list as list2 so let's say that list2 is equal to so the list should be enclosed in square bracket let's say that the list has values 10 20 30 40 and 50 okay so let's create a numpy array as np array and we can use the function np dot as array So this np.as array will convert one uh, particular data type to a numpy array. So we are converting this list to a numpy array here. So inside this mention list2. Okay, so this will convert this list2 which is uh, typically a list to a numpy array. 
and now let's print this np array and let's also check the data type print sorry type so this will give the data type so let's run this as you can see here we have converted this list to a numpy array as you can see here there are no comma here so we have successfully converted this list to into a numpy array and we have got the data type as numpy.nd array okay so this is how you can convert a uh, list to a numpy array so you can also convert a tuple to a numpy array so the tuple will be enclosed in parentheses but the list will be enclosed in uh, square brackets okay so this is how you can convert a different data type to a numpy array now let's see how we can analyze a particular array so analyzing numpy array so analyzing is nothing but getting various information about that array it's just inspecting an array okay so analyzing a numpy array so let's say that so let's create an array as c so c is equal to np dot random dot random so i want random values so let's take integer values so random dot randint so in that i want the values between let's say 10 to 90 and i want a 5 cross 5 matrix okay so i want a 5 cross 5 matrix or 5 cross 5 array with values ranging between 10 and 90 okay so i'll, I'll also print this c so print c so we got a 5 cross 5 array with the values between 10 and 90 so let's do some analysis on this so you can find the array dimension using this function so we have already seen this so array dimension so what you need to do is i'm just printing this so mention the array name so here in this case the array is nothing but c okay so put c here so c dot shape so this will give us the shape of the array shape of the array is nothing but the number of rows and columns okay now let's check the number of dimension it has so number of dimensions so let's print so for that you can use the function c dot n dime so i am using c because the name of this particular array is c okay so this is the function we have so n dot dime so it means it gives the dimension value so as you can see here we have two dimensions two dimensions because we have uh, rows and columns here right so it is a two dimensional array so if you have just a single row it it will be a single dimensional array as we have rows and columns in this case it is a double dimensional array or it is a 2d array okay so you can also check the number of elements present in the array so checking the number of elements in an array let's print c dot size so this size gives the number of elements so let's print this so as you can see here totally we have 25 values so we have uh, five rows and five columns so totally we have 25 values so you can uh, find the number of elements present in an array using this size function okay so now let's see how we can check the data type present in this array okay so checking the data type of the values in the array okay so let's print it so print c dot d type so d type represents data type so we know that all the values are integers because we have initiated the random integers value so it is int 64 that means 60 in 64 bit integers values okay so this is how you can find what is the data type present in a particular uh, numpy array okay so this is about analyzing or inspecting an array now let's see some mathematical uh, operations that can be performed on an array so mathematical operations on a numpy array or np array so i just want to give you another example here so i need to show that in with the list so i'll create the list as list one which is equal to one two three four and five and i'll create another list as list 2 which is equal to 6 7 8 9 and 10 okay so now what i'll do is i'll just add both of this list and print it so let's print list 1 plus list 2 okay so what do you expect this to give so 
let's uh, try to run and see this so we have we tried to add this list but what actually happened is so when we use this add symbol the elements are not adding so these the element wise addition is not happening say for example uh, the the addition value does not give us the values of 7 and 9 where we add the values element wise okay so in the case of list when you use this add symbol between two list it will concatenate the two list okay so concatenate means just joining the two list so this plus sign will concatenate or joins to list so we cannot add uh, or we cannot have element wise addition in the case of list so concatenate or join to list but we can do this in the case of uh, numpy arrays so let's see how we can do that so let's create a numpy arrays a so a is equal to np dot i'll just copy this from above sorry okay i'll just do that do this here so np dot random dot randin so i want a uh, in random integers by integer values and I want the values between 0 and 10 okay so 0 and 10 now let's mention the shape we want uh, let's say I want a 3 cross 3 array so 3 row and 3 column array and all the values should be between 0 and 10 and uh, I'll create another array I'll name this array as B okay so we have basically we have two arrays A and B and now I want the values between 10 and 20 in this case okay so first uh, array contains value between 0 and 10 and the second array contains value between 10 to 20 and the shape is uh, similar which is 3 cross 3 so let's run this let's print both of these arrays so print a and let's print this b so as you can see here we, we got an array with random uh, values the, so the first val uh, array has values between 0 and 10 and the next array has values between 10 and 20 so now what we can do is we can run some mathematical operations in it so let's run let's say that it's a plus b so we want to print a plus b so in the case of list when we add the two list it will concatenate or joins the two list but in the case of numpy array when you add two numpy arrays so we will get element twice uh, addition say for example in this case the first element is 7 in the first uh, numpy array and the, in the second numpy array the first element is 15 so bo both these values will be added so that will be element wise uh, addition so let's also uh, do a minus b and let's do all the mathematical basic mathematical functions is a into b so you a into b and a divided by b so a by b okay so you can run this so this will give us element wise addition subtraction multiplication and division so we get four uh, numpy arrays and all this the element wise operations will be done okay so in the first numpy array a and b will be added element wise then it will be sub subtracted then it will be uh, multiplied and uh, divided okay so this is one way of doing it where we just uh, add both of these arrays so we can do this in an another way so it is we will just print just mention np dot add okay so in that you need to mention the two arrays which you want to add let's say that we want to add the the, uh, the two numpy arrays a and b so i'll just copy this and i'll just make another array here so i want another a and b so I'll run this. Now we will have different values for A and B. So let me print that. So print A comma B. Sorry. So print A and print B. So we will get new values for this. So instead of just uh, putting A plus B, what you can do is you can mention this np dot add function. This add function will add two uh, arrays. So I have mentioned A and B. Now print np dot subtract so this will uh, find the difference between the two arrays element wise so a comma b and then we can print np dot multiply a comma b and finally let's print np dot divide 
env okay so let's run this so this is similar to this particular code but it is an another way of doing that using this np.add on np.subtract function so we got the four mathematical basic operations performed on a numpy array okay so this is how you can perform some basic uh, mathematical operations on it okay so now let's do some array manipulation so i'll just create a text here array manipulation so let's create an array so i'll declare the name of the array as array itself so mp dot random dot random and i want the values between 0 and 10 and i want the shape of the array to be 2 comma 3 so it will be a 2 row and 3 column matrix as we know now i'll just print this array and also i'll print the shape of this array so print array dot shape okay so this is similar to a 2 cross 3 matrix where we have 2 rows and 3 columns right so now you can create the transpose of this matrix so i'm going to create the transpose so let's name the transpose as trans which is equal to for that you can use the function np dot transpose okay so np dot transpose so inside that mention the array which you want to uh, convert so i want to convert this particular array and find its transpose so np dot transpose array and let's print this trans okay and now let's print the shape of this transpose array as well so trans dot shape so transpose is nothing but if the matrix is 2 comma 3 it will be converted into a 3 cross 2 matrix so all the rows will be converted into uh, columns and the columns will be converted into rows so if we have the values as 1 2 8 0 7 the values will be 1 8 uh, 2 0 and 2 7 so let's run and see this so as you can see here the uh, array is transposed so this is how you can create an array and you can create the transpose of that particular matrix so there is another way of uh, finding this transpose so i'll just copy this array so it will give us new values okay so as you can see here now the values are different so there is another method of finding the transpose so i'll create trans another transpose as trans2 which is equal to so mention the array name so here the array name is array dot t so when you mention this dot uh, t it will find the transpose of this uh, array and it it will store that in this trans2 okay so now let's print trans2 and let's print the shape of this trans2 so trans2 dot shape okay so now we can see here that uh, this trans uh, this particular matrix is transposed uh, using this dot t function so these are the two ways of finding the transpose of uh, a matrix so now let's uh, see another thing so this is the last function which we are going to see so reshaping array reshaping array so let's create a array as a which is equal to np dot um, random dot random and let's say that we want the values between 0 and 10 and i want the shape of the matrix or shape of the array to be 2 comma 3 so it is a 2 comma 2 rows and 3 column array with values between 0 and 10 so let's print a and also let's check the shape of a so a dot shape so as you can see here this is the random values which we got so it is a 2 comma 3 uh, 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 shape matrix or 2 comma 3 shaped array so now you can reshape this array let's say that let's create another uh, array as b so b is equal to a dot b shape and let's say that 3 comma 2 so in this case we have a 2 comma 3 matrix and now let's say that i want to convert this to a 3 comma 2 matrix so in this case it will be a uh, 3 rows and 2 column matrix so this uh, particular array which is a so you can see this is the array a so this will be converted to a 3 comma 2 array okay so let's and it will be stored in this array b okay so let's print b and let's also print the shape of b so I'll run this. So now you can see here 
this is how we can reshape array so this reshape is one of the most important function we will be do uh, we will be using in array okay so these are some of the most important functions and the most important properties you need to uh, know about array so you can make note of this or you can save this code anything you want but these are very important so these can be seem very simple for you and it is actually very simple and these will be used in various uh, you know times when we are working on machine learning projects or any other projects so this is why numpy array is very much important for us so the uh, main thing to note here is the numpy arrays are very faster than the inbuilt python uh, data types like list or tuple and we can uh, do several mathematical operations and other operations as well so there are also other functions beyond this uh, but these are the important functions which we will encounter regularly so i hope you have uh, understood all the things we have done here pandas library in python okay so this is the third module in our hands on machine learning course with python in the first two modules we have discussed about the machine learning basics and the python basics required for machine learning okay so in this module which is the third module we are going to discuss about some of the most important libraries that are, are required for machine learning okay so in the previous video we have discussed about the tutorial on numpy library and in this video we are going to see about pandas library okay so as you can see here i have made some description here so pandas library so the main use of pandas library is for data processing and analysis okay so in machine learning we deal with lots of data okay so there can also be in cases where we will be dealing with uh, even millions of data points okay so we need a, a certain tool or a suitable tool to perform various operations and functions on those data okay and pandas library is one of the main tool we will be using in machine learning for data processing and for also analyzing the data set okay so pandas contains an important object type called as data frame okay so as you can see here pandas data frame is two dimensional tabular data structure with labeled axis okay so these are nothing but very structured tables okay so these are two dimensional tables having rows and columns okay and there will be uh, column names for each columns okay so this is about the pandas library so pandas library basically has two objects so one object is this data frame and there is also another object called as pandas series okay so but in machine learning we will be using this data frame predominantly so i'll explain you most of the important functions that are uh, that we will be using in this data frame okay so i will i will be explaining you all the functions by taking two example data sets so i have already uploaded one data set file here so diabetes.csv file so this is the diabetes prediction data set so we have already made a project video on predicting diabetes of a patient using this data set so you can check that video as well if you are if you haven't seen that okay so and we will be using another data set called as boston house price prediction data set so these are the two data sets we will be using and uh, we will be doing all the code in google collaboratory so if you are new to this channel or if you new to google collaboratory you can check my video on google collaboratory basics in which i have explained you about how you can access google collaboratory through google chrome and what are the various features of google collaboratory okay so now get started with this pandas tutorial so first we need to import the library importing the pandas library so libraries are nothing but pre-made codes so these codes are uh, pre-made already and they are stored in these modules or uh, these libraries and we can use these libraries for those specific functions okay so for that you need to mention this import so this will import that library so let's import pandas so i want to uh, import pandas in a short form so i don't want to use pandas uh, in all the code so i just want a shorter form of this library so let's import pandas as pd okay so this is the general convention that we use in machine learning or any other python uh, related codes so we will be importing pandas as pd and if we are working with numpy library we will import numpy as mp okay so i am importing pandas as pd here so you can press shift plus enter to run this code okay so this will import our uh, pandas library now let's create a pandas data frame okay creating pandas data frame so you can join my telegram group I'll give the link for that in the description of this video. So in that I will be notifying you once I post new videos. Okay. So getting into this, we need to create a pandas data frame. So first of all, let me also import 
the Boston house price uh, dataset. So we have already imported the CSP file here. Now we will import the Boston dataset from SKLearn. Okay, so importing the Boston data. Okay, Boston house price data. So it is uh, present in the SKLearn library. So you can use this for that from SKLearn dot data sets import load boston okay so i'll create or i'll declare the variable as boston data set so boston data set is equal to load boston so this will load the boston data set to this uh, boston data set variable okay so i'll run this you can check the data type of this particular object. So type, so I want to check the type of Boston dataset. Okay. So as you can see here, it is a uh, SKLearn utils bunch. So bunch is like a dictionary object. So it contains a lot of data. So let's try to print and see this data. Okay, so print Boston dataset. So this is the data set we have imported as you can see here. So I hope you know that a dictionary contains a key and a value. So here the key is nothing but this the word data and these are the values in it. So we have various values in it and this is the target. So this target is nothing but house price. So these values are in thousand dollars. Okay, so twenty four thousand dollars, twenty one point six thousand dollars and those kind of things. And uh, these uh, data represents various values like age of the person uh, owning that house or uh, the tax they need to pay. And the crime rate and all signs all kinds of data and this target variable contains the price of the data set sorry the price of that particular house okay so you can see the feature names here so these are the different features or columns so we have the crime rate zone uh, number etc okay so we have already done this project for predicting so you can check that video if you want to get more information on this okay so now we have successfully imported this boston house data set from sklearn as you can see here, there are so much numbers here, right? So this, you know, type of data is not very suitable for analysis. So this is where pandas comes into play. So this pandas helps us to import this data set into a more structured table. Okay. So let's see how we can do that. Okay. Pandas data frame. So I'll declare the variable as Boston DF. So DF means data frame. Okay. So is equal to you can use this PD dot data frame function. Okay. So PD is nothing but pandas. So we have imported pandas as PD. Okay. So in this mention, what is the data that you want to include? So let's say that I want to include all these data okay so i want to uh, include this data from this boston data set object so i don't want to include this target or price of this right now so i just want to include all this data in my data frame so you need to mention so pd dot data frame mention the data set name which is boston data set dot data okay and also mention the column names or you can just mention columns. So columns is equal to Boston data set dot feature names. Okay, so I'll explain you what is meant by this. So we are creating a pandas data frame and inside this we need to give the data we want and the name of each of the column we want. So let's first uh, see about this. So this is nothing but Boston data set dot data which is nothing but this. So you can see here that we have printed this Boston data set, right? So these are the data. So I want to include all these values and I want to get the columns na column names as well. Here the columns names are nothing but these feature names, the crime rate, the zone, etc. Okay. So I am loading all this data to my data frame, which is known as Boston DF. And I am importing all the feature names as column name. Okay. So let's run this. Okay. So now let's see the sample of this data set. So Boston DF dot yet. So when you use this yet function in a pandas data frame, it will print you the first five rows of that data frame. 
so as you can see here we have printed the first five rows so we have all these columns as crime rate zone indus etc okay so this is how you can see the sample of this data set now what we will do is let's check the shape of this data frame so boston df dot shape so this tells us the number of rows and columns in this particular data frame so the first value represents rows and the second value represent columns okay so totally we have four, 506 data points or 506 values for a different houses and then we have 13 columns okay so this is how you can check the shape of a data frame so by this we can uh, by using this data frame function this is how we can load a data set into a pandas data frame now i am going to show you how we how you can import a data set from a csv file okay so importing a pandas sorry importing the data from a csv file to a pandas data frame okay so as i showed you earlier i have already uploaded this diabetes data set so it is it is nothing but diabetes.csv so csv are nothing but comma separated values i'll show you how this uh, data actually looks so i'll open this in notepad so in this all the values will be separated by comma okay so this is the comma separated values so this is the diabetes data set we have and uh, you can see the column names here so each of these represents each column name and these are the data okay so the problem with this is that we cannot do any analysis if we have the data like this right so this is why we need a structured table and this is where we will use this data frame okay now i'll show you how you can import this csv file to a pandas data frame so csv file to pandas data frame okay let's create the data frame or declare the data frame as diabetes df so which means diabetes data frame so the previous data set we have worked on is boston data frame so diabetes data frame just copy the path here so copy copy the path of this diabetes csv and for this you need to use the function pd.readcsv so this read csv function will read the csv file and store all the values in the csv file to a data frame whereas in this case we have used this data frame uh, function because we already add this data okay so now use the pd.readcsv and inside quotes mention the path of this file okay so it's nothing but diabetes.csv okay so now let's run this and now you can check the data type of this particular object so which is diabetes df okay okay so it's not defined diabetes okay so there is a small spelling mistake here okay so as you can see here it is a panda score frame data frame so it is a data frame object so you can check the same with this boston df as well so boston df so as you can see here it is a data frame whereas before it was a sklearn or scikit-learn bunch data type okay so this is how you can load a csv file into a pandas data frame so you can uh, similarly find the head of this data frame as diabetes df dot head so this will print the first five rows so i'll run this so these are the first five rows so these are various uh, columns such as pregnancy so this data set basically contains the values for uh, women okay so we have the pregnancy values blood glucose values blood pressure values skin thickness insulin bmi pedigree function age and finally we have this outcome okay so outcome is nothing but one represents that the person is diabetic and if the label is zero it means the person is non-diabetic so these are nothing but the labels so we have two labels here one and zero okay so this is about the sample uh, the sample of this data set so you can also find the shape of this data set by using this diabetes df dot shape okay so we have totally 768 data points or 768 rows and 9 columns okay so you can also read a excel file i'll just make a text here so in this we have read a csv file right so you can also do this with 
a excel file for that you need to uh, use this particular function so loading the data from the excel file to a pandas data frame okay so i'll just put it in text you can check this with some excel file okay so it is very similar to this you just need to use the function pd dot read excel okay so i'll just mention the function here so pd dot read so this is the function and in the quotes you need to mention the uh, path of the file so file path so this will read the excel file and it will store all the values to a pandas data frame okay so now let's discuss how we can export a data frame to a csv file okay so exporting a data frame to a csv file okay so we have discussed here how we can load the contents of a csv file to a pandas data frame using this read csv function now we, we are going to discuss how we can load this particular data frame to a csv file okay so it is the reverse uh, order for this so what i'm going to do is i'm going to load all the contents of this boston data frame to a csv file okay so i'll take this boston data frame so mention the data frame name name here here the data frame is boston df so boston df dot to csv this to csv is the function that will so you can see this here so it will load all this data to a comma separated value file so in this you need to mention the file name so i want the file name to be boston.csv okay so this is how you can do this so i'll run this so you can see here we don't have any file as boston csv here so once we run this particular code it will create a csv file containing all the values from this data frame okay so here you can see that we have this boston.csv file so this is how you can convert a data frame to a csv file so i just download this uh, csv file so let me open and show it to you so you can do this for an excel file also you can also load the contents of a data frame into a excel file as well so just a second it's taking some time okay so we have this boston.csv file now now you can open this in a in excel or in notepad to see how this looks okay so we have successfully converted this boston data frame from uh, this SQL and bunch to a data frame and now from data frame to this CSV file okay so this is how you can convert this now you can also do this by storing or by importing or exporting all the values from a data frame to a excel file okay so for that you just need to use the function so like pd.readcsv you just need to mention the data frame name here so I'll just put it here so exporting the pandas data frame to a to an excel file so for that so you need to mention the data frame name here so i'll just put df so in this case you need to mention as boston.df dot to excel okay so this will store all the values in a excel file so in the parenthesis you need to mention the file name okay so it's the same procedure so this is how you can do this so now let's see how we can create a data frame with random values so i'm going to create a data frame with random values so for this particular function i need the numpy library as well so i'll import numpy library so I'll just import it in the first line. Import numpy as np. Okay, so I'll run this. So this will import the numpy li library as np. So we are going to create a data frame with random values. 
so let's declare the name of the data frame as a random df so this random df is equal to it's the same function which is pd dot data frame which we have used before so pd dot uh, data frame here you need to mention np dot random so this np is nothing but a numpy library so random dot rand and in this parenthesis you can mention the number of rows and columns you want so i'll say that i want 20 rows and 10 columns so this will create a data frame containing 20 rows and 10 columns with random values okay so i'll run this now you can see the sample of this data frame so random df dot eight okay so i'll run this now you can see see here so we got the first five rows of this entire data frame so totally we have 20 rows and we have 10 columns so we got these 10 columns and these are nothing but random values but the main thing to note here is when you use this random dot rand function the values you get will be in in the range of 0 and 1 so all the values will be between 0 and 1 so this is how you can create a pandas data frame with random values between 0 and 1 okay so if you want to have different uh, rows or columns you can change this here okay so you can check the data frame shape so random df dot shape okay so this will give us the shape which is 20 and 10 so which we have used here okay so this is how you can create random data frame now let's see how we can do some inspecting on a data frame so we are going to inspect certain features or properties of a data frame so inspecting a data frame so first let's see how we can find the number of rows and columns finding the number of rows and columns so this we have already seen which is to use this dot shape function so for this i'm going to work on this boston data frame so we have this boston data frame loaded as boston boston underscore df right so i'm going to use this particular data frame okay so mention the data frame name here so once you mention the data frame name just put dot and shape so this shape function will return us a value containing the number of rows and number of columns of that particular data set so we have seen that this boston data frame contains 506 data points or 506 rows and 13 columns so now let's see how we can print first five rows so i have also shown this to you already so first five rows in a data frame so just mention the data frame name boston df dot yet so this will print the first five rows so as you can see here so this is helpful for us to understand what is the range of the values in a data frame okay and uh, what are the different values are looking like okay so you can also print the last five rows last five rows of the data frame so you can do that by mentioning the data frame name which is boston df dot tail okay so this yet function will print the first five rows whereas the tail function print the last five rows so you can see here so this printed us the last five rows of the data frame okay so now let's see how we can get some information about the data set so this particular function will give us information certain information about the data frame so mention the data frame name which is boston df dot info so use this info function so i'll run this this will give us the information such as the number of entries entries are nothing but rows so 0 to 505 so in python indexing starts from uh, 0 and not 1 so it is hence it is given as 0 so 0 to 505 so totally we have 506 values and then we have totally 13 columns so these are all the different columns we have so th 13 columns so it's starting from 0 and we have 506 non-null values so non-null means these are uh, this basically means that there are no missing values okay so these are like uh, if there is a, a value is not available if a value is missing then it will show it here so like for example let's say that in this crime column uh, 10 values are missing okay so in that case it will give us uh, 496 non non values because 10 values are missing okay so and it also gives the data type of the values so here we can see that here that the value is in 64 bit floating point so floating point are nothing but 
decimal points you can see the values here so this is a 64 bit floating point values okay so it also gives the size of this file in uh, in kb or mb whatever it is okay so this is how you can get certain information about a data frame now you can also use this function to find the number of missing values in each column so finding the number of missing values so this particular info function gives us the number of real values or number of values that are present in it okay so as you can see here the non null count so you can find the number of missing values using this particular function boston df dot is null dot sum this will give us the number of missing values in each column so but as we have seen this here the, the no values are missing in this particular boston data frame okay so you can print this so as you can see here so the number of missing values is zero in all the columns so which is a very good thing because in several data sets there will be a lot of missing values and uh, mistakes will be there so in those cases we need to uh, replace those missing values with some other values so we will be discussing about this in data pre-processing module but for now just understand that we can use this is null function dot sum to find the number of missing values in a typical data frame okay so now what we shall do is mm, i want to show you some more function but i want this diabetes data frame so those functions can be uh, explained well in this diabetes data frame so i'll just take this so diabetes df so let's print this yet again diabetes data frame so this will print the first five rows as we know okay so now what we are going to do is we are going to count the number of specific values so in this case you can see that see that uh, the labels are nothing but one and zero so i have told you earlier that if one that represents that the person is diabetic and zero represents that person is non-diabetic so now what we are going to do is count the values based on this particular label okay counting the values based on the labels so um, i'll mention this diabetes df you can use this value counts function for this so value counts and in that mention outcome so I want to count the number of uh, zero and number of one values. Okay, so let's run this. So totally we add about 750 values. So out of those 500 values has a value of zero and 268 values as a value of one. So it means in this entire data set, we have non-diabetic values for 500 data points and diabetic value for uh, 268 data points so this is how you can count specific values in a column so you can just use this value counts to see uh, what are the different values and how many values are present in this age say for example if we just mention age inside here so what happens is it will tell how many people are in the age of 50 or 31 32 etc so this is the use of this value count function so this is very helpful to count the values based on their labels so in this case the labels is nothing but the outcome okay so now let's see how we can group the data based on these labels so we are going to group the values based on their mean okay based on the mean so mention the data frame name diabetes df dot use the function group by okay so in this group by mention the column name outcome dot mean so let's see what we are getting okay so there is something wrong here okay so i just need to mention the parenthesis so now as you can see here we got the two values as 0 and 1 right so these are the two labels we have 0 and 1 and uh, 
so here we have grouped the values based on this outcome based on their mean value so for all the labels of zero for all the non diabetic people the average values for glucose level is 109 so let's not uh, look at this pregnancy values let's look at this glucose value the mean glucose value of all the non diabetic people is 109 okay so but the mean uh, or the mean glucose value for people who are diabetic is 141 and you can also see this change or a change in this mean value for diabetic and non diabetic people in this insulin value so this is very helpful for us to understand what are the different mean values for each of these labels so what is the mean value for people having diabetes and non diabetes so this is how you can group the uh, values based on their mean okay so now let's see how we can get some statistical measures about the data set statistical measures So these measures are very helpful for us to understand what are, what is the mean of all the columns and uh, what is the standard deviation of all the columns and such kind of things. So for this, I'm going to use this Boston data frame. So I'll just use that here. So now first we are going to see the count or number of values in each column, number of values, count or number of values. So I'll use this Boston data frame in this case. So Boston DF. So dot count. So when you use this count function, it will tell us the number of values we have in each column. So as you can see here, in each column we have five or six values. Okay, and it also gives us the data type of all the values. So it is 64-bit integer in this case. Okay. So now let's see how we can get the mean value. So mean value column wise. So Boston DF dot mean so this gives us the mean value for each of this column the mean value for this crime column is 3.6 for this zone is 11.3 index is 11.1 etc okay so now let's find the standard deviation standard deviation this is also column wise Austin DF dot STD. So this gives the standard deviation column wise and minimum value. So this particular function, which is min, gives us the minimum value in each column. So Boston DF dot min. So this gives us the minimum value in each of the column and similarly we can get the maximum value as well. So maximum value for each column. So Boston DF dot max. So these are the maximum values for all the columns. Okay. So this is how you can get the statistical measures about the data. And there is another method. So instead of doing all this separately, we can get all the statistical measures in one go. So all the statistical measure. About the data frame. So for that, you can use the function describe. So Boston DF dot, we are going to use the function describe. Okay. So this gives us, so the count, so the number of values, mean value for each of the column, the standard deviation, minimum value, percentile values. So 25th percentile, 50th percentile, 75th percentile and maximum values. Okay. So this percentile means 25 percentage of the values are less than 0 0.08 in this crime column and 50 percentage of the values are less than 0.25 value okay so these are meant by percentiles and these are different from percentages okay so this is how you can get all the statistical measures like mean standard deviation etc using this describe function okay so this is one of the main thing uh, that we will use because it give, tells us an idea of what is the range and what is the mean value of this uh, data frame. So it is very useful for exploratory data analysis. Now let's see how we can manipulate a data set. So manipulating a data frame. 
so in this we are going to see how we can uh, drop a row how we can drop a column or how we can add new column to a data frame okay so those things we will be seeing it now let's see how we can add a column so adding a column to our data frame okay so if you have seen before so we have imported this boston data frame from sklearn right so we have imported all the values so all the data but we haven't in imported this target value okay so this target is nothing but the price of houses okay so the price of houses in boston in thousand dollars okay so now i'm going to add all these values in my pandas data frame so in this boston data frame so you can see this data frame here we don't have this last column which is price so i'm going to create a column named as price and i'm going to store all these values okay so you can do that by so you can see here the name of this particular target sorry the uh, price values is target so you need to mention boston data set dot target so before we have used boston data set dot data to get all those data now i am going to use this dot target to get all the price values so this is how you can add a column to a data frame and the main thing to note here is the number of values should be same so so boston df mention uh, uh, give a square bracket so this will create a column so i want to create a column named as price okay so this price is equal to boston data set so this is the data set that we have imported from sklearn okay so boston data set dot target okay so this is the price value okay so now let's see the head of this data frame so boston dot df dot head so now you can see that there is another column called as price so this is the last column so this uh, data set is basically used to predict the price of the house given all these data okay so you can see the previous data frame of this boston uh, data set so there is not this price column right so we have added a new column so the main thing to note here is the number of uh, values should be same so we have totally 506 data points so this price column also contains 506 data points so if the number of values is uh, different we cannot do that okay so this is how you can add a column and now let's see how we can remove a row and how we can remove a column so removing a particular row so mention the data frame name so boston data frame so boston df dot drop so this drop function is used to drop a particular row or column anything so let's see how we can uh, drop a row first so you, here you need to mention the index so index is nothing but this number okay 0 1 2 3 4 it's like the serial number so you want to uh, remove the first uh, index which is the first row okay so you need to mention the index as 0 so you can see the index here so i want to remove this first row for now and you need to mention the axis as a 0 okay so if you want to remove a row you need to give axis is equal to 0 and if you want to remove a particular column you need to give the axis as 1 so let's run this and see now you can see here that this zeroth uh, row which is the first row is removed and the data frame starts from the first row which is the second row basically so this is how you can uh, remove a particular row mentioning their index number okay so now let's see how we can drop a column so mention the data frame name which is boston df dot drop and in that mention the name of the column so let's say that we want to uh, remove the column is a 10 okay so the zone value so i'll do that now by using column dot sorry boston df dot drop and in the column variable you need to mention the name of the column so let's say i want to mention this zone is a 10 so you can see the name of the column here and as i have told you earlier if you want to remove a column you need to give the axis value as 1 so if you want to remove a row you should give axis value as 0 so this will remove the zone column okay one second so it should be columns so now you can see there is not this is a 10 column so we have removed this zone column and now we get a data frame without this is a 10 is a 10 column okay so now 
let me show you um, another thing how you can locate particular rows or locate particular columns let's say that we want to uh, locate this particular second row so second this is basically the third row which is given by the index 2 so i'm going to show you how you can uh, print this particular row using this index value okay so locating a row using the index value mention the data frame name boston data frame oh, sorry boston df dot iloc so this iloc function is used to locate a particular uh, row or column so let's say that i want to print this third row the index of which is 2 okay so i'll run this so this gives us all the values in uh, the second row so this second row or so the sorry the second index which contains values from 0 0.02797 7.07 so all these values will be printed okay so now let's see how we can lo locate a particular column so if you note here in this data frame so we have removed the particular row okay so this won't be saved here so we have removed this zeroth uh, row but in this case it, it it's coming again so if you want to remove that permanently you can just uh, create another variable another data frame name as boston df2 okay so what happens here is so that uh, row will be removed and we, we will get a new data frame without that row so i just want to remove these rows and columns temporarily so hence i can do this method okay so same with the column as well so now we get the zone column again because we haven't uh, permanently deleted it so if you want to delete it permanently you can store it in a different data frame okay so now let me show you how you can print specific columns locating a particular column so i'm going to print different columns so Mention the data frame name Boston DF dot look. So you need to mention the square bracket here, so colon, comma, and zero. So if you do this, we will get the first column. So I'll just make a comment about this. So what is meant by this particular line? So it prints the first column of the data frame. Okay. So you can just do this again. Okay, so I'll just change this to this I'll mention minus one. Okay, so as I have told you earlier, in, in Python indexing starts from zero. So the index of this first column is zero. Okay, where it is. Okay, so the index of this first column crime is zero and this is a 10 is uh, one, two, three and it goes on. Okay, so I'm uh, printing this column specifically by mentioning their uh, index number. So if you want to print only the columns alone, you just need to uh, mention this value behind this column and comma. Okay, so now, so this particular line will give us, sorry, so it will give us the value of second column. And this will give all the values for the third column and when you use minus one it gives all the values for the last column okay so last column values so here the last column is nothing but the price right so let's try to print this so it will give all the values so we cannot uh, show all the values in this output hence it has shown this dot three dots so basically all the values are in between it so we have printed the first column which is uh, crime rate so you can see the crime value starts from 0 0.0063 so this is the crime rate so which is the first column so you can also see the name of this particular column so by using this uh, index value i am printing the all the values in that particular column including the name of the column so similarly i printed all the columns and finally i have printed the last column using the index minus one here the last column is nothing but price okay so this is how you can locate a particular row or a particular column so this is the final thing which we are going to discuss here in pandas which is correlation so i'll explain you what is meant by this correlation but basically there are two types of correlation positive correlation and negative correlation
so you can see the data frame here so we have totally 13 columns right so totally we have 13 columns so we call this columns as variables also so this, these are nothing but 13 variables so like excluding the price, sorry including the price we have totally uh, 14 columns so 14 columns are 14 variables so correlation is nothing but the correlation is used to find the relationship between these various uh, columns let's say for example let's consider this crime rate and price so we can say that the crime rate and price are negatively correlated because if the crime rate increases in a city the price of a house in that particular area will definitely decrease right so one value or one variable decreases when one value when one variable increases so this is known as negative correlation okay so like this we have positive correlation so positive correlation are cases in which one value increases if the other value increases okay so let's say let's consider the number of rooms in a house if the number of house in a room increases the price of that particular house also increases right then in that case the number of rooms and price these two variables are positively correlated but in the case of crime and price both the variables are negatively correlated so this is nothing but the correlation so you can also find the correlation of a data frame by using this particular function so i'll mention the data frame name here so bostondf.core so this function will give us the correlation value so negative correlation value means they are negatively correlated so you can see all the columns column names here and here as well so all the values will be all the columns will be compared to other columns as well so let's consider this first row so here the crime value or the crime column is matched with this price column okay so you can see a negative value so negative value means it is negatively correlated so if one value uh, increases if crime value uh, increases the price value decreases by minus 0.3 so you can see this positive correlations here so we have a positive correlation of 0.36 here so for this zone column if this particular column zone column increases the price also increases so these are positively correlated so you can see this rm so this is nothing but i think it's the number of rooms so if the number of rooms increases the price also increases so it is positively correlated so this correlation value is very important for us because it tells us which columns or which features are very important for analysis okay so it tells us which uh, columns are related to each other which uh, columns are related to the price of that particular house so this helps us to understand more about the data understand more about that particular features okay so we can also visualize this in a heat map which we'll be discussing in a different video so that is all about pandas data frame okay so this is how you can create a data frame and how you can uh, inspect a data frame such as uh, the shape of the data frame printing the first five rows of the data frame and such kind of things and i have also explained you how you can manipulate the data in a data frame by removing a particular row or uh, adding a particular column and such kind of things and also finally we have seen how we can find the correlation between the data frame okay so i hope you have understood all the things we have covered in this video hello everyone i am siddharthan welcome to my youtube channel in this video i would like to give you a detailed tutorial on matplotlib library in python okay so as you can see here i have mentioned here that matplotlib is very useful for making plots and graphs okay so often in machine learning and data science we will deal with immense amount of data and it is not possible to derive meaning from this data by just looking at this raw data but when we plot this data in plots and graphs it gives us important insights from the data okay so this is where matplotlib library comes into picture so in this video i will explain you detaily about various functions and plots that we can make in matplotlib library okay so before getting into the video i'll just give you a quick introduction about my channel so this is my youtube channel and here i'm making a hands on machine learning course with python so you can see the introduction video here so here i have mentioned the course curriculum so you can see about the videos which i'm going to post in the future so i will be posting three videos per week two videos will be on uh, monday evening and wednesday evening and these videos will be in the course order and friday i will be posting one machine learning project every week okay so you can download the course curriculum from here so it contains all the details and you can also join my telegram group where i will post regular updates about my videos okay so i'll give the link for my telegram group in this video so you can go to this playlist here 
So currently we are in the third module. So this is my uh, machine learning course. So in the first module, I have explained about all the machine learning basics like supervised learning, unsupervised learning, deep learning, etc. So in the second module, I have uh, made videos on Python basics. Okay, so you will. Uh, uh, find videos on all the basic things you need to know in Python programming. Okay, so this is the module now we are currently working on. So in this module, I have already posted two videos. So these two videos are NumPy tutorial and Pandas uh, tutorial. Okay, so and then we have machine learning project videos. So I will be posting project videos every Friday as I have told you before. And now we are currently in this third module. So subscribe to my channel and stay connected and follow this course. Okay, so now get into this today's uh, video. So this environment is called as Google Collaboratory. So if you are new to Google Collaboratory and if you haven't know, like you, if you don't know how to use it, you can check out my uh, Google Collaboratory basics video. So it will be in this second module. So as you can see here, in this 2.1, I have explained how you can access Google Collaboratory and how you can use it. Okay. So it basically runs Python programs. Okay. So now let's get into Matplotlib. Okay. So first of all, let's see how we can import Matplotlib library. So if you put hash in uh, in your code, it means uh, it means like uh, you are writing some comment about your code. Okay, so it's always uh, important and you know essential to write comments about your code of what you are trying to do. So it helps a third person to see your code and understand what you are trying to do. Okay, so now we are going to import. So importing matplotlib library. Okay, so import matplotlib dot pyplot okay so pyplot as plt so pyplot is nothing but python plot so i am just uh, you know instead of using this matplotlib dot pyplot i just want to use it in a short form so that's why i have imported it, it as plt so it is the general convention in python so we import uh, matplotlib dot pyplot as plt okay so now you can run this so you can run this particular cell by uh, pressing shift plus enter so it will run this code and it will automatically goes to the next cell okay so as i've told you earlier matplotlib is useful for making plots but we need data for plotting right so when we are working on machine learning projects we will have the data set which we will use to uh, plot uh, graphs so now let's take some random values so for that we need numpy library so i have already made a tutorial on numpy library so you can also check that one if you are uh, new to numpy so import numpy to get data for our plots okay so import numpy as np so the general convention of importing numpy is np okay so let's import numpy as np now we are going to get some data okay so let's say that x is equal to so let's get some values for x and let's also get some values for y so let's say that x is equal to np dot lin space okay so this particular lin space like uh, lin space function is present in this numpy library so as you can see here i have imported it as np so i am using this lin space function in numpy library and in this i am going to mention 0 comma 10 comma 100 okay so what happens is it uh, gets equally spaced values between 0 and 10 okay and how many values it takes it takes 100 values so we will get evenly spaced 100 values that lie between 0 and 10 okay so that's why i'm using this uh, lin space function and so we will have 100 values in x okay so now i'll create y and now what is this y is so y is the sign okay so sign means like we have uh, we have read about this in trigonometry right so np dot sign x so this will uh, find so this will take x as the angle and it will find the sign value for all those angles okay so np dot sign is the function that gives us sign value of this particular angle okay so let's also take z so z uh, let's take that it is cosine value of uh, x okay so x is the values between 0 and 10 so evenly spaced 100 values and y is the sign value of those 100 values and z is the cost value of all those 100 values okay so let's run this so press shift plus enter now let's print x y and z so i'll show you how these values are so we will get evenly spaced floating point values so totally we will have 100 uh, values here so this is the values of x okay so now let's try to print y print y so this will give the sign value of all these values okay so these are the sign values okay so you can also print z similarly so z is nothing but the cosine values as you can see here it is np dot cos it is cosine value okay so now let's try to 
plot this okay so i'll make a text here so plotting the data so as you would have guessed by now that if we plot x and y we will get a sine curve and if we plot x and z we will get a, a cos wave okay so here we will get a sine wave and here we will get a cos wave so let's do that so we are going to build a sine wave so what you need to do is so as we have seen that we have imported this matplotlib.pyplot as plt and this is what this plt is what we are going to use to make plots so i'll mention it here plt dot figure okay so this will create a empty plot a empty figure okay so and in that figure i want to plot two values x and y okay so x are values between 0 and 100 and y is the sign value of all those values okay so this will plot the graph of x and y and you need to mention this function plt.show so this will print our plot so i'll run this okay so there is some error in this so plt.figure x comma y okay okay so we should not use figure so it's plt.plot okay so plt.plot x y plt.show so as you can see here we have got a sine wave because x is all these values uh, between 0 and 10 and uh, this y is nothing but sine value of all these values so if we don't mention what kind of plot we want so it will give us a line plot so this is a line right so all the uh, points will be plotted and it will be joined by a line so we will get a sine wave because we are, y is nothing but the sine value of x now let's similarly build a cosine wave so sorry cosine wave it's the same function which is plt dot plot the only difference is that now we are going to plot x and z because z is uh, the cosine value of x so again mention plt dot show okay as you can see here now we got a cosine wave okay so this is how you can uh, get some values for x and uh, y or z and you can plot those values using matplotlib library okay so now uh, if you see this uh, graph it is not complete right so this graph does not have any title it doesn't uh, tells us that uh, what is this x axis and it does not tell what is this y axis now we can also add x label y label and title to our graph or uh, to our plot okay so let me explain you how you can do that so adding title x-axis and y-axis labels okay so let's again plot the sine wave which is x and y so plt dot plot so mention x comma y and plt dot x label so this x label function will help us to uh, give a x label value so i want the x label to be angle because x is nothing but the value of angles right so we are finding the sine value of all these angles so x label let it be angle and plt dot y label is the function to name our y axis so y label let it be um, sine value and let's name our plot as sine wave okay so plt dot title so this title function helps us to give a title to our graph so this title is sine wave okay so now it's the same plt dot show so let's run this as you can see here we have plotted this sine wave but in this case we have x label which tells us it is angle and y axis is nothing but sine value and the title of this uh, plot is sine wave so you can similarly change uh, the title x label and y label anything you want okay so this is how you can give names for the uh, x axis y axis and title for the plot okay so now we have successfully plotted sine wave and uh, cosine wave now let me tell you how you can um, you know plot a parabola okay so parabola let's take x as np dot lin space so lin space is the function which gives us numbers between particular range okay so i want in this case the numbers between minus 10 and plus 10 and i want 20 values okay so this will give us 20 equally spaced values between minus 10 and plus 10 okay and let's say that y is equal to x 
into 2. So this means x power 2 or x square. Okay. So this will give us a parabola curve. Okay. So let's plot this. Plot. Sorry. PLT dot plot and x comma y plt dot show okay so I'm, i'll run this as you can see here this gives us a parabola so this is how you can construct a parabola and this is the equation for it so similarly uh, you can give uh, x label and y label and title to this graph when you are practicing it okay so now let me tell you how you can so this is a line plot right so as i have told you earlier if you don't mention what kind of uh, uh, line you want it will just take the default value as line okay so now i'll tell you how you can plot this with dots and other symbols okay so now let's plot this same parabola so let this x and y values be the same values so you can also print the x and y values and see so now i'm going to plot it with a different symbol so plt dot plot and i want to plot x and y and i want to plot this in red color and i want to use the plus symbol okay so plt dot show so as you can see here it will plot the parabola but in this case it will uh, plot with a plus symbol as i have mentioned here so r represents red color okay so it uh, plots with red colored plus symbol so you can also use other symbols as well so for example plt dot plot x comma y and in the quotes let me put g and dot so it means it will uh, plot with dot symbol okay and the dots will be green in color so plt dot show so as you can see here now the values are plotted in green dots so this is how you can plot uh, graphs with the different symbols and colors there is also another thing so let's uh, do another thing as well so plt dot plot x comma y comma mm, let's see r and x so this will plot the values with the x mark so plt dot show this is nothing but r x so that means x symbol and r which means red color so there are similarly various symbols and colors so you can uh, refer matplotlib uh, documentation just you can just search matplotlib documentation in google so it will uh, take you their official site where you will uh, see the explanation for all their functions and other things as well so there you can see what are the different colors and different symbols you can uh, use for these uh, particular plots okay so now i'll tell you how you can plot multiple uh, graphs or multiple lines in a single graph so let me take x as np dot in space now let's take the values from minus 5 to plus 5 and in this case i want 50 values okay so i want values from 5 minus 5 to plus 5 and 50 equally spaced values and i'm going to plot so in the before cases so previously we have seen so we will get a value for x and we will get a value for y right so you can just do it in a simple way by this so you can see here plt dot plot let's say in the first graph i want x value and sine value of x so i can mention it here instead of just putting y and giving the np dot sign so i can just give it here so np dot sign x this will plot x and sine of x okay and i want the graph to be g and let's put iphone here so it means it will uh, this represents green color line okay a normal line okay so this is what we will get so this is a sine wave and in that graph i want to plot another thing as well so plt dot plot I want to plot x and np dot cos okay cos and in this case i want a red color dotted line so by mentioning two iphone here so it will give us a dotted line graph so plt dot show so now let's see what we are getting as you can see here we have two graphs in this uh, particular plot so we have uh, made a straight uh, solid line using this green color and we have dotted line using r uh, using this uh, np dot cos function okay so this is how you can plot multiple uh, lines in a particular or in a single plot okay so now let me explain you another type of plot so this is bar plot okay so bar plot is also very important in data science and machine learning so it it will give us uh, several insights so you can also 
watch my project videos where I have you know implemented these uh, bar graphs in different projects so now we are going to see about bar plot so let's create a variable as figure so figure is equal to plt dot figure so this will create a empty plot and in that empty plot we will do several things so mention ax so ax represents axis so figure so mention this uh, variable we have used which is figure so in this figure we are sh storing this uh, plot okay so figure dot add axis add axis 0 comma 0 1 comma 1 so what is this is this will enclose our uh, plot in a rectangle so this first two zeros represents the coordinate so 0 and 0 means so it's the origin and 1 and 1 represents the height and width of the rectangle so it is generally you know it's usually to mention uh, the area in which we want to have our plot okay so in this case we have uh, used this plot function so we don't need to mention those axes but here we are just creating an empty figure and adding access to it so that's why we are adding this access function here so as i have told you earlier 0 and 0 is origin and 1 and 1 comma 1 represents the width and height of this plot which we want okay so i'll create another variable called as languages okay so languages is equal to let's take five languages so let's say english and let the second language be french and let's take spanish and latin and finally german so we took five languages okay so let's say that we have a group of people and in that group uh, people speak five languages okay so let's say that there are uh, about 100 people and now uh, in that 100 people uh, you know some number of people speak english french and a few people speak spanish latin and german okay so let's give some random uh, numbers for these languages uh, people speaking languages so people so i'll create another uh, variable as list so this is basically a list so list will be enclosed in square bracket so let's create another list so let's say that there are totally 100 people who are speaking english and let's say that 50 people are speaking french and 150 people speaking spanish 40 people speaking latin and just some random numbers let's say 70 people are speaking german so as you can see here i have enclosed these values in uh, quotes because you need to mention sorry you need to enclose the strings or the text in quotes but you don't need to uh, you know enclose the numbers or integers in the uh, quotes okay so we have created two lists one is languages and the another one is people so we have 100 people uh, speaking english 50 people speaking french and other things as well okay so now let's plot this in a bar graph and see what we can do so ax dot bar I want to plot languages and people okay so I'll give x label as let's say x label is languages so let me put all in caps languages and I want y label to be number of people right so it's number of people okay so now we can print this graph using plt dot show okay so i'll run this so this will put all these values in bar graph so this tells us uh, you know which language is spoken more and which language is the second and third those kind of things okay so when you have uh, you know 100 or more data points it is very useful to plot all those values in these kind of bar plots okay so it uh, tells us how many uh, categories are there and how many people are there in uh, such categories okay so it helps us to you know visualize uh, the magnitude of that particular value okay so for spanish it is huge of course so those kind of things so in several uh, cases in data science and machine learning we use these uh, bar graphs to understand about the data okay so this is known as uh, data visualization so in data visualization we use several plots and analysis and this is one of the important plots which we will use okay so now let's discuss about another important uh, plot which is a pie chart okay so pie chart is very useful to find the distribution of the data in the in a entire data set okay so now we are going to build a pie chart 
and let's create a figure as figure one. So figure one is equal to plt dot figure. So it is the same procedure. So plt dot figure, and I'll create access as so it's figure one dot add access. So it's the same access which is 0 comma 0 and 1 comma 1 so it is the general uh, value used you can also change and see it so i'll just copy these values so okay so i'll paste this here so now let's see how we can plot a pie chart okay so you can use the function so in ax or ax we have you know use this add access so on that we are going to build a pie chart okay so ax dot pie so this will create a pie chart and mention what you want here so people so i want to um, you know build a pie chart containing the number of people okay so people and i want the labels to be languages so labels is equal to languages and there is another parameter here so auto pct so this is to tell the plot that how many uh, you know floating or decimal points we need so let's say that we need 1.71 which it gives us uh, one floating point or one uh, decimal value of after the decimal okay so this is the syntax for it okay so 1.1 plt dot show okay so let's run this okay so we have did something wrong here so ax dot people labels is equal to languages autopilot so what is missing here figure one plt add access x dot by people labels languages okay so it's nothing it's just we need to include a f here so the floating point values so let's run this now so now we will get a pie chart containing various values so we have all the language names as labels so we have french english german latin spanish etc and it tells us the percentage of uh, people in all those languages so we can see here the spanish is uh, is the language which is spoken more so spanish has about 36 percentage of data okay so this is how you can build a pie chart using matplotlib okay so one second okay so now let's build a scatter plot so i'll make a text here as scatter plot so let's take the x value as np dot in space so let's take values from 0 to 10 and let's take 30 values and let y be the sign value of x so np dot sign and x and z is equal to np dot cos x okay now let's build a scatter plot let's declare it as figure 2 figure 2 is equal to the same it's the same procedure plt dot figure okay now we need to mention the axis so ax is equal to figure 2 dot add axis and let it be 0 comma 0 1 comma 1 okay so i just need to put a parenthesis here okay so it's the same procedure until now now we need to mention scatter plot okay so ax dot scatter so scatter is the function which helps us to build a scatter plot so in that mention x and y okay so let the color be green okay so this will uh, plot a scatter this will plot a scatter plot in green color okay so we are taking the two values x and y so let's also plot another uh, plot with x and z okay so ax dot scatter and i want x and z let's put color is equal to b plt dot show so z will be plotted in blue color and y will be plotted in green color okay so let's run this 
So as you can see here, in a single graph, it has uh, plotted a scatter plot. So this is a scatter plot where the data points will be scattered. So there won't be any line joining these points. So this is a scatter plot and it is very useful in clustering applications. Okay. So this is how you can build a scatter plot. So in this plot, I have uh, plotted two uh, plots. So all the values of uh, Y are plotted in green color and all the values of Z are plotted in blue color. Okay. So this is how you can build a scatter plot. Now, finally, let's see how we can build a 3D plot. Okay, so we are going to build 3D scatter plot. So let's create the figure as figure 3, which is equal to plt dot figure. Okay, axis is equal to plt dot axis, and in that we need to so before we have mentioned the axis as a rectangle right so rectangle is a 2d form and now we want 3d form right so in plt dot axis we need to mention the projection is equal to 3d so this will create a 3d plot let's take some values so z is equal to so 20 so I want a spiral shaped uh, scattered plot. So I'll just use these values. So these values help us to plot a spiral uh, scattered plot. Okay. So 20 into np dot random. So I'm just taking some random values. So random dot random. So this function in a numpy helps to, you know, gives us random hundred random values. So you need to mention the number of values you want. So I want 100 values. Hence I'm uh, mentioning 100. Okay. So this will give us 100 random values in Z. Okay. So and let's take X as NP dot sign of Z and Y is cost value of Z. Okay. Now we need to mention the plot we want so we want a scatter plot so x y z and we also need to mention another parameter okay so let's put so you can see the description of the parameters here okay so this is the thing which we are going to use now so array or list like list of colors okay so x y z so x are nothing but the x value y value so as this is a 3d plot we are using uh, you know three axes so x y and z then c i'll mention z and c map so i want the color map to be blue so it will gives us a plot in blue shade okay so you need to mention blues and let's put plt dot show okay so let's run this so this will give us a 3d scatter plot as you can see yes see here that we got a spiral kind of a scatter plot here in a 3d uh, projection so this is how you can create 3d plots so similarly you can uh, create line plots in 3d and other types of graphs as well uh, graphs as well so that is, that's all for this video i hope you have understood the things we have covered so i'll just give you a quick recap of what we have seen here so we have seen that we can uh, import the matplotlib library as plt which is the general convention and the matplotlib library is used for making plots and graphs and we imported this numpy library for uh, creating some uh, data for our plots so while we are working in data science and machine learning projects we will plot the data in our data set okay so then using this linspace function we got some hundred values between 0 and 10 so and we have found the sign value and cost value of them and then we have plotted this sine wave and uh, cosine wave using plt dot plot okay and then we have seen how we can give x label y label and title for our plots and then we have seen how we can build a parabola curve and then we have seen how we can plot some uh, graphs with different symbols at different colors and uh, we have also seen we, how we can, you know, plot multiple graphs in a single, uh, you know, place. And we, we have also seen about bar plots. And then we have discussed how we can build a pie chart and then uh, a scatter plot with multiple graphs. And then we have finally discussed about the important 3D scatter plot. Okay. So these are some important uh, plots that we, we have in Python. Okay. So in the next video, let's discuss about Seaborn. So Seaborn is also another uh, library for making plots and Hello everyone, this is Siddhartha. Welcome to my YouTube channel. In this video, I would like to give you a detailed hands-on tutorial on Seaborn library in Python. Okay, so in the previous video, 
we have discussed about matplotlib library in python and seaborn is another library which is very useful for data visualization purposes so in machine learning we often deal with thousands or even lakhs of data and it is impossible to derive meaning or insights by just looking at the raw data set but when we plot those data in a suitable graph or plot it helps us to give some meanings that we want okay so this is where data visualization comes into play and this is where seaborn is going to help us okay so this is the topic which we are going to see today and before getting started with today's video i would like to give you a quick introduction to my youtube channel so in my youtube channel i'm making hands on machine learning course with python so if you go to my channel you can see this uh, machine learning course curriculum so in this i have explained all the modules and the videos which i will be posting in the future in my channel so you can also uh, download the course curriculum file from here so you can also check this playlist so we have already completed two modules in our machine learning course the first module is on machine learning basics okay so the second module is on python basics and currently we are discussing the third module which is important python libraries for machine learning so in this module we have already discussed the numpy uh, basics pandas basics and matplotlib basics and this video is on seaborn okay so you can also check uh, the machine learning project videos okay so i'll upload one machine learning project video every friday evening okay so you can uh, stay subscribed and watch those videos if you want okay so the remaining modules will be uploaded every week so with that being said we can uh, start today's video so this environment is called as google collaboratory so in google collaboratory you can run python program so if you are new to google collaboratory you can watch my google collaboratory basics video so it will be in this uh, python basics for machine learning so when you go to this uh, second module so it is the first video so in this video i have explained how you can access google collaboratory and how you can uh, you know use the different features that are available in google collaboratory okay so if you are new to google collaboratory just check that video okay so with that being said let's get started with today's video so the first step is to import the libraries okay so i'll make a text here as importing the libraries okay so first let's import seaborn library so seaborn import seaborn so i want to import this seaborn in a short form so let's import as sns so this sns is the general convention that we use for importing seaborn library as we use np for numpy okay so now let's also import matplotlib library so import matplotlib library uh, as plt okay so sometimes we make this matplotlib plot and on top of that we make some seaborns plot okay so that's why we need this matplotlib library as well i'll also import numpy and pandas so we may need it in our code so import numpy as np and import pandas as pd okay so let's run this so you can press shift plus enter to run this cell and go to the next one okay so we have successfully imported our library so the main focus will be on this seaborn now uh, what we are going to do is import some data sets so seaborn library has some toy data sets some example data sets that we can use to understand the different plots that are available in seaborn now i'm going to show you how you can access this uh, toy data sets so i'll just make a note here that seaborn has some built-in data sets okay so these are some basic machine learning data sets okay so the first data set is a tip data set so total bill versus tip data set so this is this uh, data sets gives uh, the total tip given by the person in a hotel and the, the uh, total bill they have uh, given and uh, whether they have eaten lunch or uh, dinner so, so such kind of thing so it's basically tells uh, how much tip a person will give based on their total bill and other features okay so let's just understand this data set i'll declare a variable as tips tips is equal to so mention the seaborn library sms dot load data set so this load data set helps us to get this data set we want and in the bracket mention the data set we want so i in this i want this tips data set okay so if you want to uh, know some description or detailed uh, things about the functions you are using you can just search for uh, seaborn documentation so it will uh, take you to the 
official uh, seaborn documentation where you can learn about what these particular functions does okay so in google just search for seaborn documentation so now we have uh, we are going to import this tips dataset to this tips variable so i'll run this okay so uh, this will uh, be imported in the form of a pandas data frame so in the panda pandas data frame we can print the first five rows of the data frame by using the function it okay so tips dot it so this will give us the first five rows of the data set so as you can see here we have totally uh, seven columns so total bill tip uh, six the gender of the person smoker whether the person is a smoker or a non-smoker what is the day and time whether it is a dinner or lunch and the size of uh, the family okay whether a two person are coming or three person are coming so this gives the total bill and this is the tip they are paying okay so it, this is in dollars so what we are so the purpose of this data set is to analyze the various things such as the total bill uh, paid by the person and whether uh, the person is a male or a female and whether they are a smoker or not and uh, whether they ate dinner or a lunch and what is the size so those kind of things so and using that we are going to predict what is the tip that they are going to uh, give okay so there are some logical things that if a person uh, you know eats for a large amount of bill they are going to pay uh, more tips of course right so those are some basic logical things so we can visualize those things by plotting the data it, and it is not easy to uh, you know infer those things by just looking at these data sets so now what we will do is we will try to plot this data okay so we are going to visualize the data this tips data set so we need to use the function sns.replot so this will give us two plots so I will show you what are the plots are now in the first parameter which is data we need to mention the data which we are going to plot so we are going to plot this tips data right so I have imported this data set in the variable called as tips now we need to mention this uh, data here okay so this is the parameter so mention it here tips okay okay next we need to mention the x-axis we want okay so I want the x-axis to be the total bill paid so let x-axis be total bill so enclose it in uh, quotes so here uh, we need to mention the column name which we want in our x-axis so it is total bill so total underscore bill and in the y-axis i want this uh, tip uh, column so mention it here y is equal to tip and i want the column to be time so basically what happens is it gives uh, two plots for us so the first plot will be on uh, for all the data for which the person had dinner and the other plot will be for all the person who have lunch okay so that is this call uh, parameter and i want this u to be smoke okay and now we want the style the style will be smoker so these are the parameters for our plot or you know the plot will be differentiated based on these uh, values so there is a mistake in the quotes here okay so style is smoker and size okay so size is equal to so basically i have mentioned the important columns which i need for my plot so in the x-axis i want the total bill so that's what i have men mentioned here and in the y-axis i want this tip and in the column i want the time whether it is dinner or lunch and in the style i want whether the person is a smoker or not so the data will be differentiated based on whether the person is a smoker or not so u is also the similar kind of thing and this is the size okay so let's see what plot we are getting okay so let's run this okay so there is some mistake here so sorry so it, it should be the plot so it's uh means a relative plot kind of thing okay so you can see here now we get plots in which the if the person is a smoker the plot will be in uh you know blue color dots and if the person is not a smoker those data points will be plotted in orange x marks okay and this represents the size so if uh you know only one person is coming for the lunch or dinner then the size of the dot will be small and uh if there are you know five or six number of people who are uh, you know in a family then those plots will be made on a larger uh, blue dot marks okay so that is what this is and this is the advantage of seaborns 
over a matplotlib so in matplotlib you need to mention that you know i want this uh, smokers to be uh, you know differentiated in blue color dot marks and i want the other persons to be uh, you know marked in x mark or i want the different sizes for different sizes okay so you need to mention that manually when you are using matplotlib library but when you are using c bonds you don't need to do that so c bonds automatically finds those differences and it will plot it based on that okay so you can do another, another thing as well so you can set a default theme for your plots so setting a theme for the plots so for that we need to use this sns dot set theme okay sns dot set theme so just watch the plot here so when i uh, run this plot after running this sns dot set theme the uh, theme will be changed so it will be more spacious and we will also get some grids so as you can see here now it is you know more spaced and it's it's more convenient to see and we have also grids so this is the default theme which we have set using this uh, sns dot set theme function okay so you don't need to uh, run this every time so once you run this in your code you don't need to run it again so every plot which you are making in cbond will be based on this theme okay so with that being said now let's uh, take another example uh, data set and let's try to uh, see what are the different plots we have in cbond so in this i'm going to load the iris data set so the iris data set is also another important data set in machine learning when you are starting to learn so these are uh, some basic data sets so i'll create uh, another variable as iris iris is equal to sns dot load data set the same uh, function which we have used for the tips data set so sns dot load data set and in the quotes you need to mention iris okay so uh, let me run this and let's see the first five columns of this iris data data frame so iris dot get okay so i'll run this okay so now you can see the first five rows here so we have sepal length sepal width petal length and petal width okay so these are the parameters of the iris flower and we have this species here so there are totally three species in iris they are iris setosa iris virginica and iris versicolor okay so the idea here is to predict whether the you know to what species the particular iris flower belongs based on their sepal length sepal width petal length and petal width okay so this is the you know problem statement for this particular data set now let's try to plot this data set okay so now we are going to you know, cluster it so we can uh, best understand this data using a scatter plot so i mentioned as text here of scatter plot so let's see so you can make a scatter plot in sns by using this sns dot scatter plot function so sns dot scatter plot and in x i want let's uh, you know in x axis let's take this uh, sepal length sepal length and in y axis let's take petal width so petal width or let's take petal length okay so x axis let it be sepal length and y axis uh, let it be petal length okay so petal length and u so u will be species so this uh, plot will be differentiated based on this different species okay so you know set also will be in one color and the second species will be in one color and the third species will be in another color so that is what this u is and now you, you need to mention the data which you want to plot so here the data is this iris data so mention it here iris so now let's run this now you can see the plot here so all the uh, iris setos have been plotted in blue color and iris versi color have been plotted in orange color and virginica have been plotted in green color so you can see the definite distinction in this data only these points have some common uh, you know species so this is how you can uh, differentiate and plot the iris flower based on their petal length and sepal length okay so you can you know this helps us to you know differentiate the uh, data points or differentiate the flowers based on their uh, you know features now you can also make another scatter uh, scatter plot but with the different parameters so before we have used this sepal length and petal length right now let's use sepal length and petal width 
let's see whether we get a better plot or not okay now i would say this this plot is kind of better than this okay because uh, there is more uh, you know common points here so this is how you can plot based on different features using a scatter plot so this is the you know importance of scatter plot where you can cluster the data points based on their parameters okay so as we have seen our scatter plot now let's see you know, some other different types of plots and for this plot i'm going to use another interesting data set so this is titanic data set so loading the titanic data set so let me explain you what is meant by this data set after uh, importing it so let me de declare a variable as titanic which is equal to sns dot load data set and in the bracket let me mention titanic and titanic dot it okay so you can see here this is basically the whether the a person is a survived in the titanic crash or not so zero represents they haven't survived and one represents they have survived okay so this represents the class of their tickets whether they are in first class second class or third class and their gender age and such kind of things okay so the idea behind this data set is to predict whether a person has survived this titanic based on these features whether they are a male or a female what is the their ticket class and what is their age say for example uh, the when in such kind of crisis uh, or a crash and uh, those kind of things when a ship is sinking the importance will be given to you know women and uh, children right so you know that things will be taken into account and we will try to you know implement our machine learning system and uh, try to predict whether a person has survived or not based on these features so that is the problem statement of this data set and now we are going to make some plots in this data set and uh, analyze it so first let's make a count plot in this uh, titanic data set okay count plot so this is this helps us to you know give the number of uh, people or number of data points we have in each uh, parameters so you can use a count plot by this function so sns dot count plot and in x axis let me put class okay so here you can see the class third class first class or second class and i want to use the data titanic data set okay so now let's run this okay so no attribute get so what's the thing i have done here sns dot count plot x is equal to class and data is equal to okay so it shouldn't be in this quotes because it's a variable you can see here so it should be in quotes only the strings should be in quotes okay now you can see here the number of people uh, we have in third class is more and the number of people in uh, first class and second class are less so this helps us to give the number of counts or number of people we have okay so we can also check the number of data points we have using the function titanic dot shape So it gives the number of rows and columns so totally we have 891 rows that means 891 people and in that 891 people almost 500 people are in third class and you know uh, 200 people are in first class and you know almost 180 people are in second class so that is the inference we are getting and we can also another important count plots here and let's see uh, how many people have survived sns dot count plot and x is equal to survived and data is equal to titanic okay so you can see the survived uh, column here so zero represents uh, the person has not survived and one represents that the person has survived so you can see here so the number of people didn't survive is more and the number of people survived the titanic sink is kind of less okay so out of the 891 you know values almost uh, you know 590 or 600 people uh, haven't survived the sink and almost uh, you know 300 people have survived the crash so this helps us to you know visualize the data but this is not possible to just see the data set and you know find how much percentage of people have survived it okay so this is where data visualization is very important so now let's see another important type of plot which is bar bar uh, chart so so i'll make a text as bar chart 
so for making a bar chart you need to use the function sns dot bar plot okay and here let me mention x as let's put x based on this six okay so let's plot it based on the gender so first let it be six and in y let's put survived and let's uh, classify it based on their class whether it's first class or second class or third class so u is equal to um, class and finally mention the data which is titanic okay so now let's run this so now you can see here we have a bar chart with a person as survived or not okay so this tells us the proportionality of a person is survived or not so what is the inference we are getting it is that means like the number of female survived the sink is more when compared to the number of males so it clearly tells us the importance for survival have been given to female like for example so when that uh, sink happened so you know a uh, lot of uh, female have been you know chosen to survive the crash instead of males okay so that is what the inference we are getting and this uh, uh, you know red color thing represents the second class so you can see the u here which represents the class so blue color represents the first class and the orange represents the second class and green represents the third class so this is how uh, you know you can uh, plot different parameters in one parameters say for example in male we have this three parameters right so in male we have uh, you know the number of uh, first class people number of second class and third class people and we also have the same for uh, female so this is how you can plot for one parameter so here the one parameter is survived and the second parameter is six and in that we have uh, you know used another parameter which is class okay so this is how you can plot for multiple parameters and this is where bar chart is really useful okay so now i'm going to take another interesting data set for uh, two important plots that we are going to see so this is house price data set so house price data set so this data set is not available in uh, Seaborn. So I'm going to import it from SKLearn library. So SKLearn is another uh, machine learning library. So we have already made a project on this house price prediction. So you can uh, check that video in my machine learning project playlist. So now I'm going to import this library. So on the, in that library, I'm going to import this house price data. Okay, so this basically is the Boston house price data. So from SKLearn dot data sets import boston okay put load boston so this is the uh, house prices of boston state in us so i'll create a variable as house boston so house boston is equal to load boston so this will load this boston data set into this house boston variable and it won't be in a pandas data frame so we want the data to be in a pandas data frame now i'm going to store it in a pandas data frame so house is equal to pd dot data frame so we have already imported the pandas data frame as pd so you can see in the first uh, cell here so we have imported pandas as pd so that is what we are using here so house is equal to pd dot data frame and inside that we need to mention this house boston so house boston dot data and i want the columns is equal to feature names so house data set dot feature names so I'll explain you in a minute what are these parameters are. So let me complete it first. So feature names, I'll create the price column. Price is equal to house data set dot target. Okay, so let's run this. House data set is not defined. Hmm. So house Boston dot data house data set is not different where I have mentioned this house data set. Mm. Okay, so instead of this house data set, I need to put house Boston because I have mentioned that it has house Boston, right? So house Boston dot target. 
oh again so pd dot data frame out columns okay okay so here the problem is okay so now let's print the first five rows of this house data frame so i have uh, you know imported this data frame in this variable called as house so house dot yet so this will give us the first five rows of the data set now you can see here we have different parameters such as the crime rate in that particular Boston uh, state or that particular place. We have the zone, index column and such kind of thing. So this RM column represents the number of rooms and the age of the average number of the people residing there and such kind of things. And finally we have this price column. Okay. So the problem statement of this data set is that we need to predict the price of a house depending on several other parameters such as crime rate, number of uh, rooms their zone etc okay so that is what this data set is so what i have done here is so this uh, you know uh, this load boston data set will be in a numpy array format okay so i want to load this numpy array format in a data frame so that's why i've used this data frame function to convert this numpy uh, array into a data frame okay so in that numpy array all these data all these numerical values will be in this uh, particular dictionary called as data and you know in this feature name contains all the column names so what i have did is so i have imported all the data first and i have uh, included the column names second using this feature names okay so and then i have uh, you know imported this price so you know in the so let me just make a code here and show you how the data set is so you can just mention this house boston so it will be more easier for you to understand. So house Boston print. So this is an SK learn, uh, sorry, this is a NumPy format. So you can see here, so here is an array called as data. Okay, so this particular data array contains all the values. So that is what I have did here to import all this data and you can see the feature names here. So it consists of this uh, feature names and this feature name contains all the column values okay so that i have imported using this uh, columns parameter and this data doesn't contains the price of the houses so you can see the data here but this uh, price of the houses will be in a separate array called as target so that's what i have did here so i have created a column called as price and i have imported all the price values in that particular column so that is what i have done here and now we have seen the first five rows of this data set so we have different parameters and last we have this price column okay so now we are going to see two important plots in uh, c bonds uh, using this data set so we are going to see a distribution plot and a correlation matrix okay so first let's see a distribution plot so distribution plot. so this distribution plot will you know give us a plot of you know what is the range of the values so in what values does most of the data points like say for example uh, let's create a distribution plot as sns dot dist plot okay so this plot so in that let me mention the data frame which is house house and I want to find the distribution of the price. Okay. Okay. So let's run this. So you can see here that the more values are in the range of, uh, you know, twenty dollars. So this is what we are getting, and the values. So twenty means it's twenty thousand dollars. So there are less values in this particular range, and there are less values in this particular range, and we have the more values in this particular range. So this helps us to give us the distribution of the values. So this is one of the important plots we need because it tells us what is the distribution of the price. So what is the magnitude of the price, and what uh, range has the maximum values. So this particular, uh, you know, maybe it's fifteen to twenty-five. So this particular. Uh, value as the most number of data points so that is the important of this distribution plot and uh, so you can use this disk plot sorry so it will give us a probability curve so you can see the maximum values are in this you know 20 range okay so this is the importance of this distribution plot which gives us the range in which the data is distributed so now let's see another important plot. So this is very, very important. So this is a correlation matrix. Okay. Correlation. And 
there are two types of correlation they are positive correlation and negative correlation okay so positive correlation means so when we say the two variables let's say that uh, you know this is the rm room size and uh, this is the price we know that if there are more number of rooms in house the price will be definitely more so that means they are positively correlated because so these two are variables right uh, room numbers and uh, this price so if two variables are positively correlated then it means if one value increases the second value also increases okay so when we say uh, let's see when we can say that two values are negatively correlated so let's consider this crime rate value and price so if the crime rate is more the price will reduce right so this means so if one value increases then the other value decreases so this is where we say that it is negatively correlated okay so now let's see how we can uh, you know plot this uh, correlation value using a heat map so for this we are going to use a plot called as heat map okay so constructing the heat map i'm using this uh, matplotlib library okay so okay before we need to find the correlation using this so i'll create a variable as correlation which is equal to so mention the data frame which is house so house dot c o r r so this will give us the correlation value so let me run this now we can plot our heat map so if you remember we have imported the matplotlib library as plt so you can see here so now we are going to create a basic matplotlib figure and on top of that we will be creating a c bonds heat map so i'll explain you what is a heat map in a minute so plt figure now we need to mention the figure size so the figure size let it be 10 comma 10 so you can give any size you want so 10 comma 10 is convenient in this case so sns dot eat map is the function which helps us to give us give this so mention the correlation so we want to plot this correlation value okay so as i have told you earlier so what is meant by this correlation so eat map mention correlation and now we need to mention some parameters c bar is equal to true so first i'll just fill all these parameters and explain you what is meant by these parameters so square is equal to true and from t is equal to dot one f and annotations is equal to true and then not kws is equal to true okay so we need to mention the size so eight and c map is equal to blues okay so now let's run this okay so invalid syntax so annotate is equal to true okay so here should be comma okay so we got a correlation matrix and this is a heat map so let me explain you what is meant by this so we have all the columns in the left hand side so you can see the column name here so we have all the columns here vertically and we also have all the columns here horizontally okay so this basically plot all the values of one column against all the values in one column so if you take this first row it is the crime value against all the other columns okay so similarly it is carried out for all the uh, columns so you can see the color map here so this color bar here so if the color is light it means the value is in a negative value if the color is dark it means uh, you know 
it is uh, positively correlated okay so what we are going to say is so if you take this crime column as i told you earlier crime and price will be negatively correlated because if the crime rate increases the price will decrease so you can see the value as minus 0.4 so it is negatively correlated but if you take this rm which is the number of rooms so it is positively correlated because it's 0.7 okay so because if the number of rooms is more then the price value increases so this is called as positive correlation so the you know these values are calculated using this house dot core function and uh, this is how you need to construct uh, you know heat map to find which columns are positively correlated to this target which is price and which columns are negatively correlated okay so this correlation is what we are plotting it so that's why we have mentioned it here in this heat map and color bar so this is the color bar whether we want this color bar or not so this is the square i want all this to be in square and fmt represents the number of floating point so i have mentioned one floating point after decimal so it gives only one decimal point so if you put 2f it will give us two decimal points annotation so these are the annotations so annotations is equal to true this is the annotation size and i want the color map to be blue so this is how you can create a correlation matrix and correlation matrix is very important because it tells us which columns are uh, you know important for our prediction and which columns are not important so that's it for this video i hope you have understood all the different plots we have. hello everyone this is Siddharthan. Welcome to my YouTube channel. And in this channel, I'm making a hands on machine learning course with Python. So, we have already completed three modules, and this is the fourth module. And this module is on data collection and pre processing. Okay. So, in this video, I'm going to explain you about where you can get the data for your machine learning projects and how you can get this data. Okay. So, this is what we are going to cover in this video. So, I'll just give you the agenda of today's video. So, first of all, we will understand what is the importance of data in machine learning so why we need data for our machine learning projects and such kind of things so once we understand clearly what is uh, the role of data in machine learning so i will explain you where you can get this data okay so there are some important sites and you know uh, websites where you can get this data which you need so i will be explaining you and giving you information about those uh, websites and then i will be giving you a demonstration of how you can collect this data okay so this will be a hands on part okay so i will be downloading the, uh, downloading this data and showing you okay so this is what we are going to cover in today's video so before getting started i would like to give you a quick introduction to my youtube channel so as you can see here this is my channel and when you go to my channel you will see this uh, course curriculum video so in this video I'm, i have explained all the modules and videos which i am going to make in this channel so you can also uh, download the course curriculum file from here okay so you can head towards this playlist so here you can see the modules which we have completed so the first module was on machine learning basics okay so all the basic things you need to know about machine learning and the second module will be on the python basics for machine learning okay so all the python concepts are covered here and in the third module we have seen about some important machine learning libraries in python such as numpy pandas matplotlib cbounds etc okay so you can also find this machine learning project videos so we have about uh, eight projects videos as of now okay so we will uh, make more project videos in the future so i will be uploading three videos per week so two videos will be on uh, wednesday evening and uh, monday evening and one video will be on friday evening okay so three videos per week so with that being said let's get into today's video so first is to understand the importance of data in machine learning okay so let's consider this example so we have the images of cat and dog okay and we want a uh, you know a system to uh, see this image and recognize whether that image represents a dog or a cat okay so this is the problem statement we have so what we can do is we can feed images of dog and cat to our machine learning model okay so this can be any model so this can be a neural network or it can be a support vector machine model or anything okay so a machine learning model so what happens is so this model will find patterns in those images okay so let's say for example so if the eyes are small so it may represent a cat and if the size of the uh, cat is uh, you know if the size of the animal in the image is small it may represent cat right so all those kind of features will be recognized by our model so all those patterns will be recognized by our machine learning model and it will uh, help the uh, help our model to predict whether that image represents dog or cat so this is how we will use data in machine learning okay so in this we are not just talking about you know tens or 20 uh, number of images okay so we often deal with thousands or even lakhs of data so we we may deal with lakhs of data of dog and you know 
another lack of data for cat so that is the magnitude of data we may need okay so this is a very simple example of where you can use machine learning so there are also more advanced uh, applications like you know health care where you can uh, detect whether a person has cancer or not whether a person has diabetes or not by you know uh, going through the their medical records their scan images and such kind of things so this is where data is very helpful for machine learning so as we have understood the importance of data for machine learning so now let's see where we can collect this data okay so the most important website where you can collect the data is Kaggle. Okay, so Kaggle also hosts competitions for uh, data science and machine learning. So you can uh, participate in those competitions. So if you you know submit uh, your code, so that code will be evaluated for that competition, and they also have this uh, you know prize money. So and Kaggle is a very important site where you can collect this data. Okay, so second site where you can get data is UCA machine learning repository. Okay, so in UCA machine learning repository also you can collect the data you want so these two websites uh, have so many number of data sets which you can use okay so this is the logo of uca machine learning repository and there is another thing called as google data search data set search so this is very similar to uh, google search but it is exclusively for searching data sets okay so i will be giving you a demonstration of how to use these kind of data okay so in these uh, you know three sites you can find pre-made data okay so you can also make data set for yourself say for example uh, if you want to make a face recognition system which uh, you know detects your face so in that case you will take you know hundreds or uh, several hundreds of your images and train your uh, machine learning model so that's how you can create your own um, you know data for your machine learning project so in this video we will uh, be seeing some demonstration on how you can get data from Kaggle UCA machine learning repository and Google data set search okay so now let's get into it okay so do subscribe and uh, you know stay tuned for uh, more videos so you can search as google data set search in google so this is the site uh, data set search dot research dot google dot com so you can go to the site so i'm going to uh, get one of the basic data sets and one of the basic projects which we will deal in machine learning so it is boston house price data so it's just a demonstration so boston house price okay so i'll search this okay so as you can see here it will give us uh, you know the sites which contain this boston house price data so these are the sites which has this uh, data set okay so first we have this kaggle uh, site right so you can give this explore at kaggle to go to kaggle and from here you can download your data set okay so as you can see here this is one competition so you need to sign up for kaggle so once you sign up so you need to accept the competition rules so so once you accept that you you can see this data here so data task code etc so you can go to this data and you can find the explanation about this data so what are the various columns in the data set and how many uh, you know rows and columns are there in a data set so this gives the description of the data set which we are going to download okay so these are all the column names which we have in this data okay so totally we have 11 columns so and we have uh, you know a sample here okay so you can go ahead and download this data from here so you can see this download option from here or also you can download it uh, you know from here so i'll just choose this and download it from here so it is a csv file which represents comma separated value okay so there can be you know many types of uh, data sets okay so this data set will be downloaded so this is a very small data set okay so this is how you can uh, search data set from uh, google data set search and uh, you know we have seen how it uh, redirected us to this kaggle site okay so i'll just open this folder okay so i'll just put it in my desktop so i'll also show you how you can uh, you know upload this data set to our google collaboratory and do some processing okay so this is how you can get a data set from data set search and uh, kaggle okay so you can also search for kaggle okay so search for kaggle in google so this will take you to kaggle uh, site so there you can see their data set and competition which they are hosting okay so if you are uh, you know uh, have well no good knowledge on machine learning you can also participate in competition so you can go to this compete option here so this will give us various competitions in which you can participate okay 
so you can check out uh, the competitions and the data set it has okay so this is uh, about kaggle and next is UC uci machine learning repository okay so here i have searched uca machine learning repository iris data set okay so you can see this first site here so i'll go here so this iris classification is another important and basic machine learning project so basically it contains data set with three species of iris the three species of are uh, you know you can see the description here also so they are a setosa virginica and versicolor so there will be these three species so you can see the uh, species names here so you have the sepal length of each species sepal width petal length and petal width okay so based on these four parameters we need to predict whether uh, the iris flower belongs to which species okay so there are three species so to download this data you need to go to this data folder okay so just search the name of the data set you want and put you say machine learning repository in google so it will take you to the website so you need to go to this data folder so as you, you can see some files here this iris dot data is the data set which we want okay okay so this will be downloaded so i have already downloaded this uh, uh, you know data set okay so you can see see this here so we have this iris dot data so we need to change this extension to dot csv okay so i'll just rename this to csv so csv represents comma separate value so let's open this in a notepad to look how this data set is so as you can see here all the values are separated by comma and we have this uh, name of this uh, species okay so we have this setosa species and their parameters the sepal length and width and petal length and width we have the second species versicolor and the third species virginica okay so this is how you can download a data set from uca machine learning repository okay so we have uh, seen about how to search data sets in google data set search and how to download the data set from kaggle and we have also seen how to get data set from UCA machine learning repository now i'm going to show you how you can uh, you know upload this data set to our google collaboratory environment and how you can use it okay so this this environment is called as google collaboratory so if you are new to google collaboratory you can check out my video on uh, google collaboratory basics okay so that video will be on the python basics module which i have shown you before so from that you can watch that video um, and you can see this files options here so you need to give connect here so this will connect us to google backend server on which we can run our python programs okay so you can see the files options here so go to this files option and in this you can give this upload option so upload to a session storage or just you can press right click okay so and then you can give this upload option so i'll upload our house price data set so my house price data set is in desktop so housing.csv okay so this is a csv file as we know and i'm going to show you how you can import the csv file so i need pandas library for importing this uh, csv file so import pandas as pd so pandas has a function called as read csv and this function will help us to uh, you know read a csv file and store it in a pandas data frame okay so i'll make a comment here it's loading a data set to a pandas data frame okay so i'll just name the data set as data set so data set is equal to pd dot read csv and in that you need to put codes and in the codes you need to mention the path of this file okay so you can go to this option uh, here and there you can copy the path of the file so once you copy that just paste it here so now you can run this so you can press shift plus enter to run this cell okay so this will load our csv field to a, a data frame so you can use this dot eight function okay so data set dot eight function to print the first five rows of our data set okay so as you can see here we have uh, you know several rows in our data set so this is how you can load uh, our uh, data from a csv file to a data set so so that's it for this video i hope you have understood about uh, you know how to get data from uh, uh, 
Kaggle or use a machine learning repository and load it to our pandas data frame okay so you can also check out my machine learning projects videos in which i have explained you how you can uh, predict the price of houses based on several uh, parameters okay so do check out that video as well subscribe and stay tuned thank you so much hello everyone this is Darthan. in this video i am going to explain you how you can import data sets directly from kaggle to your google collaboratory and for this we will be using kaggle api and the full form for api is application programming interface so apis are nothing but software intermediaries that allows two software or two application to talk to each other to carry out some function so in this case the function is nothing but to share the data from kaggle to our google collaboratory okay so what is the use of this api why we need to use this api to get the data set so let's try to uh, uh, you know answer this question so in machine learning we may deal with a very huge data set so those data sets can be you know 5 gb or 10 gb or even hundreds of gb so we cannot download that data set and again upload it to our google collaboratory environment and in those cases apis are uh, really helpful because it helps us to uh, get this uh, you know these data sets quickly and use it in our collaboratory environment okay so that is what we are going to see in this video and before uh, you know going into the video i would like to give you a quick introduction about my youtube channel so in my channel i'm making a hands on machine learning course with python so you can see the course curriculum video here once you go to my channel and you can also download the course curriculum file from here so it's in the description of this video so in this video i have explained all the modules and uh, the videos which i'm going to cover in my channel so you can also head towards this playlist page it contains all the modules that I have covered. So the first module we have seen is the machine learning basics. And in the second module, we have seen all the Python basics required for machine learning. And in the third module, we have discussed about some important machine learning libraries such as uh, NumPy, Pandas, Matplotlib, Seabonds, etc. Okay, so currently we are in the fourth module, which is data collection and pre-processing. And uh, as you can see here, I have given the number as 4.2. Okay, so we also have about eight machine learning projects and we will work on more projects in the future. Okay, so this is about my channel. And with that being said, let's uh, continue with today's video. And this environment is called as Google Collaboratory. Okay, so Google Collaboratory helps us to run Python programs. So if you are new to this Google Collaboratory or if you are not aware of this Google Collaboratory, so you can go towards this module to this playlist in my channel. And in the first video, you can see this Google Collaboratory for Python. In this video, I have explained how you can access Google Collaboratory and uh, how you can access several features in Google Collaboratory. Okay, so now. The first step to import the data set is to install the Kaggle library. Okay, so just one second. Okay. So I'll just make a comment here installing the Kaggle library. So for this, we need to do pip install and just proceed the code with an exclamatory mark. So this is a system command, and all the system commands should be preceded with an exclamatory mark in Google Collaboratory. So let's put pip install. Kaggle okay so the K is in short you know in uh, small letter and it's not a caps so you need to make note of it so let's run this pip install Kaggle so you can press shift plus enter to run this cell and go to the next one so it says requirement already satisfied that means the collaboratory environment already have this Kaggle uh, library installed now we need to upload our Kaggle.json file okay so I'll just make a text here upload your kaggle.json file so this contains our account details this json file and it helps us to give the authorization from this google collaboratory tree to our kaggle account okay so and there is one uh, one another important thing to note here so the account the email id you are using for your google collaboratory should be the same in which you are uh, signed up with kaggle okay then only the json file will work and the api will work okay so you can just go to this google uh, google and search for kaggle.com so this is the first page which we will uh, encounter and i'm going to show you how you can import a big data set and for this i'm going to uh, search earthquake prediction so this is a very interesting uh, project in machine learning okay so earthquake prediction so search for earthquake prediction and go to this competition uh, options so you will get this lanl earthquake prediction 
and this is the data which we are going to get okay so when you first open this so it won't uh, tell that it is late submission so here will be an option called as join competition so before download uh, you know downloading the data you need to accept some uh, rules and conditions and then you need to join the competition then only you can get the data set okay so you should also sign up for kaggle so i hope you are clear with that and once you sign up you need to join this competition so once you join this competition it will ask for the submission button now what we need to do is we need to go to this account so you can just uh, click here so it will give various options and you need to go to this account option so here we will download our api token so if you scroll down you can see this api option so now we need to create a new api token so this will download a kaggle.json file and we need to upload this file to our google collaboratory okay so now so i'll also explain you about the data set which we are going to uh, import so uh, and the order in which i'm doing is very important so first you need to accept the competition rules you need to join the competition and then only you need to download the json file so if you do it the other way around it won't work so just do it in the same order i'm using so you can also download other data sets as well so our json file has downloaded so now we can upload it so for uploading it you need to go to this files option and you can give this upload options or you can just right click and go to upload okay so let's upload this kaggle.json file okay so this will be uploaded now we need to configure the path of this json file to read it so i'll just give the code you know this uh, link for this google collaboratory in the description of this video so you can open it from there just copy the code snippet and run so configuring the path of kaggle.json file okay so we need to precede it with exclamatory mark because these are system commands mkdir so this represents make directory okay mkdir means so make directory so forward slash dot kaggle so we are creating a folder called as kaggle and cp kaggle.json kaggle.json and forward slash kaggle ch mod 600 kaggle and kaggle.json so this is basically configuring the path so we need to locate our json file so it, this is the code snippet for it so we are just making a directory called as kaggle and we are locating this uh, kaggle.json file okay so we can run this now i'll just check it once so make directory p kaggle okay so kaggle.json okay so let's run this just press shift press enter okay so now we can import the data set so i'll just make a text here so we are going to import so importing the get quack data set so we are going to import it through our api so api to fetch the data set from kaggle okay so just change this now go to uh, this earthquake prediction page and go to this data okay so here you will find the api command so you can see the line here so this is the api command so this is use the api uh, kaggle api to download the data set so we need to copy this api so just go to this option so this will copy your api command so i'll copy this and we need to paste it here but we need to proceed it with exclamatory mark okay so now let's run this so this will get all the uh, data set from it so you can see the speed in which it's downloading the content it's almost 100 mb per second so and you don't need to worry and your mobile data or your wi-fi data won't be charged for this so it's just happening online so it will happen real quickly okay so it will just take one or two minutes or even less than that to get the data set okay so you can also see the timer here so it's in seconds so 
about 45 percent 50 percent is just done so basically it contains all these uh, you know files so we have this test folder these are the test data so once you have, you have made the model you need to test it on those data okay so this is basically a Kaggle competition in which people submit their uh, competition codes and their codes will be evaluated okay so our data set is downloaded so you can see the files here okay so these are the test data points and the important data data set we need is this train.csp okay so this is a csv file and this is a very huge file so you can see here it is about 2 gb and it contains uh, you know even lakhs of data points so you can just go here and see the strain.csv so it gives the sample of this uh, data okay so we have uh, two columns acoustic data and time to failure i'll just explain you in a minute about these columns okay so this will download our uh, data set so the important thing to note here is this is a zip file so this is a compressed file right so we need to extract this file to train.csv okay so let's see how we can do it so I'll, now we are going to extract the compressed file so I'll make a comment here, extracting the compressed data set. Okay, so we are going to use the library zip file. So from zip file, import the zip file function. Zip file and i'll store this data set path so data set is equal to so i'm creating a variable and i'm going to store my data set path to this variable so i'll just copy this train.csv.zip copy path and let's paste it here so data set and put it in quotes now we can extract it with so this with function or with keyword is used to open a file so with zip file so we are calling this function so with zip file mention the path which is stored in this data set variable so we need to mention data set and we need to read the file so r represents to read so uh, read as zip so now we need to use the function zip dot extract all so this extract all function will uh, you know extract that compressed file and once we have uh, completed it let's print that the data set is extracted okay <clears throat> so so we can run this and this will take maybe two or three minutes so let's run this and wait and in the meantime and i'll explain you about this data set okay so in this uh, project uh, yatko x are created in uh, laboratory scale so you can see the overview of this so this is basically to forecast yatko x and we have the data set here which contains acoustic data or it's uh, you know you can see here so it's acoustic data and time to failure I'll just go to this train.csv so you can also expand it and see what is meant by those columns so acoustic data represents the seismic signal so those signal represents the strength of an earthquake and time to failure so the time in seconds until the next laboratory earthquake is carried out so you can see that so if, if this is the acoustic data this is the uh, you know time in seconds that will you know take to uh, next earthquake to occur so basically we will train our machine learning model or neural network with this data so when you give this acoustic data it should give the time to failure so how much time it requires for the next earthquake to occur so this is about this data so this is a very interesting and uh, you know very complex uh, uh, you know machine learning project so you can also work on this so this is very interesting so you can go to this code section and you can see some samples of the codes that has been uh, submitted for competition so i suggest you to practice this code and see how all the things work here okay so this is how so you can see the data set size here it's almost 10 gb and we have imported it imported this data set in no time so it you know almost took 31 seconds so this is how you can extract large data sets through Kaggle API okay so this is still uh, you know extracting so once this file is extracted so you know this line will be printed and after that you can just import it to this uh, you know pandas data frame and do some processing and feed it to our machine learning algorithm and do some you know predictions so I hope you have understood how we can uh, import uh, data sets from Kaggle so this will be very helpful in your machine learning journey so that's it for this video so do practice this code and let me know if you run into some error okay thanks for watching
Hello everyone, this is Siddharthan. Welcome to my YouTube channel and in this video, I am going to explain you how to handle missing values in a data set when it comes to machine learning and data science. Okay, So there are mainly two methods to handle missing values. So those methods are nothing but imputation and dropping. Okay, So these are the things which we are going to cover in today's video. Okay, So we will be doing this Python code in Google Collaboratory. So Google Collaboratory is an environment in which you can run Python programs. Okay, So we will be taking a sample a data set for our processing so i'm taking a placement data set so which contains several uh, parameters like what is the higher secondary the person has studied and what is the percentage they scored in higher secondary and uh, you know what field they have studied in their undergraduate and such kind of things and based on all those features uh, we need to predict what is the salary they may get okay so this is about the this placement data set okay so this data set contains some missing values and i'm going to explain you how you can handle those missing values so before starting with today's video i would like to give you a quick introduction about my channel so in youtube i am making a hands on machine learning course with python so you can see this course curriculum video in this i have explained about all the modules and the videos which we are going to discuss in my channel and you can also download the course curriculum file from here so it is given in the description of this curriculum video okay so you can also head towards this playlist page so in this machine learning course i have already completed three modules the first module was on machine learning basics the second module was on python basics for machine learning and the third module is on some important libraries which we need for machine learning okay so in this module i have explained about the modules uh, the mo libraries such as numpy pandas matplotlib cbonds etc okay so i have also made some machine learning project videos so do check out this videos okay so currently we are in the fourth module about handling missing values okay so th this fourth module is on data collection and processing and this is the third video in this fourth module okay so if you are new to google collaboratory you can just go to this second module which is python basics for machine learning and here in this 2.1 video i have explained about google collaboratory basics on how to how you can get access to google collaboratory and what are the various features in google collaboratory okay so with that being said let's start with today's videos so as i have told you earlier there are two methods to handle missing values imputation and dropping so where does this missing values come okay so i hope you know that in machine learning or data science we use data sets so and this data set is used to train our machine learning model and once our machine learning model is trained with this data set it can make new predictions and that data set may contain a lot of missing values and we cannot feed this data set with missing values to our machine learning model so we need to replace all those machine learning uh, you know all those missing values okay so that is what we are going to see in this videos okay so this is the sample data set we have so i'll give the link for this data set in the description of my video and so let's uh, get started i'll just make a text here as importing the libraries so we may need some basic libraries for this so importing the libraries so let's import pandas as pd so pandas library is useful for you know making pandas data frame so pandas data frame are nothing but structured table okay so we also need matplotlib matplotlib.pyplot.splt so these are just the general convention the short form for uh, importing the libraries so we will just plot the values and see which method we can use so that's the reason for importing this matplotlib let's also import cbon so cbon is also another data visualization library which is used to make some plots and graphs okay so let's import cbon as sns so i'll run this you can press shift plus enter to run this cell and go to the next one okay so now we have this csv file we need to load the csv file to a pandas data frame so just go here so you can see this options button here so go there and you can copy the path from here okay so once you have downloaded the data set you can just uh, when you are in this google collaboratory you need to connect your system from here and after that just go to this files option and you can upload the data set from here so you can give this upload option or just right click so you will find this upload option and then upload this placement data set which you will you know find the link in the video description so i have copied the path of this file now let's load it to our pandas data frame so loading the data set to a pandas data frame okay so i'll create a variable called as data set and we are going to use the function pd.readcsv so as you know i have imported pandas as pd so dataset is equal to pd.readcsv 
So this read CSV will read the CSV file and load the content into our data frame. So we have already copied the path. So I'll paste the path, you know, the path here inside the codes. So let's run this. Okay, so this will create a data frame. You can see the first five rows of this data frame using the yet function. So mention the data frame name, which is in this case, it's data set because we are loading the data frame in this, uh, you know, variable. So data set dot yet. So this will give us the first five rows. So as you can see here, we have several columns. So first column is on the serial number. Then it's the gender, whether the person is male or female. Then this, this represents the uh, secondary school percentage. And this is the secondary school board, whether they have studied in central board or state board, such kind of things. Then we have the higher secondary percentage board. And what is the, you know, stream they have st uh, studied whether it's commerce science arts etc so we have then we have this degree and such kind of things and we have the work experience whether the person has work experience or not so such kind of things and finally we have this salary and we also have whether the person is placed or not and also we have salary okay so the idea behind this data set is to you know using all these features you need to predict the salary of the person but that is not what we are interested so we are interested in you know uh, finding a good method to replace the missing value so you can see this thing here so it represents nan so nan represents not a number okay so these are missing values and we need to replace this missing values before feeding to a machine learning model okay so now let's see how many rows and columns are there in our data set so basically we are going to see how many data points we have so you can check that by mentioning the data frame name which is data set dot shape so this gives us the number of rows and columns okay so totally we have 215 rows and 15 columns now let's see how many missing values are there in you know each column so mention the data frame name which is data set dot is null so this is null function gives us the number of missing values and we are going to find it for the all columns so as you can see here, there are no missing values in this serial number column, gender column. So we have only missing values in this salary column. Okay, so there are about 67 values missing in this 215 values. Okay, so there are totally 215 rows and in those 215 rows, about 67, uh, you know, salary values are missing. Okay, so there are two methods as I have told you earlier. One is imputation and the second method is dropping. Dropping is nothing but just dropping or deleting all the rows which has missing values okay but this is not an efficient way to do this you know when you have a very large data set say you have uh, you know 20,000 data points 30,000 data points or you know uh, lakhs of data points in those cases you can just drop the missing values so it won't be a very big factor but when you have a very small data set like 200 300 or within 1000 dropping the missing values is not an ideal method so that's where we will use imputation okay so Imputation is nothing but using some proper statistical values and replacing these uh, missing values with those statistical values. So those statistical measures are nothing but mean, median or mode. Okay. So these three terms mean, median, mode are also called as central tendencies. So central tendencies. Okay. So first one is median. Sorry, the first one is mean. So I'll explain you about what is meant by this mean, median, and mode as well. So second is median. Third is mode. Okay. So I hope you know what is meant by mean. Mean is nothing but it's the average of all the values. So let's say that we have a data set. So that data set contains the values 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. So mean is nothing but the average of all the values. So we just count all the values. So it's nothing but 3 plus 3, 6 and uh, 6 plus 4 10 15 so 15 by 5 so the mean of this particular data set is 5 right so sorry the here the mean is nothing but 3 so mean is nothing but the average value now let's see what is meant by a median so when you have a data set what we will do is we will arrange the values in ascending order so here the values are already in ascending order then we will take the middle value and this middle value represents the median of that data set okay so it's nothing but the middle values once you arrange it in the ascending order so when you have even number of uh, data points let's say we have six values right so here the middle we have two middle values three and four right so in this case what we will do is we will find the mean or average of these two values so here the average is nothing but 3.5 and we will take that as median and mode is nothing but it's the number which has the most frequency let's say the data set as 1, 2, 3, 
3 and 5, 6 and 3. So this is the data set we have. Here the number 3 is repeated 3 times. Okay, So here mode is nothing but the number which is repeated for most number of times. Okay, So here the mean is nothing but the average of all the values and median is nothing but the central value and mode is nothing but the number which is you know repeated for several times. So these are called as important central tendencies in statistics and it's often a good method or a good way to you know instead of dropping the rows which have missing values but you know it's not a very good method to drop the rows but instead we can impute the values the missing values with you know any of these central tendencies okay so but there are actually uh, you know cases where we need to use mean where we need to use median and where we can use mode okay so let's try to understand when we can use these values by first plotting them okay so we cannot just use mean in all the missing values in all the cases in all the data sets so i'll explain you when you need to use mean and when you need to use other things such as median or mode so for that we need to plot this uh, salary column so we need to find how this value is distributed okay so now we are going to analyze the distribution of data in a so in the salary column okay so we just want that one column because that column alone contains missing values okay so i'll create two variables figure and axis so this is how we need to create a uh, plots in matplotlib and seaborn so plt so plt is nothing but matplotlib library so you know i have imported matplotlib.pyplot as plt so we use this plt function to make some plot so we are going to use subplots function okay and here we need to mention the figure size we want okay so i'll mention the figure size to be maybe 8 comma 8 so you can give any values you want it is just the dimension of the plot so now we are going to use the seaborn library so we have imported seaborn library as sns and now we are going to create a distribution plot okay so this plot which represents distribution plot and you need to mention the data which you uh, which you are going to plot so we are going to plot this salary column right so in this data set uh, you know we have we have named this data frame as data set and we are going to print you know uh, plot the salary column so we need to mention it here in the parenthesis so sns dot disk plot and in the parenthesis mention data set dot salary okay so now let's run this and see what is the distribution of the values as you can see here so this is the salary value so 2 into 10 power 6 which it basically represents you know uh, 2 lakhs this represents 4 lakhs and such kind of things so you can see here that the value is more around this you know 2.5 right but there are you know one or two values uh, you know more than uh, 6 lakhs we have one value on around uh, 6.5 lakhs and one value around 9 lakhs so the data is very dis you know highly distributed in this particular area but we have some outliers these are some outliers so when you have these kind of outliers and we have the data distributed in only one side this kind of curve is known as skew okay so this distribution is known as skew and in these cases we cannot use mean values for replacing the missing value so we cannot use mean in this cases because when you have these uh, outliers this will increase your mean value so i'll just explain you with an example so in a college you know there are uh, 10 people placed and out of the 10 people eight of the people have got placed with an average salary of about uh, you know 3 lakhs per annum and two people have placed uh, you know placed about 10 lakh per annum when you get the mean of the entire uh, salary it won't be a very good data set okay because like it will uh, affect the overall mean because we have two outliers right so in these cases we cannot use the mean so when we have this kind of skew distribution in those cases we will use either median or mode as our uh, you know replacement for the missing values okay but when you have an you know almost normally distributed values where you have uh, values distributed in all the magnitude in such cases we can take mean as our replacement for our missing value so in this case as the distribution is more on one side as we get a skew curve we are going to replace the missing values with median or mode okay so now let me tell you how you can replace the missing values with median so we are going to i'll make a text here replace the missing values with median value so we are just taking the salary column alone 
so median value so median value is nothing but so once we arrange it on the ascending order it's the middle value okay so mention the data frame so here the data frame name is nothing but data set mention the column so here the column is salary okay so this salary column dot fill na so this fill na function will you know fill all the missing values with so i'll just mention so fill na data set and in this data set in the salary column we need to find the median okay so in this entire column all the values will be arranged in the ascending order and the median value will be picked so we need to mention this salary column and we need to find the median of this salary column because we cannot find the median of uh, other columns and put it here we just need to find the median of this particular salary column okay so that's why i have mentioned it here so fill in a in that data set dot salary and in that i am getting the median value in place is equal to true okay so in place is equal to true so when you run this all the missing values will be replaced by this median value okay so let's run this so it's data set salary dot fill in a data set salary median okay so this has successfully run so now let's check the number of missing values so we have already checked the number of missing values and it showed that there are about 67 missing values in this particular uh, data set so i'll just copy this as we have uh, replace the missing values here now let's check whether there are any missing values great so you can see here now we don't have any missing values the number of missing values in each column is zero so this is how you can find the median of a data set and you know median of a particular column and replace the missing values with that particular median value okay so this is the line of code for that so in some cases when the distribution is normal when you know the values are distributed correctly so in that ca cases we will uh, replace it with mean so i'll also explain you how you can do that so this is filling missing values with mean value so previously we have seen how to fill it with median value this is about filling with mean value okay so i'll just copy this so it's it's actually the same thing the only change which you need to do is change this median to mode sorry uh, mean so median to mean okay because we are filling it with mean value right so when you run this your data set will be replaced this particular uh, missing values in the salary column will be replaced with mean value okay so i'll just uh, proceed it with hash no it's i'll just make it a comment okay because i don't want to fill with mean value so this is just to uh, tell you how to uh, fill the values with mean so when you replace median with mean so it will replace the missing values with mean value so if you want to do this you can just remove this uh, space and dash to run this particular line so i'll just comment it okay so this is how you can fill mean values in the missing items so i'll also show you how to do the mode so it is also the same thing you just need to replace this mean with mode okay so it's uh, very simple so this is about imputation so this is about how you can impute the missing values with the statistical st central tendencies like mean median or mode now let's see how we can drop the values so but it is not you know highly appreciated or highly supported to drop the values because the data set which we have is you know only 215 and when we drop the rows which has missing values 67 rows will be deleted so this is not you know supported i won't encourage to practice missing values much but you can do that when you have a very large data set and you have only one particular column which has missing values so you can do that in such cases okay but i'll also show you how you can drop but in this particular data set when you are practicing any machine learning uh, predictions don't drop the values so i'll just demonstrate to you how you can uh, drop the values so dropping method so i'll create another variable called a salary data set because i don't want to affect this particular uh, data set so we have already filled the values so i'll just create another uh, variable as salary data set so in this we are going to drop the missing values i'll again give the speedy dot read csv so i hope you remember that we have one second so we have used this read csv function i'll just copy this so we are just reading this again but we are storing it in an another instance okay so we are storing it in another instance another variable called a salary data set so i'll run this okay so you can check whether uh, you know first let's check the number of rows and columns so salary data set dot shape so this function will give us the number of rows and columns 
So we have two 15 rows and 15 columns. Let's check the number of missing values. Salary dataset dot is null and dot sum. So it's telling us that there are 67 missing values. So let's say that we want to drop all the rows containing missing values. Okay. So I'm going to drop missing values. Okay. So um, I'll create a variable with the same name, which is salary data set. So salary data set is equal to again, mention it salary data set dot drop na. So it will drop all the missing values. So na represents not available. Okay. So drop na and oh, so I want all the values to be removed. So I'll mention this any. So any means so I want to uh, remove any missing values that are present in the data frame. Okay. So all the rows containing those missing values will be removed. So let's run this. And now let's again check the number of missing values. Let's see whether the rows are removed. So now we will get that there are no missing values. So this is how you can drop, uh, you know, missing values in a data set. Okay. So if you check the shape of this particular uh, data frame shape, so we are getting that there are about 148 rows. So previously we had about 215 rows because 67 rows have been uh, removed from this data set. So this is how you can remove the missing values from your data set. So that is all about missing values. So we use two methods. One is imputation and the another method is dropping and we uh, use imputation in most of the cases and we drop the values when the number of data points in the data sets are huge and we can afford to you know drop the values in that cases. I hope you have understood about uh, handling missing values in this video. So I'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching. Hello everyone. I am Siddharthan. In this video, we are going to discuss about one of the important data pre-processing technique, which is data standardization. Data standardization is the process of standardizing the data to a common format or common range. Okay. So what does this mean is, so let's say that we have a data set and this data set contains 10 columns of data. And there is a possibility that each column contains data in different range. Say, for example, one column can contain data in the range of hundreds and two hundreds and one column can contain the data in the range of thousands and two thousands and one column can contain the data in tens or twenties okay so we need to standardize this data to a common format and to a common range before feeding it to our machine learning algorithm because it's easier to do analyze analysis and the processing on this uh, standard data instead of having an unstandard data okay so this is what we are going to discuss in today's videos okay so in this video we will be taking a sample data set and uh, in that we will do this data standardization okay so before getting started with this video if you are new to this channel i would like to give you a quick introduction to my youtube channel and in my youtube channel i'm making a hands-on machine learning course with python so if you go to my channel you will see this uh, machine learning course curriculum video so in this uh, video i have explained about all the videos and the modules which i will be covering in this machine learning course so in the description of this video you can download download the course curriculum file okay so you can go to this playlist so you can see the previous modules we have completed so we have so far completed three modules the first module uh, was on the machine learning basics so all the concepts that you need to know about machine learning and in the second module i have explained about all the python basics that are required for machine learning and in the third uh, module i have uh, explained about i have given the tutorial on several machine learning uh, libraries in python such as numpy pandas uh, matplotlib and seaborn and this is the module which we are currently discussing it's data collection and processing okay so this is the fourth video and we also have a uh, machine learning project videos so, so so far we have completed about uh, nine project videos okay so do check out this video subscribe and stay tuned for more videos so you can go to the support section and here you can get the link for my hands on data science course with uh, python so you can also find my linkedin id telegram group and what uh, facebook group so you can join those groups for uh, you know to get notified when i post new videos okay so with that being said let's get started with today's video so this video you know we are doing this programming in google collaboratory so this environment is google collaboratory and here is where we are going to run our python programs okay so here there will be a connect option okay so you need to connect your system here so if you are new to google collaboratory check out my google collaboratory basics video so in that video i have explained about how to access google collaboratory and other things okay so with that being said let's get started with today's video so first of all we need to uh, take a sample uh, data set okay so first we need to import some libraries 
so i'll import numpy as np okay so it's the general convention of importing numpy so numpy is useful for uh, creating numpy arrays and we need another important libraries which is pandas so it is useful to create data frames so data frames are nothing but structured table which helps us to do analysis more easily okay so i'll also import sklearn dot preprocessing so from this module we are going to uh, import sorry so we need to give from so from sklearn dot preprocessing import standard scalar okay so this standard scalar is the function which we are going to use to standardize our entire data set okay so we also need to import from sklearn dot model selection import train test split so this helps us to split our data into training data and testing data okay so we also need one more thing so i'll import sklearn dot data set so from this we will uh, take a sample data set so i'll run this so you need to press shift plus enter to run this cell and go to the next one okay so now we need to load the data set so i'll just make a comment here loading the data set okay so i'll create a, a variable as data set so data set is equal to i'm i'll just call this uh, particular module which is sklearn dot data sets and in that we are going to load the breast cancer data so this uh, data set is used to predict whether a person has breast cancer or not uh, you know by analyzing several medical parameters so if i run this this will store one instance of this breast cancer data to this uh, variable data set okay so let's run this and let's print and see this data okay so print data set so you will see the data here okay so you can see there is this uh, sub name called as data okay so this data contains all the values okay so these are the parameters which we will analyze to predict whether a person has breast cancer or not so there is this target variable right so zero represents that the person uh, you know as uh, breast cancer in benign stage and one represents the person as cancer in malignant stage so benign is nothing but the starting stages and malignant is the most advanced stages where uh, you know the treatment becomes critical and they are in the advanced phase okay so this is what we are going to uh, predict whether the person has uh, the cancer in benign stage or um, you know in malignant stage okay so this is the data set we have and we have these feature names okay so you can see this here okay one second so okay so these are the feature names so we have this uh, mean smoothness mean compactness mean concavity See, these are uh, the parameters of the cell okay so those cancer cells are analyzed and these values are uh, you know uh, got from those cancer cells using some uh, medical scans okay so these are nothing but the feature names so it will be mentioned here okay so you can see here the uh, you know this data set contains a list called as uh, array called as feature names and it contains all the column names okay so we need to import all these okay let's see how we can import this data to a pandas data frame okay so i'll create a data frame as so first let me put a comment here loading the data to a pandas data frame so as you can see here it, it's just the numbers are here and it is you know hard to do some analysis on that so if we uh, you know import that in a structured table which is a data frame it is easier to do the analysis so i'll create the data frame as df so let's declare it as df and df is equal to pd dot data frame so this will create a data frame and inside that we need to mention the data which we want to put so as you can see here this data set we have named it as data set and this data contains all the numerical values or the data so we need to mention that inside this particular function so data set dot data and as i told you earlier the column names are present in the array called as feature names right so mention again data set dot feature names okay so this data set dot data uh, extracts all the numerical data and this feature names uh, extract all column names okay so let's run this and let's see the first five rows of the data frame so just put df the data frame name dot yet so this yet function will print the first five rows of the data frame okay 
so as you can see here this will print the first five rows of the data frame and here there is one important point to note here we doesn't include this target variable okay so this target which represents uh, the cancer is benign or malignant so we don't include this so we will include it in a later point of time so for now we have just included this particular data okay so you can see here these are the column names or these are the feature names which we have in imported through this okay so now you can see here we have several columns here and each column has value in different range so you can see here the first column has values between 10 to 20 and second column also has 10 to 20 whereas the third column has values more than 100 and uh, the mean area is more than 1000 okay so and some values are in the range uh, you know in the less than zero okay so this is where we need to apply data standardization to enable better processing and analysis okay so we need to standardize the data before feeding it to our machine learning algorithm so that is the idea behind the data standardization so let's also check how many rows and columns are there for that you need to mention the data frame here the data frame name is df so df dot shape so this will tell us the number of rows and columns so totally we have 569 rows and we totally have 30 columns okay so we cannot manually standardize uh, all the data and hence we are using this standard scalar function which we have imported from sklearn.pre processing okay so uh, now what i'm going to do is i'm going to uh, put all this data in a single variable and i'll i'm going to take this all this target whether uh, the cancer is malignant or benign in a different uh, you know variable so i'll create tx and I'll store this data frame in this uh, variable X and I'll create another variable Y where I will store all these target values. So these target values can be called by mentioning the data frame dot target. Okay, so let's do that. And uh, X is equal to DF, which is the data frame and Y is equal to data set dot target. Okay, so let's run this. So this X is nothing but the features and Y is the target. So what it means is, so these are the features of so the, the 30 columns. And by analyzing all these features, we need to predict the target, whether the person has cancer in benign or malignant stage. So this is uh, the uh, end result of the data or end result of this project, which we will get, okay? So now let's print this X and Y. So print X. So it contains all the features. So it contains uh, all the 30 columns. And now I'll print Y. Okay, so it contains all the targets or all the labels. So the values are either zero or one. So we don't need to standardize this data because we uh, have just two values, either zero or one, but we need to standardize this data to have it in a common range. Okay, so, okay. Now we need to split the data into training data and test data before we are standardizing it. Okay. So I'll make a text here as splitting the data into training data and test data. Okay. So now we need to create four variables as x train, x test, and y train and y test. Y train and y test. Okay. So we have imported the train test split function from this sklearn.model selection. So I'm going to use that function train test split. Okay. So in that we need to mention X and Y. So X is nothing but the features of the data set and Y is the target. It's either zero or one. And I'll also mention the test size. The test size is how much data we want in our test size. So I'll put 0 0.2. So 0 0.2 represents it's 20 percentage of the data. So generally we take 10 to 20 percentage of the data as test data. And I'll also mention this random state. So random state is nothing but you know it's just to reproduce the code. Say uh, if you give this random state is equal to three when you are doing this code, your data will be splitted in the same way that my data is splitting. If you give random state is equal to two, it will be splitted in a different way. So it is just an identity to you know for splitting the data in a specific way. Okay, so we are creating four uh, arrays here. So X train is the training data and Y train contains the target either zero or one for all the values in this X train and the X test is the test data features and Y test is the corresponding uh, target for X test. Okay. So we can also standardize the data before splitting uh, the data into training data and test data. But if our data has some outliers, then that will be a problem if we do that. Okay. So outliers are those values, uh, you know, which are abnormal. 
let's say uh, let's consider this column so we have this mean compactness which has the value under zero so let's say that in one case uh, we have a value around 100 or even 1000 so that value is called as uh, you know outlier so in this case this is uh, you know a wrong value so these are nothing but outliers and if we have any outliers in our data then if we standardize the data before splitting it then it will create a problem so it's better to uh, split the data uh, into training and test data before standardizing it in most cases okay so in this particular data set it's uh, you know it, it doesn't matter because it is already uh, uh, you know this data doesn't contain much outliers so it is a normalized data and we can uh, split it before standardizing okay so i'll run this this will split, uh, split my data into training data and test data and now i'll print my x train shape Sorry, I'll first print this x x shape. Okay, so x shape and x train shape, so x train dot shape and x test dot shape. Okay, cool. So let's run this. So okay, so you can see here our original data uh, contains about 570 data points, so 516 data points, and 80 percentage of it, which is 455, goes to the X train, which is the training data, and 114 goes to the test data. Okay, so as we have split it now, we can do the data standardization. Okay, so I'll create a text here as standardize the data and I'm going to print the standard deviation of the entire data set. So I'm going to do that by calling this particular data. So this data set contains all the data and I'm going to find the standard deviation data set dot data dot std. So if our data has all the values in the same range, in that case, the standard deviation should be one. Okay, so let's run and see whether we are getting it. So as you can see here, here the standard deviation is 228, which means it, it means that the data is not in the same range and they varies a lot. Okay, so this is what we need to uh, tackle here. So for this, we are going to use this standard scalar function. So we have imported it from sklearn dot pre processing. So I'll create a variable as scalar. So we are going to load the standard scalar in this scalar variable. So standard scalar. Okay, so let's run this. So this standard scalar function will be loaded to this particular variable. So you can search sklearn.preprocessing.standardscalar. So you can see this sklearn documentation here. So you can go through this to understand how the data standardization occurs. Okay, so what happens is this is the final standardized data which we get. So what happens is so each data point will be taken and the mean will Will be subtracted from it so u represents the mean and s represents the variance or standard deviation okay so when you apply this particular formula to all the data points so we get a standardized data but it doesn't affect the nature of the data okay so it just uh, change uh, the uh, value range but it doesn't affect the nature of the data okay so if you do the you know machine learning task on that we get the same result okay it doesn't affect right uh, how the data really is but just the range alone okay so now we need to put this uh, standard scalar function which we are loaded to this and we need to fit this to it okay so use this fit function and inside that we need to mention x train so we are going to standardize the data of x train so this will fit the data x train and let's run this so this standard scalar will analyze and understand how the data is distributed in next train now we need to transform transform our data based on this standard scalar okay so i'll create an array as x train standardized which is equal to now we need to use scalar dot transform okay so before we used scalar dot fit and now we need to transform the data based on this uh, you know scaling so scalar dot transform x train okay so let's run this now you can print it print x train standardized 
and see that the values aren't you know they are not very different so we have value in 1.40 0 0.61 and minus 0.8 phase so these values are very close to each other but you can see previously uh, the values are fixed okay so we have about 17 20 and in the next column we have you know 0.46 uh, and we also add about thousands and two thousand etc so now you can see that the values are in a similar range okay so this is how you need to standardize the x range but there is another step here you need to standardize the x test also okay so in this case we don't uh, fit the data again so we cannot fit the uh, scalar again with x test no so we shouldn't do that we should just transform the data based on this standard scalar okay because this test data contains just 114 examples and it, it, it is not a uh, you know good representation of our entire data set so we need to standardize our data based on this x train fit okay so now let's create a variable as x test standardized and test standardized is equal to scalar dot transform so we shouldn't fit it so we should transform it and inside it mention x test so we want to transform this x test data so let's run this now this data will be transformed so as i have told you earlier the standard the standard deviation should be this value okay so if the value is uh, you know in this range it means that the values are in not in the same range so the value should be one for a or at least closer to one to you know understand that the data are in the same range so i'll print the standard deviation of x train standardized dot std so std will give us the standard deviation so let's run this and the standard deviation value is 1.0 which is which means uh, the data all the data are in a similar range but it doesn't affect the nature of our data set okay so that's what we are understanding from here and you can also print the standard deviation value for x test standardized okay okay so x test standardized dot standard deviation dot std okay so the value is not one but it is close to you know it's 0.86 so which means that uh, we are transforming based on this x train right so that's why the value is uh, 0.8 but it is very much better than 228 so that's what we are getting so this is how you need to standardize your data using this standard scalar function so i hope you have understood the things covered in this video so that's it about standard dv this data standardization okay so thank you so much hello everyone this is siddharthan Currently, we are discussing about the fourth module in our hands-on machine learning course with Python. So this fourth module is about data collection and data pre-processing. So in this data uh, data pre-processing module, this is the fifth video, which is on label encoding. Okay, so this is what we are going to discuss in today's video. Okay, so we will be taking two data sets and we will be performing this label encoding on these two data sets. So that is the objective of this video. So if you are new to this channel, I in this channel, I'm making a hands-on machine learning course with Python. So this is my channel. So you can go to uh, the playlist section of my channel. And in the first page, you can see this machine learning course curriculum video. So in this video, I have explained about uh, all the videos and modules that I'm going to post in this channel. So you, in this uh, description of this video, you will find this curriculum file. So you can download it and go through it. So you can also go to this playlist section so these are the first four modules so this module one is on the machine learning basics the second module is on the python basics for machine learning and the third module is on important python libraries like numpy pandas matplotlib seaborn etc and fourth module is data collection and pre-processing so the video which we are discussing also comes under this module and i have also posted about 10 machine learning projects so i will be posting three videos per week and uh, two videos will be on uh, this particular course order which will be posted on monday evening and wednesday evening and i will be posting one machine learning project video every friday okay so that is about my channel and uh, you can also uh, check this machine learning course with python so all the videos are uh, you know incorporated in this particular playlist so do check out so we will be doing all the coding in python and in this uh, google collaboratory environment okay so in google collaboratory you can run python programs so if you haven't heard about this you can go to this uh, python basics playlist where 
the first video is about how to access google collaboratory and how to you know uh, know about all the features we have in google collaboratory okay so with that being said we can uh, you know start with today's video okay so label encoding what is meant by this label encoding so label encoding is about converting the labels into numeric form okay so when we are working in a classification machine learning problem so classification problems are nothing but we will predict whether a data point belongs to one class or the other say for example uh, we are predicting whether a person is diabetic or non diabetic so it is a classification problem whether in which we have to you know uh, predict that this data points belong to one of these two classes okay so if the data uh, tells that uh, that person is diabetic and non diabetic so it is not easy to use that value so what we do is we convert that diabetic and non diabetic uh, these text values into numerical values as either 0 or 1 so this is about label encoding okay so in this video i'll be explaining you how you can do that so for this I have taken uh, two data sets. So the first data set, this data.csv is a breast cancer data set, which is used to predict whether a person has a breast cancer in benign stage or malignant stage. Okay, so benign means the starting stage of cancer and malignant is, you know, more uh, progressive and advanced stage of cancer. Okay, and this iris data set. So this data set uh, is used to predict whether uh, iris flower uh, belongs to which of the three species. Okay, so in this uh, breast cancer classification, we have two labels and uh, which are benign and malignant in this iris data set we have three species of iris so we will be uh, encoding those labels okay so you can uh, find this connect option here so you can connect the google collaboratory from here and then you can go to this files option so there you can uh, give this upload to session storage option or just right click here so you can see this upload option so i'll give the uh, you know link of this data set files in the description of that of this video okay so first we are going to import the dependencies so i'll just make a comment here about importing the dependencies so we need two libraries so import pandas as pd so pandas library is very helpful to make a data frame so data frame are nothing but structured table so the data set files which we have are csv files so csv means comma separated values so it is easy to analyze and process when we have the data in this data frame okay and then we need a label encoder function so we will import it from from sklearn dot preprocessing import label encoder okay so this label encoder function we will be using so you can press shift plus enter to run this cell and go to the next one so first we are going to encode this breast cancer data okay so let's make a text as label encoding of breast cancer data set okay so the first step is to load the csv file to a pandas data frame so you can go to this options here and from there copy the path of this data.csv file okay so now we are going to load the data set loading the data from csv file to pandas data frame okay so i'll create a variable as or let's name this data frame as cancer data so cancer data which is equal to pd dot read csv and we need to mention the path in the code so i have already copied the path so let's run this so this will load the contents of the csv file to a data frame so now let's print the first five rows of the uh, data frame so first five rows of the data frame so it tells us uh, what are the different columns we have or different features we have in the data set so cancer data dot yet so this yet function will print the first five rows so as we can see the first uh, five rows here so we have the id for each data point and we have this diagnosis this diagnosis is the label we have so in this particular uh, column diagnosis we have two values as either m or b so m represents malignant stage which is uh, the more advanced stage of cancer and uh, b represents benign stage or the starting stage of cancer so if we can uh, predict that the person has cancer in benign stage so the probability is that that person will be saved because we can give the treatment early on so 
this is the objective of this particular data set but in this video our goal is just to encode this particular diagnosis column so we have other features like radius mean so these are uh, you know the parameters of the cell so this cancer cell will be analyzed uh, you know using some test so in this uh, particular uh, you know data set this data is collected from a procedure called as fine needle aspiration through which the cancer cells are obtained and uh, it is you know uh, used to uh, do some uh, test on it and all these data are obtained so these are cell data the the cancer cells data so now we are going to uh, see how many data are there or how many data points are there for malignant cases and benign cases so finding the count of different labels So we need to mention the data frame name so here the data frame name is cancer data and we need to mention the column name so here the column name is diagnosis so in the quotes we need to mention diagnosis okay so cancer data diagnosis dot value counts so this value counts function will tell us the number of uh, malignant cases we have and number of the benign cases we have okay so i'll run this okay so for benign cases we have 357 data points and for malignant cases we have 212 data points now we are going to convert this uh, ben benign stage and malignant stage into corresponding uh, labels with numerical values okay so first we need to load the label encoder function load the label encoder function so as as you would remember that we have imported this label encoder function from sklearn dot preprocessing module. So let's create a variable as label encode, and in this uh, particular variable, let's store this function. So label encoder. And so we need to mention this parenthesis here to mention that we want to you know load one instance of this label encoder function to this particular variable. So I'll press shift plus enter. And now I'm going to uh, encode all the labels to either 0 or 1 and I'm going to store it in a separate variable. So let's create it as label. Okay, so labels is equal to. So we need to mention this label encode which contain the label encoder function. So label encode dot fit transform so dot fit transform. And as I told you earlier, we are going to transform all the values of this diagnosis column, right? So we need to mention in this parenthesis about the data frame which is cancer data dot diagnosis so diagnosis so this will take all the labels from this diagnosis column and it will convert all the values of m and b okay so let's run this so we will get a new column or new list which contain all these labels and now we are going to append or join this labels uh, value to another column in this particular data frame okay so appending the labels to the data frame okay so cancer data so let's create a column named as target is equal to labels okay so let's run this okay so this will add a new column to our data frame now let's again print the first five columns so cancer data dot it okay so let's run this now you can see here at the last we have a new column called as target so this is our target variable so it says one so in the diagnosis we have one so all the values with the m uh, will be transformed with one okay so now we can drop this diagnosis column and then we can uh, you know do our predictions using this features and uh, the target which we have made now okay so in this case so zero represents benign so zero represents benign and one represents malignant cases okay so we can also check the counts value counts so we have already seen how we can count the number of labels we have so cancer data we need to mention the target column so which we are going to count dot value counts okay so let's run this 
and we can see here the label 0 has 357 uh, values and the label 1 has 212 values so you can just compare it with uh, the previous one so b benign case has 357 malignant case has 212 so now you may get a doubt or uh, that which uh, particular label gets uh, the label as a 0 and which uh, you know label gets the value as 1 so because we haven't mentioned that uh, malignant cases should get the value as 1 and benign uh, cases should the value get the values as 0 so what happens is when you use this label encoder function the labels present in that particular column will be arranged alphabetically here the two uh, labels we have are m and b so uh, of course we know that b comes in alphabetical order uh, at first so this b will be given the value 0 and as m comes after b so it will be given a value 1 so this is how we can do a label encoding on this uh, particular breast cancer data so uh, uh, the further processing we do will be to use this uh, target and this feature to train a machine learning algorithm to make some predictions on whether a person has uh, cancer in benign stage or malignant stage by you know going through this uh, features okay so we have already made several classification projects in our channel so you can refer those project videos and you can make your project video oh sorry you can make your own project on this breast cancer uh, you know based on those methods okay so the next thing which we are going to do is encode using this iris data set so as i told you earlier this is iris flower data set and this contains three uh, labels so in this breast cancer data set contains only two labels and this contains three labels so it is uh, the similar procedure which we have done so i'll just copy the path from here okay so we are just going to do the same thing i'll just copy the code from here so I'll just change the names. So now we are going to encode the labels. So label encoding of iris data. Okay. So let's paste the code here. And in this case, we need to paste the path here. And let's name this as iris data. So iris data so let's copy the path from here and i'll paste it here okay so let's run this so this will load the iris data to a csv sorry the csv data to a pandas data frame so the next step are similar so i'll use this yet function so iris data dot yet so this will give the first five rows of the data frame so okay so as you can see here we have totally one two three four and five columns so this is the species column and this will act as the labels okay so now we are going to transform this labels to numerical values as a zero one uh, zero one and two so three labels okay so let's do the value counts function here so iris data and so the column name here is species right so you can see the column name as species so let's mention it in quotes so iris data species dot value counts okay so okay so something has happened here so we need to mention the parenthesis Okay, so we have 50 data points of for iris versicolor species and 50 data points for virginica and uh, 50 species for iris setosa. Okay, so we, we have totally 150 data points and now we are going to encode these labels. Okay, so it is the similar step and let's load the label encoder again. Now let's so label sorry loading the label encoder okay so let's create a variable called as label encoder 2 okay so the label encoder the first label encoder we used is for the uh, breast cancer data and this is for this iris data so let's mention the encoder function label encoder so i'll run this now let's create the labels and store it in uh, the variable called as iris label okay so iris labels is equal to label encoder 1 dot fit transform and iris data set iris data dot species because we are going to transform this species column okay so you can see the column name here so let's run this okay so now we need to append it to our data original data frame so iris data 
let's create again a variable called as sorry a column called as target and in that we will store this iris labels okay so let's run this and let's print the first five rows of the uh, data frame so iris uh, data dot hit now you can see here okay so something has happened here okay so we shouldn't use this label encoder so a label encoder dot fit okay so we need to uh, fit transform so we made a error here so so it should be label encoder dot fit transform so let's run this again and this okay now you can see here uh, we get the target as zero now we can check the value counts function so iris uh, data dot okay iris data mm, target dot value counts okay so now we can see here we have three labels here 0 1 and 2 so now uh, as i have told you earlier so the labels will be arranged in alphabetical order so here the first uh, species that comes in alphabetical order is setosa and then uh, comes versicolor and virginica so the label will be given the value 0 for setosa and 1 for versicolor and uh, 2 for virginica okay so i'll just mention it here in a text as iris setosa the label will be 0 and for iris versicolor so the label will be 1 and for iris virginica the label will be okay so this is how you can take the labels from a data frame and you can convert it to a numerical value using the label encoder function that is present in SQL and dot pre processing okay so i hope you have understood how you can uh, you know convert the labels into numerical values and that's it for this video and i'll see you in the next video thanks hello everyone this is siddharthan Currently, we are discussing about the fourth module in our machine learning course. So the fourth module is about data collection and data pre-processing. And this is the sixth video in the data pre-processing module. In this video, we are going to discuss about train test split function. Okay. In case you are watching my videos for the first time, I, in this channel, I'm making a hands on machine learning course with Python. You can check out the playlist in my channel to start learning my course from the beginning okay so this train test split function is one of the important steps in data pre-processing so we will do this uh, train test split in uh, every machine learning projects we do okay so before uh, you know i explain you about what is meant by this train test split function i want to explain you about the general workflow which we will follow in a machine learning project okay so this is how a machine learning workflow will look like so the first step in any machine learning project is to get the data we want okay so this data is chosen based on our problem statement so let's say that we want to predict whether a person is diabetic or not so in that case we want medical data for uh, several persons of diabetic and non-diabetic persons so we use this data to train our machine learning model and do some predictions okay so the first step is to collect the appropriate data so once we have the data we cannot feed it directly to our machine learning algorithm so we need to process the data so this is where data pre-processing steps come okay so in data pre-processing so we do a lot of things to the data say for example if the data has some missing values so we need to handle those missing values through some methods okay so these are the steps that comes in data pre-processing okay so once we do the pre-processing we need to analyze the data so it helps us to give some meaningful insights out of, out of the data so for example a data set may contains 10 columns or even 20 columns so we call these columns as features so we need to find which feature is important for the prediction and stuff like that so this is where we use data analysis so in this we you know make some plots and analysis to see which uh, features are important okay so once we analyze the data the next step is to split the original data into training data and testing data so this step is known as train test split function so this is what we are going to see in this video so once we split our original data into training data and test data we will feed this training data to our machine learning model okay so there are several machine learning models so what we will do is 
this training data will be used to train our model so our model will find the pattern and learn from this training data okay so once it has learned from the training data our model will be evaluated and this evaluation will be based on the test data okay so evaluation is about finding how the model is performing and what is the accuracy score of the model and such kind of things so the takeaway is that we use the training data for training the model and we use this evaluation uh, by the train uh, test data okay so now let's see what is this train test split okay so when we have this original data set so we take uh, 80 percent or 90 percentage of the data as training data and we take 10 percentage or 20 percentage as testing data okay so which is used for evaluation but what is the need for this evaluation so let's try to understand this with an analogy so let's say that a person is studying for a max exam okay so let's say that he is preparing uh, you know for the exam by practicing the questions in given in a textbook so that questions will become the training data so in exams the examiner will ask the questions that may be out of that book okay so because if uh, the questions are asked out of the book then only we can you know evaluate that the person has studied well okay so asking the same questions given in the textbook may not uh, be a correct metric to uh, you know uh, analyze his performance so this is uh, the same example here so we cannot test our model based on the training data because our model has already learned has already seen the training data but it never saw the test data so that's why we need this testing data to evaluate our model on how it's performing and what is uh, the accuracy score and other metrics of the model okay so with that being said let's uh, get into some coding part and how, how to do this training and test uh, testing split okay so i will be doing this in google collaboratory so before starting with the video i'll just show you a quick intro to my channel so this is my youtube channel in which i'm posting my machine learning videos so once you go to my channel you can see this machine learning course curriculum so in this i have explained about all the modules and the videos that i will be covering in this channel so in the description of the video you can uh, see the curriculum file so you can download it and go through it so i have also mentioned some uh, important machine learning books that you can read okay so it is also given in the description of all the videos so you can go to this playlist section to uh, check out the modules okay so as you can see here the first module is on machine learning basics the second module is on python basics required for machine learning then the important libraries such as numpy pandas matplotlib and uh, cborn okay and the fourth module which we are discussing right now is data collection tree processing and also i have um, several machine learning project videos so i will be posting three videos per week two videos will be on monday evening and wednesday evening which will follow this course order and every fr friday i will be posting one machine learning course video sorry machine learning project video okay so you can also check this machine learning course with python so i have uh, you know incorporated all the videos in this particular playlist so in case you are new to this Google Collaboratory, you can go to the second module, which is Python Basics for Machine Learning. So in that, the first video is about how you can access Google Collaboratory and how you can, uh, you know, use different features present in it. Okay. So now let's get into uh, this uh, section. So this is where we run our Python programs. So I have taken an example project. So this is about diabetes prediction. So we have already did this machine learning project in our channel. So you can go to the machine learning project playlist to see the full uh, code there. So here we have the half code. So I will stop this video by, you know, splitting the data into training data and testing data. Okay. So before that, I'll just give you a quick recap of what we have done here. So I have already uploaded the data set file here. So this is diabetes.csv, which contains uh, the medicinal data. So I'll give the link of this data set file in the description of this video. Okay. So first what we are doing is, so we are importing the libraries. So we need some important libraries such as NumPy, Pandas, SKLearn. So we use the standard scalar function to standardize all the data. And this is the train test split function, which we are going to see. Okay. So this will automatically split our data into training data and test data. So in this case, uh, I will be using a support vector machine model for training. And then we will predict our accuracy score. Okay. So I won't be explaining uh, the entire thing because we have already uh, did that in the diabetes prediction project video. Okay. So I'll just explain this train test split function. So after that, we have loaded this uh, data set uh, in a Pandas data frame. Okay. So using this read CSV function and we have seen what are the different columns are present in it. Okay. So these are some data analysis part on finding some statistical measures. And we found that there are two labels in our uh, outcome column. Okay. So you can see the outcome column here. It's either one or zero. So in this case, zero represents 
non diabetic patients and one represents diabetic patients okay so you can see this is the mean for each cases so for non diabetic uh, persons this is the average value of each column and one is uh, for diabetic people okay and then we are splitting our data into features and uh, targets okay so the feature is all those columns except this outcome column okay so this outcome column is the target and we will take it separately okay and all these other columns act as the features so you can see here we have stored all the features in x and all the features in y okay so and we have printed it and this x doesn't contain the outcome column and y contains only this outcome column okay then we have applied this uh, standard scalar function so this uh, data standardization uh, is used to make all the values in a common range so you can see here so some values are in the range of 100s and some are in the value of 20s and 30s some are in the you know uh, in the range of 0.6 and such kind of things so we use this uh, data standardization to have all the values in the same range okay so we have standardized the data and the next step is where we will split our data into training data and test data okay so if you want to know more about this particular project please check out that diabetes video so i'm not explaining much okay so now i'll just create a text here as splitting the data into training data and testing data okay so now we can use the train test split function that we have imported from sklearn dot model selection okay so you can see this here so we have imported the train test split function using sklearn dot model selection so that's what we are going to use now so before that we need to create four arrays so x train x test y train and y test okay so i'll just explain you what is meant by these uh, four arrays so in a moment so before that let me complete this line of code so train test split and inside this train test split function we need to mention the parameters so here we need to mention x and y we know that x are the features and uh, y are the outcome so we need to split this x and y so we need to mention x and y and then let us mention the test size so test size is equal to 0.2 okay so point to means i want to take 20 percentage of the entire data as test data so as i have told you earlier during the presentation that we take either 10 percentage or 20 percentage of data as the test data right so in this case i'll take 20 percentage of data as the uh, test data and then i'll mention another parameter which is random state okay so let me put random state is equal to 2 so you can give any integer values for this random state so the reason for this is if you want to split the data the same way that my data is getting splitted then we need to give the same value here okay so if you give uh, the value as 2 your data will be splitted in the same way that uh, my data is going to get splitted okay so if you mention 3 then your data will be splitted in a different manner okay so these are the parameters which we need to mention x y Test size and random uh, random state. Okay, and now we have this four arrays. So X train is nothing but this features. Okay, so these features will be uh, split into X train features and X test features. So 80 percentage of the data points in this features will go into this X train, and 20 percentage will go into this X test. And the corresponding labels of this X train will be uh, you know going into this Y train array. Okay, so this uh, corresponding Y will be split into Y train and Y test. So Y train contains the corresponding labels for X train, and Y test contains the corresponding label labels for X test. Okay, so let's run this. Okay, so now you can go ahead and print the shape of X. So X is nothing but our original data set uh, shape, and X train dot shape, and X test dot shape. Okay, so let's run this. so we have uh, in the original data set we had about 768 data points and eight columns so in our x train 80 percentage of data which is 614 values goes into the x train and uh, the testing data we have 20 percentage of the value which is 154 data points so this is how you can split your original data into training data and test data okay so if you want to know what we can do after this on how we can predict the 
predict that a person has diabetes or not so you can check out that uh, diabetes prediction video in our machine learning project playlist okay so i hope you have understood about a train test split function so that's it for this video i'll see you in the next video thank you hello everyone this is siddharthan in this video we are going to discuss about how to handle imbalanced data set okay so an imbalanced data set is something which contains unequal class distribution okay so let's understand this with an example so let's say that we have a diabetes data set so this diabetes data set contains data points of uh, patients who have diabetes and those who doesn't have diabetes okay so if that data set is imbalanced it will contain more data points for diabetic patients and the number of data points for non-diabetic patients will be very less say for example the number of data points for diabetic patients can be thousand and for non-diabetic patients it can be uh, only 100 data points so we have this distribution of thousand on one class and 100 on another class so this is an example of imbalanced data set we cannot feed this data set to our machine learning model so it will make our predictions you know very bad so before uh, training this data set with our machine learning model we need to process it to you know remove this imbalance okay so that's what we are going to discuss in today's video okay so before uh, getting started with this video if you are new to this channel hi in this channel i am making a hands on machine learning course with python and uh, i will be posting three videos per week two videos will be on monday and wednesday evening and this uh, these videos will be following the machine learning course order and every Friday, I will be posting a machine learning project video, okay? So you can get towards the uh, playlist section in my channel to start learning my course from the beginning, okay? So this environment is called as Google Collaboratory. So we will be doing all the code in Google Collaboratory. So all the Python code, okay? So if you are new to this Google Collaboratory, you can go to the second uh, module in my uh, playlist section. So the name of that playlist is python basics for machine learning so in that the first video is google collaboratory basics okay so the index of that video will be 2.1 so in index of this video is 4.7 that means this is the seventh uh, video in our fourth module so the fourth module is all about data collection and pre-processing okay so th the seventh video is about handling imbalanced data set okay so now let's get started with this video so what we will do is so you can see here i have already uploaded a data set here so this is a, a pretty big data set so its size is about 143 mb so you can upload it so i'll give the uh, link for this data set in the description of this video okay so this is an imbalanced data set which contains more number of more number of data points for only one class okay so we will load this data set to a pandas data frame and see how we can handle this imbalance okay so the first step is we need to import some uh, libraries So I'll just make a text here as importing the dependencies. Okay, so let's import the two libraries, the two basic libraries which are NumPy and Pandas. Let's import NumPy as NP as the general convention and let's import Pandas as PD. Okay, so pandas as pd so you can press shift plus enter to run the cell and go to the next one okay so now we need to load this data set this data in the csv file to our pandas data frame okay so you can go to this options uh, here and you can copy the path of this file okay so to upload this file just go to this uh, files option so before running the code you need to connect your system here so yet there will be a connect option okay so there you just need to go to this files option and give this upload uh, upload thing here so there you can upload the data set file so now we are going to load the data set so loading the data set to pandas data frame okay so let's declare the name of the data frame as credit card data okay credit card data which is equal to pd dot read csv so we have uh, we are having a csv file here and to read the csv file we need to use this read csv function and inside the codes we need to mention the path so we have already copied the path so let's run this so here the data set is a credit card data set so it contains a different transaction for a legit transaction and fraudulent transaction so this data set will be used uh, to predict whether 
a transaction is legit or it is a fraudulent transaction okay so we have already made a project video on this so you can go to the machine learning project playlist to see uh, you know how we can uh, process this data set and do the prediction so the uh, idea of this particular video is only to handle this imbalance okay so if you want to learn about the prediction you can uh, you know watch that video after completing this video okay so we have successfully loaded it to our pandas data frame called as credit card data okay so now we can print the first five rows of the data frame so first five rows of the data frame okay so credit card data so you need to mention the data frame name which is credit card data dot it so this yet function will print the first five rows of the data frame okay so we can see the first five rows here so first we have this uh, time column okay so this first transaction is taken as the zeroth second and it uh, it gives the second for uh, all the other transaction okay so we have several columns here and finally we have the amount so this amount will be in us dollars okay and this is the class here zero represents legit transaction legit transaction are nothing but normal transaction and the another class is one okay so one value represents the transaction is a fraudulent transaction okay so this is a typical classification problem and these are uh, you know we so totally we have about 28 columns so these features are uh, processed using a principal component analysis uh, function because they cannot uh, you know give us the details about this transaction it may contain contain some personal information okay so that's why you know we have the features in these kind of numbers which doesn't make any sense for us okay so but these uh, columns are really important for our predictions okay so you can see the amount column here and the class column here okay so you can also uh, print the last five rows uh, of the data frame so just mention the data frame name credit card data dot tail okay so let's run this and you can see the last five rows and yeah so the last five rows are also a uh, legit transaction okay so and one more thing this data set doesn't contain any missing values okay so you can run is null uh, dot sum to check if it contains any missing values so it doesn't contain any missing values so our next step is to uh, analyze the distribution of the two classes which is a uh, legit transaction which is represented by zero and fraudulent transaction which is represented by one okay so let's do that now we are going to de determine the distribution of the two classes okay so for that mention the data frame name re, uh, credit card data and the column is class so we have seen the column so it's class and we can use value counts function dot value counts so this will give us the distribution of the data points value counts okay so let's run this and you can see here for uh, the label zero that is for legit transaction we have about 2 lakh 84000 data points or 284000 data points and for fraudulent transaction we have only 492 data points so this means that almost 99 percentage of the data is in this particular class this uh, legit class and we have you know less than one person for this fraudulent transaction so this is a typical example of an imbalanced data set where we have more number of data points for one particular class okay so this is why we tell this is an imbalanced data set so i'll just make a text here that this is highly imbalanced data set okay so i'll also make uh, another text here mentioning that zero represents legit transaction or it it, it is basically means uh, the transactions are legal okay so legit transactions and one represents fraudulent transactions okay so let's run this okay so now we are going to separate uh, these legit transaction and these uh, fraudulent transactions separately okay so i'll make another text here as separating the data 
or let's put separating the digit and fraudulent transactions so i'll create two variables so the first one is nothing but legit and the second one is nothing but let's name this as fraud okay so legit is equal to credit card data and again we need to mention this so in square bracket the credit card data dot class so class is the column which contains the labels so we have two labels which are zero and one so we know that the legit transaction has the label as zero right so legit is equal to zero so what happens is it will take all the uh, you know rows which contain the class value as a zero so zero represents legit transaction so all these 284000 data points will be stored in this uh, legit variable okay so we need to store so we just need to do a similar thing here with only one small change so fraud is equal to so in this we need to mention one so one represents fraudulent transaction right so this will separate uh, both of these types of classes and it will load this to this legit variable and fraud variable okay so let's run this now you can print uh, both of these variables so let's print the shape of them so shape of legit and the shape of okay so shape so now you can see here that uh, we have totally 284000 data points in legit and 492 data points in fraud okay so now what we are going to do is we are going to you know implement a technique called as under sampling so this is a very important uh, sampling method to handle imbalanced data under sampling okay so what i'm going to do is so i'm going to take a 492 fraudulent transaction and out of these uh, 284000 data points i'm just going to take the same number of uh, data points so i will be taking 492 legit transaction okay and how will i take this i will just uh, create a random sample of uh, these 2 lakh data points but i just want about 500 data points okay so this is uh, what is called as under sampling okay so here what we are doing is we are just building a sample data set containing similar distribution of legit and fraudulent transaction okay so that is our goal okay so the total number of uh, fraudulent transaction we have is 40 uh, 492 so i'll also mention this here so number of fraudulent transaction so it is 492 so now let's see how we can uh, take a random sample of these two lakh values so i'll create another variable as legit sample so this is the random sample which contains 492 values of legit uh, transaction so it's not that we need to take uh, you know the exact number of uh, the other class so you just need to take almost similar so you can take 500 values or 550 values or 400 values something like that so i'll just take the similar number of uh, this class as well say for example if here it is 492 right so i'll also take 492 for legit sample so as you can see here we have loaded all the legit uh, transaction data points to this legit variable so to this legit array so i'll mention it here so this will be basically in a form of pandas data frame okay so it won't be an array it will be in a pandas data frame data type so legit dot sample so this sample function will give us a random sample and in the parenthesis we need to mention one parameter so here the parameter is n which is the number of data points we want so when i put n is equal to 492 it will get 492 random values in this uh, legit data frame and it will be stored in this legit sample variable okay so let's run this and you can print the shape of this legit sample okay 
legit sample dot shape. Okay, so you can see here, so totally we have 492 data points. So this is how you can get the, you know, uh, random sampling with equal number of uh, data points between two classes. Now we need to concatenate the two data frames. So we need to concatenate these legit samples and the original fraud samples. Okay, so now we are going to concatenate the two data frames. Concatenate. the two data frames okay so i create new data frame called as new data set which is equal to we need to use the function pd so pd represents pandas because we have imported pandas as pd dot concat so this concat function will join two data frames and we want to enclose two things here so one is the legit sample which contains all the legit data points and the second one is nothing but fraud data points so if you remember we have separated this uh, fraud transaction which are labeled as one to this fraud variable right so we need to mention this here okay so we need to concatenate these two data frames and there is another parameter we need to mention which is axis so axis is equal to zero so axis is equal to zero means we want to concatenate a data frames one top of the other so what happens is so the first 492 uh, values will be the legit transactions and after that so this fraudulent transaction will be added so if we mention axis is equal to zero this uh, fraudulent transaction will be added uh, after all the columns of legit samples say for example so when we mention uh, axis is equal to one what happens is so the fraudulent transaction will be added after this uh, class column so we don't want to add column wise but we want to add row wise right so that's why we are mentioning axis is equal to zero so axis is equal to zero means we want to concatenate row wise okay so now we can run this and now you can get this new data set dot yet so this will print the first five rows and now let's see what is the distribution so you can see here this is shuffled so this is the first one is the serial number so you can uh, see here so previously we have this in order now this uh, legit transaction will be uh, you know uh, randomly sampled and we have the first five rows here now let's print the last five rows new data set dot tail So now we have the last five rows of the data frame, but you can see here the class is one. So we have fraudulent data set at the end of the data frame. Previously, we have only the legit transaction, right? So this is how you can, uh, you know, uh, handle an imbalanced data set. So previously, we have seen uh, this distribution, right? Using this uh, dot value construction. Let's do the same for this new data set. So I'll mention this new data set. And inside it, we need to mention class dot value counts. So when you run this, you can see here the first class so as 492 data points and uh, the class zero as 492 data points as well. But previously we had about 284,000 data points on the class zero and uh, for the class one, we have only about 492 data points. Now we have a evenly distributed data set for the two classes and when you use this data set for your prediction using machine learning you will get better results okay so this is how you can handle imbalanced data set in python okay so i hope you have understood all the things that we have covered in this video so i'll enclose uh, the link for the data set and this collab file in the description of this video okay so if you want to uh, know about further prediction on this data set so go to the machine learning projects playlist and in that you can uh, check out for credit card uh, fraud detection project okay so in that uh, example so in that project video i have explained how you can predict the transaction whether the transaction is legit or fraud okay so that's it from my side i'll see you in the next video thank you hello everyone this is siddharthan currently we are discussing about the fourth module in our hands on machine learning course with python and this module is all about data collection and pre-processing this is the 8th video in our data pre-processing module and this video is about feature extraction of text data. Okay, so in this video, I will be explaining you what is exactly mean by 
feature extraction and how we can implement this feature uh, extraction of text data using tf idf vectorizer okay so i will also be showing you how you can implement this in python okay so this also contain Amazon part okay so first of all let's try to understand about this feature extraction so feature extraction is all about the mapping from textual data to real valued vectors is called as feature extraction okay so I would like to explain you about some basic thing about machine learning here before going into feature extraction so basically in machine learning we will feed our machine learning model with a lot of data and our model can find the patterns in this data and it can learn from it as a result of which it can make new predictions okay so this is how a basic machine learning algorithm or basic machine learning model works okay so but when we have the data in the form of text okay so it will be kind of hard for a computer or a machine to understand the text data whereas it can easily understand the numerical data okay and we have to convert this text data to numerical data and this is where feature extraction comes into play so what we do is we convert this textual data to feature vectors so feature vectors are nothing but the numerical representation of this textual data okay so this is called as feature extraction so once we convert this text data to numerical data it is now compatible to uh, go into the machine learning model okay so so we need to uh, discuss some few uh, terms in terms in feature extraction okay the first one is bag of words so as you can see here bag of words represents the list of unique words in the text corpus okay so corpus means collection of words okay so what we do is let's say we have a paragraph so the algorithm so this feature extraction algorithm tries to create a list with all the unique words so it removes the repeated words and it uh, creates a list of all the unique words present in that particular text corpus okay so then we will use a tf idf vectorizer so tf idf represents term frequency and inverse document frequency okay so in the next slide i'll explain you what exactly meant by this term frequency and inverse document frequency so let's first try to understand what does this tf idf vectorizer do as you can see here, I have mentioned here that to count the number of times each word appears in a document. Okay, so what we basically do is we create a list of all the words in the paragraph or in the document and we count the number of times the words repeats. Okay, so you may have a doubt. So how, how, how does counting the number of words can uh, help us convert this uh, text into numerical data? So I'll give you an example. Let's say that we are building a machine learning model that can predict whether a mail is a spam mail or a normal mail okay so we all would have encountered this spam mail in our daily life and uh, we can say that the spam mails contain the words like offers free discounts and such kind of things and a normal mail so the mail sent by our family members or our uh, you know uh, colleagues doesn't have these kind of words right so what happens is when you count these words it can tell the machine learning algorithm like uh, this particular kind of label as this uh, kind of words say for example the label for this spam mail prediction will be spam mails and normal mails right and here the spam mails will be the label and this can tell our model that uh, this spam mails as the words like free discount offers etc and this is how counting the words can uh, help the machine learning model to understand what is present in the data set so there is another important thing to note here when we do this vectorizer it doesn't understand the context of the paragraph it just uh, you know tries to count the number of words so number of times the words is repeated and it doesn't understand the context so there are also some other methods which we will discuss in our nlp topics which is uh, natural language processing topics in that part i'll explain you what are the other methods to do this but uh, in machine learning we frequently go with this uh, vectorizer uh, concept okay so as i've told you what does this vectorizer do now let's understand more about this term frequency and inverse document frequency okay so we will be using a tf idf vectorizer and tf stands for term frequency term you can see the formula here so the uh, formula for term frequency is number of times term t appears in a document divided by the total number of terms present in the document so what happens is let's say that there is a, a word called as uh, offer in that particular data set so this vectorizer will count how many times this uh, word offer has been uh, repeated in the document and it will divide it by total number of uh, words present in the document so this is called as term frequency so this can tell us what are the important words are right so there is this uh, idf so idf stands for inverse document frequency and the formula for this is log capital n by small n so i have mentioned what is meant by this two n's so the capital n stands for the number of documents 
and uh, n is uh, okay it's uh, not the number of documents it's number of uh, words okay and uh, small n is the number of documents a term t has appeared in okay so you can refer the formula here so basically what it tells is so the idf value of a rare word is i whereas the idf of a frequent word is low so why we have this inverse document frequency value is that uh, there can be words like uh, you know the articles and nouns and other kind of things so words like is are the a etc and etc so these words would be repeated a lot of time and we don't want to give a significant you know focus to these words and this is where we use this inverse document frequency where if a word is repeated a lot of times that word will have a small value okay so this will tell us the machine learning model that that word is not significant okay and then both of these values will be uh, multiplied okay so this is uh, the tf idf value and each term has this tf idf value and uh, this is nothing but our feature vectors and it represents the numerical value right so as you can see here we got some numerical values from these formulas and uh, this is how we can convert a text data to a numerical data so i hope you have understood uh, what we have discussed here now i'll show you how you can implement this in python okay so i'll go to my google collaboratory so I have the code ready. So we have taken this fake news prediction uh, data set. So this data set contains news articles and uh, it contains two types of news. One is the fake news and the another one is the real news. So you can see the details of the data set here. So we have already made this uh, machine learning project on fake news prediction in our channel. So you can go to the playlist section in my channel to watch this complete video on this fake news prediction. So in this, I'm just going to explain how we can you know convert this uh, text data to numerical data so i'll just give you a you know short introduction of what we are doing here okay so we just uh, imported the libraries so we have also already uploaded the data set here so i'll give the link for the data set in the description of this video okay so you can download it from here so we are doing some processing so if you uh, want to understand about this so once you watch this video go to the fake news prediction project video in my channel so that you can understand what are the things we are doing here okay so i'll just come to this last part so you can see what we are doing is we are taking all the words and putting it in a you know a concise list okay so this data set contains as you can see these are the columns we have title author text what is uh, present in that news and what is the label so one represents fake news and zero represents real news so we are going to combine this author and text uh, sorry the title and author and uh, by analyzing these two uh, text we are going to make our predictions okay so as you can see here that's what uh, we have did here so we have stored all the author names and uh, the corresponding news uh, news title in x okay so now we need to convert this particular text into feature vectors so this is where we are going to use our tf idf vectorizer okay so you can see here i have imported this tf idf vector as a function from sklearn.feature extraction.txt okay so this is the module that contains this tf idf vector as a function so now let's implement this so i'll just make a text here as tf idf okay so term frequency and inverse uh, document frequency so what we are going to do is convert the textual data to feature vectors okay so we need to load our tf idf vectorizer to a variable so i'll just create a variable called as vectorizer and now we need to uh, load the function so as you can as you have seen before that we have imported the uh, tf idf vectorizer function from sklearn so i'll just mention it here tf idf vectorizer parenthesis and then so let's run this now we need to fit and transform this vectorizer to our data so as you can see here we need to uh, convert this x data right so this x data contain all the content so content is nothing but the title of the news and the author of the news so mention this vectorizer vectorizer dot fit and inside this we need to mention x okay 
now let's create another variable x the same variable which uh, contains all these values and now we are going to transform all this text data so we need to mention vectorizer dot transform so this will transform all the textual data so basically this will count the number of times the words are repeated so which we have discussed before so it will count those words and uh, give the corresponding tf idf value for all these uh, individual words okay so that that is what this fit and transform function will do and inside this we need to mention x so what happens is it will convert all these uh, textual data to numerical data and it will be stored in this variable x so let's run this okay so you can see here in this case i have printed x and we got this text data right and now let's print x again which is uh, already vectorized as you can see here now we have a bunch of numbers so this is how you can convert the textual data to numerical data and now we can feed this numerical data to our machine learning model to predict whether this news is a real news or a fake news okay so if you want to know more about this uh, particular project so go to the playlist section uh, in my channel so if you are new to this channel i I'd like to give you a quick introduction to my channel so uh, in my channel i'm making a hands-on machine learning course with python so i will be posting videos on monday wednesday and friday and monday and wednesday the videos will be following the machine learning course order and every friday i will be posting a machine learning project video okay so that is about my channel so i hope you have understood all the contents covered in this channel so i'll see you in the next video bye hello everyone this is siddharthan Currently, we are in the fourth module of data collection and data pre-processing in our hands-on machine learning course with Python. And this is the ninth video where we will be taking a numerical data set as our use case and we will be doing some data pre-processing steps on this data set. Okay, so before feeding this to a machine learning model. So th these are the previous videos in our uh, data collection and data pre-processing module where we have discussed about where to collect the data for machine learning and how to collect this data through uh, Kaggle APIs and other methods. And I have also explained about these data pre-processing techniques such as handling missing values, data standardization, label encoding, and how to split your data set into training data and testing data, and how to handle imbalanced data set and such things, and also how to extract features from text data, okay? So in this uh, particular video, we will be applying some of these techniques of data pre-processing to process this uh, particular data set, okay? So I'll give the uh, link for this playlist and my other playlist in the description of this video, okay? So in case you are new to my channel, I in this channel, I'm making a hands-on machine learning course with Python. So I will be posting three videos per week. Two videos will be on Monday and uh, Wednesday evening, which will follow this course order. And every Friday, I will be posting one detailed machine learning project video. Okay. So I'll give the link for all the playlists in the description of my videos. Okay. So this is Google Collaboratory. So if you are new to Google Collaboratory, you can go to the second playlist in my channel, which is on uh, Python basics for machine learning. Okay. So in that the first video will be on Google Collaboratory basics on and how to use Google Collaboratory and other features of Google Collaboratory. Okay, so here there will be a connect option. So you can connect your system from here and you can see this files option here. So here you can upload your data set. So I have already uploaded my data set. So here we will be taking diabetes data set and doing some data pre-processing on this particular data set. Okay, so this contains numerical data. So once you download this data set, you can go to this upload to session storage or just do a right clicker so you will find this upload option so from here you can upload your data set so i'll give the link for this data set file in the description of my video okay so the first step in any python program is to import the dependencies so i'll make a text here as importing the dependencies so dependencies are nothing but the libraries and uh, functions which we need for our project okay so let's import some basic libraries such as numpy so import numpy as np and let's also import pandas as pd okay so numpy is used for making a uh, numpy arrays and pandas is used for uh, you know building pandas data frame so you can see here our data set is in a csv file so csv means comma separated value so it is hard to analyze and process the data when it is in a csv file so we will feed it to a pandas data frame so pandas data frame are nothing but they are structured tables okay so it is very helpful to do some analysis and processing inside the data frame so and then we will be uh, importing another function from sklearn dot preprocessing we need to import standard scalar okay so I'll, I'll explain you later why this standard scalar is used and then we need from 
sklearn dot model selection we need to import train test split okay so when it comes to machine learning so we will split our original data set into training data and testing data so we will train our machine learning model with this training data and we will evaluate our model's performance using this test data and this train test split function is used to split the data into training data and testing data so and you can run this particular cell so you can press shift plus enter to run this cell and go to the next one okay so the next step is data collection and pre-processing so data collection and pre-processing okay so first we need to uh, load our data from the csv file to a pandas data frame so i'll make a text here as loading the data from csv file to a pandas data frame okay so let's create a variable as diabetes data diabetes data which is equal to so we need to use the pandas function pd dot read csv so you can see in, in the above cell that we have imported pandas in the short form as pd so i'm going to use this read csv function and we need to mention a uh, mention quotes here and here we need to specify the path of our data set just go to this uh, particular files option and you can find this menu uh, sorry options menu here so when you click this you can find this copy path so we need to copy the path of our data set file and we need to paste it here okay so now let's run this this will load the content of the csv file to a pandas data frame okay so now we can print the first five rows so first uh, five rows of the data frame okay and uh, so we need to mention the data frame name which is diabetes data dot eight so this eight function will give us the first five rows of the data frame okay so this uh, you know helps us to understand what are the different columns we have and uh, as you can see here these are the columns we have in, in our data set so pregnancy so this data set is uh, about female patients with diabetes and uh, it tells us whether a patient has diabetes or not and also these parameters okay so the number of uh, pregnancies that female patient has uh, undergone and uh, their blood glu glucose level their blood pressure value and their skin thickness insulin uh, present in their blood bmi body mass index diabetes pedigree function so this is a function some value which gives us you know uh, how much diabetes they are suffering from okay so such kind of measurement and we also have vh okay and we have this outcome as one and zero okay so here zero represents that a person is non-diabetic whereas one represents the person is diabetic okay so this is the outcome so this becomes our target variable so basically what we will do is we will train our machine learning algorithm with this data so once we feed uh, you know train this uh, model with this data so when we give all these features from pregnancies to age it will tell us whether that person is diabetic or not so it will give this label either one or zero okay so this is how this is uh, how this particular data set is used so let's see how we can do the processing necessary before feeding this to a machine learning model okay so now let's understand how many rows and columns does this data set have number of rows and column okay so let's mention the diabetes data dot shape so this shape function will give us the number of rows and columns it has okay so we shouldn't mention the parenthesis so, okay so diabetes so totally we have 768 values 768 data points and nine features or nine columns you can count the columns here so 716 means we have data for 768 different persons okay so that is about this uh, shape so this tells us what is the length of our data set and how many features we have okay so there are also some other you know uh, measures that we can get about this data say for example when you put this diabetes dot describe diabetes data set okay so diabetes data set dot describe so it will give us some statistical measures about the data so diabetes data set is not different okay so we need some okay so it's diabetes data i made a mistake in the data frame name 
okay so it gives us the statistical measure so what is the count what is the mean of each of this column what is the standard deviation minimum value percentile values maximum values etc okay so these parts come under data analysis and we won't be you know dealing much with data analysis in this particular video so our goal in this video is to uh, you know know how to process this data okay so the next step is to split this data set into um, uh, what should I say to features and target here these uh, six columns sorry this eight columns are features and this particular column is called as target so our column of interest so we are using our model to predict this column right this outcome column so this becomes our target column and others are feature columns okay so now we need to separate this features from this uh, target value okay so I just make a text here as separating features and target okay so i'll create two variables x and y so i'll be storing all the values except outcome in x and i'll be storing the outcome value in y okay so for this we need to mention the data frame name which is diabetes data and inside that so sorry so we need to use the function drop diabetes uh, data dot drop so this will drop either columns or rows so we need to drop a column here so here the column which we want to drop is this outcome column so mention it inside this quotes so outcome okay so and we need to we also need to mention axis so axis is equal to one so when we are dropping a column we need to mention axis axis is equal to one and if we are dropping a row we need to mention axis is equal to one okay sorry zero so one for a column and zero for a row now y so we need to store all the outcome variable in y so diabetes data and inside it we, let's mention outcome okay so let's run this now you can print x and y separately okay so let's print x okay so now you can see here it doesn't have this uh, outcome column here and now you can print y so print y when I print Y, we can see that it has the outcome column label. So here, so let me uh, put this here as, okay, so let us put this. Zero represents that that specific person is non-diabetic. So you can find this data set and the details of this data set in Kaggle. So just search as diabetes data set Kaggle in Google. So it will show you the website. So uh, if the label is zero, that means that person is non-diabetic okay and for label one we need to mention that the person is diabetic okay so so we have successfully splitted our features and our target okay so the next important thing to do is so you can see the data so the pregnancies the value of the pregnancies is in the range of one uh, you know it's a six eight okay so it's uh, within this one and ten range whereas the glucose level is in in hundreds okay so it's in hundreds eighties etc Whereas the blood pressure is in 60s, 40s and 70s and skin thickness is around in 20s and 30s and insulin values is, you know, there are few zeros here and we have uh, 94, 168, BMA is around 20s and 30s and this particular diabetes pedigree function is in point, uh, you know, it, it's in decimal and uh, this age is in a different range, right? So what we are going to do is we are going to standardize this data. So data standardization is all about transforming all these values in a common range. Okay, so for this purpose, we will be using a standard scalar function so when we run this standard scalar function on this data so it will uh, transform all the values to a common range okay but it, it retains the meaning the data has to tell okay so this is for our machine learning model to understand this data better and to make better predictions okay so now we are going to standardize our data so the next part is about data standardization and here i need to tell one important thing so few people suggest you know to uh, standardize the data before splitting it to x and y so before splitting the features and target um, okay okay no so what happens is a uh, few people suggest to standardize the data before splitting the data into training and testing data whereas some people uh, you know suggest to split the data after splitting uh, training data and testing data so i have explained you here right so so it's not features and target so i have uh, i made a mistake so it's not about features and target so it is about splitting it into training data and testing data so some people would like to split the data 
sorry standardize the data before splitting it to training and testing data where while some others you know prefer uh, the other way around okay so in my opinion so what i do is so i standardize the data before splitting them into training and testing data because it it then retains the original range of the data set okay so if we split it before then it can uh, you know lose some data so it becomes a problem at that point okay so both cases have their own pros and cons so this is my method of doing it okay so now we are going to standardize our data so i'll just create a variable as scalar so scalar is equal to standard scalar and let's run this so this will load this standard scalar function into this scalar variable now we are going to do scalar dot fit transform so what happens is so fit transform x so we are going to transform all these features right so we don't need to change this because it's already in either one or zero so this is in label so we we need not change this so we but we need to change this x values so what i'm going to do is i'm going to fit all these values in this standard scalar function and transform them so once we do this all this data will be in a similar range okay so let's run this okay so now you can see the data here so what what's the range it is in so it is all them all of them are in you know in decimals it's uh, in the range of minus one to plus one okay so they will be in a common range so you can also print this data set as print standardized data okay so sorry so we need to mention a variable for this also so what i'll do is i'll store this transformed data into standardized data okay so what i'm doing is i'm transforming all of this x and i'm storing it in this uh, variable called as standardized data okay so let's see okay so now we can print this standardized data and we can see here all the data are in a common range now okay so now we can uh, proceed our further uh, processing so now what we will do is i'll again store all of this standardized data in x and uh, in the targets in y okay so let's put x is equal to standardized data okay x is equal to let's run this now again you can print x and y and see so x will be our features but it is uh, standardized and now you can print your y so we have already stored all the values of this label in y okay so the outcome column in y okay so now what we will be doing before feeding to machine learning algorithm is splitting the data into training data and testing data and for this we will be using this train test split function okay so this step is about splitting the data set into training data and testing data okay so for this we need to create four arrays so this particular step is common for all the projects which we do so we need to create four arrays as x train x test and y train and y test so now we are going to use train test split function so i'll just explain you what is meant by this after running this so we are going to split x and y and let's mention test size how much data we want as testing data so let's put test data is equal to 0.2 and random state so random state is equal to 2 okay so what we are doing is so we will be splitting our data into training data and testing data where x train is our training data features and the corresponding labels the corresponding outcome for our training data features are stored in y train okay so this is x train is uh, this particular x will be all these features will be uh, split into x train and uh, x test okay and the corresponding labels for x train this y value so this corresponding y value will be stored in y train and the corresponding labels for this x test will be stored in y test okay so that's why we need four arrays and here we are using this train test split function which we have imported from sklearn.model selection and in this parameters we need to mention x and y where x and y are those features and targets which we have already splitted and the second parameter is about test size how much data we want as test size so here i have mentioned mentioned point two so point two means 
20 percentage of data so generally we take 10 to 20 percentage of data as our test data and the 80 percentage of data as training data and then we have this random state is equal to 2 okay so random state means uh, if you mention random state is equal to 3 then your data will be split in a different manner so when i mention 2 my data will be split in a different manner if in case you are let's say that you are practicing this code and you want your code to split the data in the same way that my code is splitting then we need we both need to give the same random state number so this is for this okay so it is like a serial number or index for similar splitting of data so let's run this so this will create four arrays and you can print the shape of each of this x dot shape so x is nothing but the original data before splitting and x train so x train is the training data features and x test x test is testing data features dot shape okay so let's find how many data points are there for each of this case so okay so now you can see here the total data points are 768 out of this 80 percentage of data which is 6, 614 data points are stored in this x train whereas 20 percentage of data which is 154 are stored in uh, x test okay so this is how you can split your data into training data and testing data so this is about data pre-processing of a numerical data set so th this is a pretty uh, you know uh, a easier data set a simple data set so we don't have uh, you know any other uh, big works here so in some cases if we have some missing values we need to handle those missing values and other kind of things so i have mentioned about all of these procedures uh, in this particular playlist okay so i'll give the link for this playlist in the description of this video and after this we can feed this uh, training data to our machine learning model so that it can learn from it so i have already made a project video on this diabetes prediction so in my channel so you can go to the machine learning project playlist in my channel where you can find this particular project okay so that's it about this data and about this uh, video and i hope you have understood about how we need to do this data pre-processing techniques on a data set okay so that's it for this video and in the next video i'll explain you how we can do these data pre-processing steps in a text data okay this text data is kind of more complex and you know complicated when compared to numerical data because we need to convert all those text data into numerical values and there are a lot of processing that we need to do so it is an interesting video so that will video will be posted coming on day okay so that's it from my side i'll see you in the next video thank you hello everyone this is siddharthan this is the last video in our data collection and data pre-processing module in the previous video we have discussed what are the data pre-processing steps that we need to do on numerical data set and in this video we will be taking a textual data and see what are the data pre-processing steps that we need to do before feeding it to a machine learning model for predictions okay so in case you are watching my videos for the first time i this is siddharthan and in this channel i'm making a hands-on machine learning course with python so you can uh, check out the details in the description of this video i'll give the details about my machine learning course and my machine learning project so i will be uploading one machine learning project video uh, every friday okay so you can find all the details and the link for the playlist in the description of this video okay so with that being said let's get started with today's video and for this video we will be taking this fake news prediction data set okay so i have already posted a video on this fake news prediction and if you have watched that video so you don't need to watch this video because it's basically the same procedure okay so in case you haven't watched it or you want a better understanding of all the data pre-processing that we do on that text data so you can continue watching this video okay so now the first step is to upload our data set into this google collab environment okay so you can uh, search for google collab so if you are not aware of this so when you search for google collab so you will find this collab.research.google.com so, so there you can do your python programs okay so it is a cloud-based python uh, environment so there will be this connect option so you can connect your system from here so you can find this files option here files option here so there you can go to this upload option uh, to upload your data set file so now the data set which we are going to use is is about 100 mb in size and if we upload this data set it can take some time so what we need to do is so we can upload this data set in our google drive okay so then you can go to this uh, mount drive options okay so when you give this mount drive your google drive will be linked to your google collaboratory account and the important thing is both this account so this account in your google drive and uh, in google collaboratory should be the same account okay so in some cases we may be dealing with data sets that is about 1 gb 2 gb or even 10 gb in size so in that cases we cannot upload our data set every time we uh, open it in our google collab okay so in such cases we upload it to our google drive 
and process it from Google Collaborate. So that's what we are going to do now. I have already uploaded my fake news data set in uh, my drive. So I'll give the link for this data set file in the description of my video. So you can also find it in uh, Kaggle. So I'll give this mount drive. So while mounting, so okay, so connect to Google Drive. So now you need to, uh, it will ask for your account. So there you need to authorize it. So once you authorize your account, it will mount your drive. Okay, so this is our drive. So when you click this uh, arrow here, it will give all the subfolders in it. So I'll go to my drive and there you can see uh, all the uh, all the folders I have. So I have stored this data set in this data sets folder. So you can see here my drive data sets and fake news data set. So I'll go here and this is my data set train.csv. So this is a CSV file. So from here we can access this data set instead of uploading it every time in our Google Collab and uploading in google drive actually it takes very less time when compared to google uh, collab okay so the first step is to import the dependencies so i'll make a text here as importing the dependencies okay so the pre-processing of text data is more challenging and interesting than numerical data because there are a lot of steps which we need to do here because computers doesn't understand understand text well so we need to convert this text into some meaningful numbers some numerical data okay so these are the processing which we will be doing for this text data so let me import some basic libraries so i'll import numpy as np so we generally import numpy and other libraries in their short forms so instead of using numpy we can use uh, in in the for in a short form as np so that's the general convention everyone uses in python okay so now let's import pandas pandas as pd then i'll import another library called as re so re means it's regular expression so you can just uh, search in google about uh, um, regular expression library in python so you will find the documentation so it is very useful for uh, scanning and going through some text in the documents so this is called as a regular expression library numpy library is used for making arrays and pandas is for making data frames so data frames are nothing but structured tables so as we know that the data set is now in a csv file so csv means comma separated value and it is not easy to analyze the data from a csv file okay so to give it a better structure we will feed it to a pandas data frame so we have uploaded three libraries and now we need from nltk so nltk dot corpus import so from this particular library i'm importing a function so import stop words so i'll explain you what is meant by this stop words and other things when we uh, encounter this in this particular video so corpus means uh, some text uh, content so a corpus may uh, can be a paragraph or it can be a document which contains all those words okay so it's basically uh, the collection of words and nltk means natural language toolkit so this natural language toolkit library contains several functions and important uh, you know methods that we use for our text processing and now let's import from nltk dot stem dot portal stem dot portal import port stemmer okay so it's portal stemmer so then from sklearn dot Reprocessing, sorry, so from sklearn dot feature extraction import extraction, so it should be feature extraction dot text import tf idf vectorizer. So we have already made a video on what is meant by this vectorization, what is meant by this feature extraction, and tf idf vectorizer. I'll also explain you in this video what are these things and uh, from sklearn dot model selection import train test split okay so these are the dependencies we need for this particular processing and now we need to download these stop words so it's also import 
general dk separately so import nl tk so this nl tk is the library and we are uh, importing this entire library in this particular line whereas in this line from this uh, you know library there is a separate module called as corpus and that contains a function called as stopwatch so we can also uh, import specific functions we need from a library whereas in this particular case we are importing the entire library so that's the difference between importing this nl tk and uh, like this okay so that's the difference now we need to download nl tk dot download top words so let's run this to run a cell and go to the next one you can oh, i need to run this first okay so to run a particular cell and go to the next one you can press shift plus enter so this will uh, download all the uh, stop words. so it is already uh, i think it's downloaded now we can print this uh, stop words. Printing the stop words. So I'll show you what are these stop words. Print stop words dot words. English. So now we can see all the the list of stop words so these words are nothing but i me my myself we are ours etc so we have a lot of stop words so stop words are those words which can be repeated a lot of times in a paragraph or in a document okay but these words doesn't convey much meaning so these words are stop words so when we do this uh, data pre-processing we always encounter a lot of data a huge amount of data and these words doesn't convey much meaning so we need to remove these words from our uh, data set so for this purpose we need to uh, download these stoppers to identify these words from our data set so that's the purpose of uh, downloading these stoppers and the next step is uh, now we can go to the data pre-processing step so i'll make a text here as data pre-processing So the first step is to load our data set into a pandas data frame. So as I have told you earlier, we cannot access it easily from a CSV file. So I'm going to load the data to a pandas data frame. So let me create a variable called as news data set. Okay, so let me put it as news data and I'm going to use the function pd.readcsv. So this read CSV function is present in pandas library and this read CSV function will load the data set from a CSV file to a pandas data frame. So you can go to this files and uh, you can see this options here. So from there you can copy the path of this file and paste it in the quotes. Now you can run this and this will create a new data frame which contains this entire data set. So now let me print the first five rows of the data set here. So I make a comment here as first five rows of the data set. So it is always a good practice to mention uh, what you are doing in a line of code by these commands. So if someone else, you know, uh, sees your code, then it helps them to understand what you are doing in a in a line of code. So that's the importance of commenting. So I'll mention this data frame name as news data dot yet. So this yet function will print the first five rows of the data frame. So uh, we have this ID column, title column, author column, text column and label column. OK, so this is the title of the news. And here we have the author name of that particular news and what is the text entire text of that news and finally we have this label here uh, these are uh, if if the label is zero, that means then the news is a real news. And if the label is one, then the news is a fake news and uh, the idea behind this data set is to train a machine learning model to let it understand which news are fake and which news can be you know real and this label helps, helps the model to understand it so i'll just make a text here as zero means real news and one means fake news okay so now let's see how many total data points we have so news data dot shape so this will tell us the number of rows and columns present in the data set 
So totally we have 20,800 rows and 5 columns. So these are the columns, right? ID, title, author, text, label, etc. And totally we have 20,800 rows. So 20,800 rows means so we have that many different users. So we also call this as data point. So each of this uh, particular row represents a data point or a separate news. Okay. So totally we have these many uh, data points. So it is a pretty large data set but it is not the largest we may also deal with you know hundreds of thousands of datas and even more than that so here we have 20,000 data which is uh, very good so if your data set is large then you can make better predictions with your model okay so the more the data the better your performance performance of the model is so now let's see if this data set contains any missing values so checking for checking for missing values news data set news data dot is null dot sum so this function will give us the number of missing values in each column so in this id column we don't have any uh, missing values in title column we have about 558 uh, missing values in author it's about uh, 1957 text and it is 39 okay so what this is so there can be few news news and the author can be anonymous or the curator of this data set may not have found the author name so in that cases uh we have this null values or those missing values okay so in this particular case we can replace all the missing values with null string so if a value is missing it will be represented as nan so nan means not a number okay so we need to replace this nan with null string so in in case of numerical data set we can impute it with mean value or mode value so we cannot find the mean value for this text data set right so in this case we will replace all the missing value with a null string so let me put it here we are replacing the missing values with null string and news data which is equal to use data dot fill in a and let's mention quotes here okay. so here fill in a means uh not in a means not available and uh what we are doing is so here i have mentioned quotes so in this quotes if we if i mention uh, some words like let's say i mention a word like tree so what happens is all the missing values will be replaced with this word tree when i don't mention any words inside this uh quotes then it is called as a null string so it is a string but it doesn't contain any text or value so i want to replace all the missing values all the nan values with this null string so if you just uh, you know feed this uh data set which contains this NAN value to our machine learning model it can throw some error so it doesn't understand those NAN values so now we need to replace this with uh, this null string so let's run this okay so this will replace all of them now uh, what we are going to do this do is in this particular prediction we are going to take this title column and author column so we won't be uh, taking this text column so we will be analyzing our data set only with these two features so what i'm going to do is i'm going to combine this values in this author column to their corresponding title column so what happens is if we take this first row we will create a separate column and in that column it contains author name plus the title of their users and the second row contains their uh, the author name and the corresponding title so now let's merge the author name and news title okay so i'll mention the data frame and in this let's create a new uh, column called as content in this content let's combine the author name and title of the news so which is equal to news data author So just one quote here. So okay, author plus news data, and now let's mention title. Okay, so what we are doing is we are uh, creating a new uh, column called as content in this data set in this data frame. So we have named this data frame as news data. So we are creating a new column and in that column we are taking this uh, author column 
and we are just giving a space and combining it with this uh, the title of uh, that particular news so let's run this and now you can uh, again print the first five rows of the data frame now let's see what is this content column looks like okay so now there is this new column called as content and it contains the author name first and the title of the news in each of the rows okay so and now we are going to use this content column for further processing and now we will do this text processing on this particular column and not the other things okay so now let us separate the two important columns so here we need this content column and this label column okay so we don't need any other column so because we have already combined these two so i'm not going to uh, make prediction based on this text if you want to make uh, your prediction based on this text you can add this text column with this author and title column but it will take a long time because this data is very huge so that's why i'm taking this author and title alone so now let's separate this content and label so separating feature and target here the target is this label so the target is nothing but whether we are predicting whether it's real or fake so this is called as target and here the feature is nothing but this content column because our model is going to understand this features and it's going to predict the target as label one or zero or other things okay so now let's put uh, two variables as x and y and in x let me mention news data set dot drop um, columns so i'm going to drop a column here label so let us drop this particular uh, label column and now we need to mention axis axis is equal to one so here we are dropping a column so we are mentioning the axis is equal to one in case you are dropping a row we will be mentioning axis is equal to zero so now we are going to store this label column in y so news data label okay so now you can print x and y so this x doesn't contain labels when you print this why it will contain all the labels and now we can uh, do our processing on this x so why doesn't need any processing because it already is in the form of numerical values in the form of uh, labels now we are going to do an important uh, step here so this process is called as stemming okay so stemming is nothing but i'll mention what is meant by stemming here stemming is the process of reducing a word to its keyword okay so what is meant by this keyword let's say that there are words like uh, enjoyable enjoyment and uh, the uh, enjoying and enjoyed so these words are there and the root word for all of these words are nothing but enjoy so this enjoy can be represented in uh, different forms so we don't want all those different forms so what we do is if we have those kind of words it will be reduced to a uh, you know its root word because root words are small and the processing can take place in a, a faster uh, time and the processing is you know more easier when you uh, you know reduce it to a root word so root word or keyword so let me put it as root word instead of keyword and for this purpose only we are going to use the porter stemmer function here so we are going to do this stemming function using this porter stemmer and we have imported this porter stemmer from nltk.stem.porter okay so let's create a variable called as port stem and in this port stem i'll load this porter stemmer function okay let's run this so this will load this port stemmer function to this port stem variable so it is just uh, you know loading one instance of this function to a new variable so let's run this okay so now let's create a function to do this stemming procedure so let's create this function and name this as stemming and in this stemming we need to give this content column right so let's give this parameter name as content okay 
So now we need to do some functions in this uh, particular thing and let's name variable as stemmed content. So what we are going to do is stem uh, all of this text and put it in a variable called as stemmed content and this stemmed content is equal to re dot sub. So, so you can see here this regular expression as I have told you this is useful for you know uh, going through the text in a particular paragraph or a document. Just one second. Okay, so now we need to mention this re dot sub so you can see the purpose of this particular function. So this is for define. So now let me mention um, a to z a to z and caps a to z. Mm. So I'll explain you what I'm doing once I complete this line of code. Okay, so I want to, uh, you know, go through all the content. So all the text in this particular content column and take all the words from A to Z. So if the word is in this particular range, it will take it. So all the values or all the things that are words, nothing but, you know, so the purpose of this is I want to remove all the punctuations like comma, you know, full stop on the other things. So that's why we are mentioning that I want all the content which is in the form of words. So that's why we are mentioning, uh, you know, small letter words or capital letters. So that's what we are doing is so it's either lowercase or in upper cases. So the other things are, you know, uh, you know, they doesn't represent a word. So I want all the words that are uh, not punctuations and other things, other numbers. So now the next step is to convert all the words to lowercase letters. So all the uppercase, higher case letters will be converted to a lowercase letter and stemmed content. So it's the same stemmed content variable. So all this uh, letters will be changed to a lower letter form. So again, mention the stemmed content. dot lower so this functions lower functions are, are present in this uh, regular expression library so and now stemmed content we need to separate all the words to do further processing for that we need to split all these words so stemmed contents is equal to stemmed content dot split so this will split all the words and now stemmed content so now let's do this stemming procedure stemmed content is equal to so you can see here we have imported this potter stemmer function in this potter stem variable so i'll mention it here port stem and in brackets let's mention word and now i'm going to create a for loop I'll explain you in a minute what we are doing in this particular line of code for word in stemmed content if not word in top words dot words English okay so what we are doing is so i'm going to apply this stemming function to all the words present in this uh, content column so we are taking all the words we are uh, you know excluding all the punctuation marks and other things we are just taking all the words and we are converting all it, all of them to a lowercase letters and then we are splitting each of the words and now we are going to apply this uh, stem function to those words if that word is not present in this stop words so you can see here we have downloaded this stop words right so i will be taking each of the words in this content uh, column and if it is a stop words we don't want that so we want all the words that are not present in the stop words so basically we are removing all the stop words from this column and uh, when we take all of those words we are applying stemming so we are converting those words to a root word so what happens is so let's say that uh, so you can consider this first line so it, it contains this v so the v v is uh, an example for stop words so this particular word won't be considered and it will be removed for all the rows so all the uh, 
you know stop words will be removed and uh, now we can have the words like truth and uh, as i have told you earlier so let's say that there is a word called as uh, enjoyment so that word will be taken and it will be com- converted to its root word so that's what we are doing so we are taking all the words and if that word is not present in that stop words we are applying this uh, stemming function so that's what we are doing in this particular function called as stemming and finally let's return this stem so whenever you are working on a function so this diff is used for its uh, def means define so we are defining this function particular function and once this all of the you know procedures in this function is carried out we need to return this stemmed content so return stemmed content okay so now we have created a function so we didn't apply this function to our data set yet so we haven't applied to this uh, data set yet now we need to apply this to our data set so let's run this function again so it won't do anything so now we need to apply this stemming function to our content column okay so let's mention this news data content which is equal to use data content dot apply stemming okay so what we are doing is we are taking this uh, particular content column in our data frame and in that we are applying this stemming function so let's run this so it might take some time okay so this object is not callable so for testing so i think we have made a mistake here mm, let me see what is that okay so it's nothing but so in this we need a function called as pot stem dot stem okay so this pot stem dot stem function only uh, does the stemming procedure so let's run this again okay so this is running so this will uh, stem all the words to its corresponding root words and this might take some time because this data set is very huge okay so it may take a minute or two so once we apply this stemming function so we have uh, you know the important text data and once we have those important text data we can convert this text data to a numerical value so what we do is we use a method called as feature extraction and in that we will convert all this uh, text to a feature vectors okay so let me pass this video until it's run okay so it took about three to four minutes so now i'm going to print this um news data set dot content so let's see whether this stemming has happened here so you can compare this particular uh, stemmed content to the content which we originally add okay so all this words has been splitted okay and uh, and all the uh, stemming has been applied to uh, you know reduce it to its co- uh, corresponding root words so now we can separate the data to their uh, corresponding features and targets so i'll create two variables as sorry as x and y and in x i'm going to take this news data set dot content and in y okay so dot values and let's take all the labels in y so news data set label values So these are the two things which we need. So news data set. Okay, so it's news data. So these are the two things which we need here. X is the feature and Y is the corresponding label. So you can print this X and Y separately to see what are them. So this is X and let's print Y as well. Okay. So the y is nothing but uh, it's either one or zero. So now let's uh, print the shape of y. So y dot shape.
okay so we should mention this parenthesis y dot shape 20800 now we can apply the feature extraction so now we are going to convert all these uh, words to uh, their corresponding feature vectors so converting the textual data to feature vectors So if you remember, we have imported this tf uh, idf vectorizer and we are going to use this particular function. Vectorizer is equal to, so let's load this tf idf vectorizer function to this vectorizer variable and vectorizer dot fit. So we are fitting this, fitting all uh, the data, this content to this particular vectorizer function. So we are going to transform this x. Okay, so first we need to fit the x and now we need to transform it. Eraser dot transform x. Okay, so we are uh, fitting it. So it now understand what are these words. And now this vectorizer can transform all the words to their corresponding feature vectors. So this TF represents term frequency and IDF represents inverse document frequency. So it finds uh, the words which are repeated a lot of time and it assigns some importance of values to it. So by this it understands if a word is you know meaningful or not. So let's say that we are uh, you know predicting whether a mail is a real, a real mail, a normal mail or a spam mail. So spam mails contains the words like uh, offer, free, discounts, etc. So when you apply this kind of TF IDF vectorizer to this, to those data sets, it can uh, identify that those words are repeated in spam mails. And this will help our model to understand what mails are spam mail and which mails are uh, normal mails. So let's run this. Okay, so let's stop object, no attribute lower. Okay, so what happened is I have missed one line of code here. So once we apply this stemming function, so we need to join all those words. So all the words in uh, this particular line uh, will be combined together. So before, if we have seen the output will be like all these words will be separated by commas and they will be enclosed in list. list. So it, it shouldn't happen. So we need to join all the words in one line. So we need to use this dot join function. Okay, dot stem content. So I have, uh, you know, included this particular line of code and uh, rerun all the things here. So this is the mistake that we have did in this particular line. So now we can run this vectorizer function and see whether it is working or not. Okay, so it has, I think it has uh, worked properly. Now let's print X and see whether it has converted all this text data to feature vectors. Now we can see here it contains a lot of numbers. So these are the feature vectors for all those corresponding words. So when you have printed this X before, so we have all these words, right? So now you can see this X, it has converted to uh, numbers. So each of these words has their corresponding uh, numerical values. So this is how you can apply this uh, vectorizer functions. So the next step will be to uh, split your data set into training data and testing data and once you split your data into training data and testing data you can feed it to your machine learning model so this is about data pre-processing of text data so this is the general procedure which we follow but it is all you know there are few things that may change depending on other data sets but it is the general procedure so if you want to know further about how to split this data into training and test data and how to do further predictions you can go to the machine learning project playlist uh, in my channel and there in the fifth project is about fake news prediction and there you will uh, find how to feed this data to a machine learning model and make predictions. So I hope you have understood uh, all the contents that we have discussed in this video. I'll see you in the next video. Thanks. Rock versus mine prediction using Sona data. Okay, so we will do all the programming in Python and you don't need to install any Python software. So we will be using Google Collaboratory. So Google Collaboratory is a cloud based system where you can write your Python script. So you just need Google Chrome for it. So I'll show you how you can access it later in this video. First of all, let's try to understand more about this uh, use case. Consider there is a submarine, okay? So there is a war going on between two countries. So uh, submarine of a country is going in, uh, you know, underwater to another country and uh, the enemy country have planted some mines in the ocean, okay? So mines are nothing but the explosives that explodes when some object comes in contact with it, right? So 
there can also be rocks in the ocean so the submarine needs to predict whether it is crossing a mine or a rock okay so our job is to make a system that can predict whether the object beneath the submarine is a mine or a rock okay so how this is done is the submarine sends a sonar signal okay sorry a sonar uses a sonar that sends sound signals and receives it back so this signal is then processed to detect whether the object is a mine or it's just a rock in the ocean okay so let's try to understand how we are going to do this first of all let's see the workflow for this project first of all we need to uh, collect the sonar data okay so how this data is collected so what happens is in the laboratory setup an experiment can be done where the sonar is used to send and receive signals bounced back from a metal cylinder and some rocks okay so because the mines will be made of metals right so we collect this data which is nothing but the sonar data which is which we obtained from a rock and a metal cylinder okay and we use this sonar data and we feed this sonar data to our machine learning model and then our machine learning model can predict whether the object is made of metal or it is just a rock so this is the principle we are going to use in our uh, prediction okay so first we need to collect the data okay so once we have the data we will process the data so we cannot use the data directly so we need to pre-process the data so there are a various steps in that which we will do in this video so we need to analyze the data so we need to understand more about it so once we process the data we will split it into training and test data okay so why we are splitting the training and test data because so let's say there are 100 examples so 100 instance of data we will train our machine learning model with 90 uh, you know instances and we will test our uh, machine learning model so we evaluate our model with another 10 data points okay so there are totally 10 uh, 100 data points we may use 90 data points for training and we can use another 10 or 20 data for testing our model okay so once we split our data into training and test data we feed it to our machine learning model so in this video in this use case we are going to use a logistic regression model because logistic regression works really well for binary classification problem so this problem is a binary classification problem because we are going to predict whether the object is a rock or a mine okay so we'll be using a logistic regression model and this is a supervised learning algorithm okay so once we uh, train our machine learning model with the training data we will get a trained logistic regression model so this model has learned from the data on how a metal cylinder will be and how a rock will be so this model can recognize it based on the sonar data now when we give a new data it can predict whether the object is just a rock or it is a mine so this is the workflow we will be uh, following in python to make this uh, you know script for this use case okay so now let's go into the coding part so before that i'll show you the data we have okay so this is the data sonar data.csv so it is in a csv file so you can find this data in Kaggle and other data sites like uh, UCA machine learning repositories and other sites. So I will be giving the link for this file in the description of this video. Let's try to look at this video, uh, sorry, in this uh, data set. So as you can see here, there are a lot of numbers. Let's, so there are a lot of columns. So let's see there are how many instances. So there will be almost 200 examples. So as you can see here, there are 208 examples. That means 208 data points so on the in the last column we have something that tells you know r and m okay so r represents the values for rock and m represents the values of mines okay so as i told you earlier this values are obtained in a laboratory setup where the sonar data is collected for a metal cylinder and for a rock so as you can see here there are several features so features represents the columns of this data set so we feed this data set to our machine learning model and it can learn from this data on how a rock can be and or how a mine can be with the help of this sonar data okay so let's see how we can make this python script so i'll close this so as i told earlier we will be doing our programming in google collaboratory so search for google collab So this is the website for it. So collab.research.google.com.
okay so you just need to choose new notebook here so this google collaboratory will be linked to your google drive account so if you have any collaboratory files so it will show up here so i'm going to use a new notebook so these are nothing but uh, python notebooks as you may have uh, noticed this in jupyter notebooks so it has, it has an extension of ipynb so it is just like uh, jupyter notebooks so as you can see here it is a dot pynb file which is known as python notebooks so i'll change this file name as rock versus mine prediction okay now you can see this connect button here so go ahead and connect this so what happens is our runtime gets connected to a google server so it is completely free google collaboratory is completely free so you you will be allocated a system of a uh, very good storage size and very good ram so as you can see here so we have 12 gb of ram and uh, 107 gb of storage which is really good so it is better than most of our systems so we will be doing all our programming in google collaboratory okay okay so as you can see here this is called as a cell so we will write our python scripts in this cells so as you can see here you can give this code option to create another cell so if you give this text you can write some comments or a description about your code okay so I will tell about the features of this Google Collab once you know we use it for different purposes. So, so as you can see here, this is where we will upload our data files. So I have already shown the Sonar data file for you. So how you can upload is, so you can click this folder option here. So there, either you can choose this, so it is to upload a particular file, or you can right click here and click upload. So I'll upload the sonar data. Okay. So it is a very small data file. So you can find it in Kaggle or UCI machine learning repository. Okay. So as I told here, our agenda here is to predict whether the object is a mine or a rock using the sonar data. So First of all, we need to import the libraries we want. So import the dependencies. So we will require several functions and libraries for this. So I'll write a comment here. So as I told you, told you earlier, so this is for uh, writing description and comment about your code. So I'll just type importing the dependencies. Okay. So you can press enter or you can press, press shift plus enter to complete it and go to the next cell. Okay. So once you write a Python script, you can click here to run your code or you can press uh, shift plus enter to run this code and go to the next cell. Okay. So first we need to import some libraries. So we will require numpy for this. So I'll import numpy as mp. So import numpy as mp and we also need pandas. So import pandas as pd okay so numpy is basically for uh, you know for arrays and pandas is for uh, several data uh, processing steps so we will see about that later now we need uh, train test split okay so we have seen earlier that we need to split our data into training data and test data so we will, we will require a function for that so from sklearn dot model selection Input train test split. Okay, so this function is used to split our data into training and the test data. So we don't need to do it manually. Okay, so then we need our logistic regression model. So sklearn is a very good uh, Python library for machine learning algorithms and other functions. So we will encounter it in various different uh, places here. There is a small mistake here. So sklearn dot model selection so import train test split now we need to import our logistic regression model so sklearn dot linear model so this is how you can import logistic regression so input logistic regression and we need 
the function accuracy score. So from SK learn dot matrix input accuracy score so this is used to find the accuracy of our model okay so these are the libraries and functions we need so first we import numpy so numpy is used for creating numpy arrays so and pandas so pandas is used for uh, loading our data uh, loading our data and numbers into a uh, good table so uh, these tables are called as data frames so we will discuss about this uh, that in a later point so then we have a uh, train test, test split so we import it from the library sklearn then we have imported the logistic regression model. Then we have imported the function accuracy score. So you can press shift plus enter to run this cell and go to the next cell. Okay. So if you have any printing output, it will show here. Okay. Now let's do the data collection and processing steps. So I'll just put a text here. Data collection and data processing. Okay, so we already uploaded the data. There are several methods to you know upload data in Google Collaboratory. We can uh, upload the data straight to Collaboratory using some APIs. So we can do it with Kaggle APIs. So we will uh, discuss about it in some other project video. So as you can see here, we have the Sona data file here. So now we need to import this Sona data into a Pandas data frame. Okay, so I'll make a comment. So in Python, if you write something uh, prefixed by hash you can comment it so loading the data set to a pandas data frame so i'll create a variable called as sonar data i will be loading this uh, data to a data frame and i have named this data frame as sonar data so as you can see here i have imported pandas as pd so this is just like an abbreviation so i'll be using this abbreviation so pd dot read csv so as you uh, as i have uh, told you earlier we have the data file as a csv file so we need to use the function read csv okay so now we need to mention the name of the file name and the location of the file so you can do it by you can go here and click here so there you will see this option called as copy path so this will copy the path and name of the file so we have to enclose it in quotes and put it in this brackets then so as you can see here we don't have a header file for this so as you can see here we don't have any header file so header files means a name for the columns right so there is no header file so we need to mention in our uh, pandas data frame that there is no header so header is equal to none so i'll press shift plus enter and this loads our data to a pandas data frame okay now let's uh, have a small look at our data set so i'll just type sonar data dot yet so what this function it does is it displays the first five uh, rows of our data set okay so i'll run this so as you can see here we have uh, first five rows of our data set and there are several columns so as you can see here there are 59 columns but actually it's 60 column because in python the indexing starts from zero so totally we have uh, 61 columns and 59 columns we have 59 features and we have in the last last column we have uh, r or m so i have shown you right it's either rock or mine so it is that categorical value so this is the use of this get function it tries to you know it prints the first five rows of our data set now what we will do is let's try to see how many rows and columns are there so number of rows and columns so if you if you are not uh, you know uh, if you don't understand any functions you can just search in google about let's see so you want to know what this read csv function does so you just can go to the pandas uh, documentation so pandas dot read csv so this is the 
Panda's official documentation page. So you can go here. So you will. Uh, so you can see the use of this uh, particular function here. So as you can see, it read a comma separated value CSV file into a data frame. It supports optional iterating or breaking the file into chunks. So you can do this for any functions. So in order to uh, learn what this function actually does. So these are the parameters. So we don't need all these parameters. So in our case, we have used only two parameters, which are the path of the file. And we have included that there is no header. OK, so if you have any doubt about any function, you can search it in Google like this. OK, so now we need to find the number of rows and columns. So we can use it. You can we can find it by using the function called as shape. So sonar data dot shape. So this gives us how many uh, rows and columns are there. So totally we have two not eight columns and uh, sorry two not eight rows and sixty one columns. The last sixty first column tells us whether it is a rock or a mine, and there are totally two not eight rows. So two not eight rows means there are two not eight instances or examples of data. OK, so and 61 represents the feature. So let's say for this zero 0th instance. So it is a value for one rock and there are 60 features for this one rock. And it is labeled as R. OK. So like this, there are 208 instances. Now what we will do is let's try to get some. Um, statistical definitions for this data. So sonar data dot describe. So this gives the mean standard deviation and other parameters for our data. Sorry, I just made a small mistake here. Sonar data dot describe. So as you can see here, it gives the count. So count represents the number of uh, instances we have for the zeroth column. So like this, we have uh, all the way up to 59th column. So it gives us the count. So the number of uh, values we have, the mean of this column, standard deviation for this column, minimum value 25th percentile, 58th percentile, 75th percentile. And what is the maximum value? So percentile means like 25% uh, of the values are less than this 0.0133 for first columns. And 50 percentile means 50% of the values are less than 0.022. So that is what percentile is. So for some use cases, uh, it is really important for us to find this mean and standard deviation. It, try, it it gives us a better understanding of the data. So hence you can use this describe function to get some statistical measures. So I'll just make a comment here. So describe gives statistical measures of the data. OK, now. Let's try to find how many examples are there for rock and how many examples are there for mines. OK, so we can do that by sonar data. Dot. Value counts. So this value counts function. Uh, gives us how many rock and how many mine examples are there. OK. So I have to include one more thing. So we just need to put a 60 here. The 60 is nothing but the column index. So as you can see here, the rock and mines are specified in the 60th column. So I'm specifying 60 in this value count. So value count uh, function. OK. So why I am using sonar data because I have loaded this data frame into a variable called as sonar data. So that's why I'm using this sonar data and uh, including the function with this. OK, so now let's see how many rock and mine examples are there. So as you can see here, there are totally 111 examples are there for mine and 97 examples are there for rock. So it is almost equal. So it is not a problem. So if we have uh, data for one type of instance more, let's say for example, if we have uh, 1000 examples for mine and we have only 500 examples for rock, then our prediction won't be very much good. OK, so if we have almost equal number of examples for both the two categories, so our prediction will be really good and we will get a, a very good accuracy score and our model performs well. OK, so it is almost uh, equal here. 
so actually uh, speaking so totally there are almost 298 uh, instances but this is not sufficient for a machine learning model so we may require even thousands and uh, several thousands of examples for making a better model but we are just looking at some examples so we are okay with this so you just need to note one thing more the data more accurate your model is okay so i'll just uh, represent here that m represents mine and r represents prop okay now let's try to group this data based on mine and rock so sonar data dot group by 60 dot mean so now i'll explain you what the what is the use of this so as you can see here so we got the mean value for all the columns for mine for a mine we have uh, the mean value for zeroth column as 0 0.034 but for rock it is 0 0.022 as you can see here there is quite a difference between these two so uh, this difference is really important for us because using this only we are going to predict whether the object is either a mine or a rock okay so we just found the mean for each of the 59 columns sorry 60 columns okay so the mean value for mine is these values and for rock is these values and there is a quite difference between them okay so this is really important for us now let's try to um, separate the data and the labels okay so here the data i mean the these numerical values so these are the features and the last column is the label so we need to separate this so we are going to do that let's see so i'll just make a comment here separating data and label so this is a supervised learning problem where we train our machine learning model with data and labels so in unsupervised learning we don't use labels so here we have labels which are nothing but rock and mine okay so let's put all the data in the variable x so sonar sonar data so i'm going to drop the last column 60th column so data dot drop columns is equal to 60 so i am dropping 60th column and if i am dropping a column i need to specify the axis as one so if i am dropping a row i will be specifying axis as zero okay and let's put the label in the variable y so sonar data so we need to use a square bracket here 60 okay so what i'm basically doing here is i'm storing all the values in x except the last column so i'm dropping the 60th column and i'm storing uh, storing the 60th column in y okay let's try to print and see this so print x and print y so as you can see here now there are only 59 columns so actually it's 60 column and it starts with zero and the last label is in the variable called as y so we have successfully splitted the data and the labels okay now what we will do is we will try to uh, split this data into training and test data okay so let's include a text here training and test data So as we have already uh, imported the function train test split, so we'll be using this function to split our data. Okay. So we need to give some variable names here. X train. So you can give any names here. So for convenient purpose, I'm giving this name. So X train X test. Y train the y test so this order should be followed so first we will take the training data and the test data then we will uh, take the labels of training data and labels of test data is equal to train test split and we have to include this x and y here so we are going to split this x and y into training and test data so x comma y so there are several parameters here so i'll explain you about that so x comma y test size 
which have the test size as 0.1 and stratify stratify is equal to y and random state is equal to let's say okay so now let's try to understand about these parameters so we are going to split our data into x train and x test y train and y test so x train is nothing but the training data for this and uh, x test is the testing data and y train is the label of those training data and y test is the label of the test data okay so now we are using the function train test split then we in the parameters we have included x and y so we are going to split this x and y into training and test data so here we have the parameter test size so test size like if we give 0.1 means we need 10 percentage of the data to be test data okay say for example we add uh, almost 200 examples so what happens is like 10 percentage of 200 is uh, 20 so we will have 20 test data so that is the use of this test size you can use 0 0.1 or 0 0.2 so based on uh, the number of data you have okay so here we will take just 10 percentage of uh, data string data stratify is equal to y so stratify why we are using this stratify is yes we need to split the data based on rock and mine say for example we need to have equal almost equal number of rocks in test data, training data and equal number of mines in the training data okay so hence we include this stratify so our data will be splitted based on the number of uh, these two rock and mine okay and then we have random state so random state is to split the data in a particular order say for example if you do the same code and in the code you include one your data will be splitted uh, you know in the same way as my data is splitted so if uh, i put two here so my data will be splitted in a specific way and if you include a two in your code it will also be splitted in the same way it is basically to reproduce the code as it is so i'll use one okay so now we can split our data okay now let's try to see how many uh, training data and text test data are there so print x dot shape so it is the original data without splitting into train and test and then we have x train dot shape and x test dot shape so i'll run this so as you can see here in the original uh, x we have 208 examples and uh, in the training data we have 187 instance and in the test data we have 21 instance okay so we have uh, 21 test data and 187 training data now we need to train our machine learning model with this ex train with this training data okay now let's see how we can train our model so model training so we will be using a logistic regression model So I'll create a variable called as model. So as you can see here, we have already imported the logistic regression function here. So model is equal to logistic regression. So this will load this uh, logistic regression function into the variable model. Now we are going to train the model. So training the logistic regression model with training data okay so for that we use the function model dot fit here we need to include the training data and training label okay which are x train and y train okay so let's see what is this x train and y train ones so that you can understand it so i am printing x train and also y train so this is the training data so x train is the training data and y train is the training label so as you can see here we have the data here so totally there are 187 examples and 60 columns and this is the label so as you can see here it is kind of random because we have used the training testing split okay 
So now we are going to feed this data, training data on this training data's label to our logistic regression model. So that's why I've included model.fit x train and y train. So when I run this, our model will be trained. So if you are having a lot of data and if you are using a complex model like a neural network, it will take a lot of time. So here we are seeing a simple example and simple data. So it doesn't take much time. Okay, so our model will be trained. So these are some parameters of our model. Now let's see how our model is predicting. So now let's check the accuracy score of our model. So now we are going to evaluate our model. So model evaluation. So we have imported the function accuracy score for it. So we will use this function to find the accuracy of our model. Accuracy on training data. So first let's find the accuracy on the training data. So what's happening here is, so we will use this same data, the data which the machine learning model has learned. So we will try to use this model to predict these examples. Okay. So then we will use the test data. Okay. So what is the significance here is, the model has already seen what is this test data, sorry, the training data, but it it haven't seen what is this test data, okay? It is just like preparing for an exam. Let's say you are uh, preparing uh, all the example problems in a mathematics book for your exam. So those example problems are nothing but the training data. So in the exam, a new problem will be asked and you need to solve that, but, uh, but you have never seen that question, right? So that is nothing but the test data. So we need to test our model for accuracy on training data and the accuracy on test data. So it is always, in most of the cases, the accuracy on training data will be more because the model has already seen uh, this training data and uh, most of the times the accuracy on test data will be less, okay? So if the accuracy of uh, your model is somewhere greater than 70%, it is, it, it is actually good. So, and it also depends on the amount of data you, you use. So as I have told earlier, so if you use, uh, you know, many data points and if you use a better model, you will get a good accuracy score. Okay. So if we use, uh, you know, quite less number of data as we have in this case, where we have only 200 data points, our accuracy can be low. Okay. So, but the idea of this, you know, uh, video is for you to understand how you can implement these steps. So the accuracy is not that much important, but we have to note here is, so any accuracy greater than 70 percentage is good. Okay. So now let's try to predict the training data. Let's train prediction. Is equal to model dot predict. Let's train. training data accuracy. So we will store this accuracy value in this variable training data accuracy. So training data accuracy is equal to accuracy score So this is the extreme prediction is the prediction our model makes okay based on uh, its learning. So we need to include the extreme prediction and all the correct values it is white ring so okay so what happens here is we are going to compare the we are going to get the accuracy score so extreme prediction is the prediction of our model and white train is the real answer of our answer of uh, this instances so as you know here so we have uh, we have this test data right so x test and y test is the label of this test data so now what happens is we are going to compare the prediction of our model and the original label of these data. Okay. By that we will get the accuracy score. So let's try to get the accuracy score for the training data. So I'll print the accuracy score. So accuracy on training data. So I'll copy this. So this will have the accuracy score here. Training data accuracy. 
So as you can see here, we got almost 83.4 percentage of accuracy. So it is actually kind of good for these many data. So now let's try to find the accuracy score of test data. Okay. So it's, it will be the same part except for some changes. We just need to include the test data here. So accuracy on test data. So X test prediction. Test data accuracy. So the model has never seen this data. Okay, so model dot predict X test. Okay, so Y test. So now we are uh, using our model to predict the test data and this uh, mo prediction of this model will be compared to the original labels which is Y test, okay? Test data accuracy. Now we need to print this accuracy score. So accuracy on test data. Test data accuracy. So we got a 76 percentage as accuracy score, which is really good. So which means out of 100 times, it can predict 75 times the correct object, whether it is a rock or mine. Okay. So we got accuracy score as 83 percentage for training data and 80, 76 percentage for test data. So our model is performing fine. Okay. So now let's, what we are going to do is, so we have a trained uh, logistic regression model. And now we are going to make a predictive system that can predict whether the object is either rock or it is mine using that sonar data. Okay, so now let's see how we can make this predictive system. So making a predictive system. So we need to give the input data. So I'm making a variable called as input data. Okay, so in this uh, parenthesis, we need to include the sonar data. So we have uh, seen this sonar data, right? So we will be uh, taking some examples for rock and mine and we will check whether our model is predicting uh, the rock and mine correctly. Okay, so this is the use of this code snippet. So once I complete the script, I'll uh, copy some values and put it and let's see whether it's predicting correctly. So input data. So once we get the input data, we, we, we have to convert it to a NumPy array because the processing on, on NumPy array is faster and it's more uh, easy. So it's basically changing the data type to a NumPy array. So a list to a NumPy array. So changing the input data. So I'll just make a comment here. So changing the input data to a NumPy array. So we will use the function numpy.asarray for this function. So input data as numpy array. So this is the variable I am giving it. So input data as numpy array is equal to np.asarray. So if you remember, we have imported the library numpy as np. So I'm using np instead of numpy. Okay, so np dot as array input data. So basically we are converting this list into a numpy array. And let's, let's take an example. Say for example, hmm, I'll open this from a notepad. Okay, so let's take some random example. Okay, let's take it. I think it is a rock. So as you can see here, this example is rock. So if we feed this data to our machine learning model, so it should predict that this is a, a rock. Okay, so I'll copy this. Okay. So I'll put this in this input data. So we have totally 60 features. So I have converted this input data. So this is basically a list. So we are converting it to a NumPy array. Okay. Now we need to reshape the data. Okay. So because we are just predicting for uh, 
one instance so for that purpose we need to reshape this array otherwise our model can be confused by the number of data points so we need to reshape the numpy array as we are predicting for one instance okay so input data reshape is equal to I'm copying this so input data as numpy array so we need to reshape this reshape 1 comma minus 1 so this 1 comma minus 1 represents there is one instance and we are going to predict uh, the label for this one instance so that is why we are reshaping this so once we reshape it we need to make the prediction so i'll create a variable called as prediction and i'll store the prediction of our model so model dot predict function is used to predict it so we have stored our trained logistic regression model in the variable called as model so as you can see here so i'm calling that uh, model function so model variable so model dot predict this input data reshape so this contains the features of our data okay so this data is present in input data reshaped okay so basically what happens is that this model dot predict returns either r or m as value okay so it uh, you know tells us whether it is uh, either a rock or a mine okay now let's try to print this prediction so let's try and run this so it should predict that this object represents a rock because we have copied the data for a rock right so i'll run this and yeah it predicted correctly that the object represents rock from this example okay and uh, let's include a if condition here or here that if we get r as our prediction it should say that the object is a rock and if we get m the object is a mine okay so as you can see here this r is included in a list so if this prediction is equal to r prediction zero is equal to r so i'm using this zero because this zero represents the first element of uh, the list here the list is uh, this prediction okay so the first element is r and we need to represent it with this index as zero so that's why i'm using uh, zero as the index here so if it is not uh, in a list i won't uh, include this as zero okay so if the first element of this list is equal to r we need to print that the object is a rock okay otherwise so else we need to print it is a mine so when it is m we need to print it is the object is a mine okay let's try to run this so as you can see here so we get the first element in the list as r so it tells us the object is a rock and we know that we copied the data of a rock now let's try to see whether our model is predicting the mine correctly so let's try to get some random value for mine and let's try to uh, let's let's find whether our model is predicting correctly i'll take this value so this is this value represents mine as you can see here there is an m so i'll copy this value let's see whether it's predicting correctly so if if our model is working correctly it should say that uh, it is m which means that the object is a rock so i'll just replace this okay now let's try to run this now it should say that say that the object is a mine so as you can see here it is predicting correctly that the object is a mine so this is how our predicting system works so i hope you have understood all the process we have done here so i'll just give you a short recap of how we are doing this
so first we have imported the dependencies so numpy is used for uh, making arrays and pandas is used for making a data frames and uh, we are using the libraries sklearn for uh, using the function train test split so it is used to split our data into training and test data and in this case we are using a logistic regression model so we are uh, importing that logistic regression function from sklearn.linear model and we are in, uh, importing the accuracy score to find the accuracy score of our model from sklearn.matrix then data collection processing so we have imported the sonar.csv file into our google collab environment okay so now we are feeding it to a pandas data frame by pd.read csv function so and i am storing that data frame in a variable called as sonar data so here we need to give the path of the file and since we have no header in this file so we have to mention that there is uh, header is none and uh, by the function yet we are just printing the first five columns of our pandas data frame and we find that the last column is a categorical column which says whether it is a rock or a mine so r represents rock and m represents mine then we are determining the number of uh, rows and columns we have so we have 208 columns which represents 208 data points so and uh, 61 features okay so 60 features and one label which is rock or mine then we have used the function uh, sonar data dot describe which gives us the count the number of uh, values we have mean and standard deviation and other statistical values then we are counting how many mine examples are there and how many rock examples are there and we find out that it is almost equal and then and then we are grouping the data based on mine and uh, rock and we find their mean values and uh, we get a quite difference in their mean values okay so as you can see here there is a difference in mean value of rock and mine for each of the column okay so now we are uh, splitting the data into all the features and all and uh, the labels so we are feeding all the features to the variable x and all the labels to the variable y okay now we are splitting our uh, x and y our data into training and test data okay so the training data is used to train our model and our model is evaluated with the help of test data right and then we are loading our logistic regression model in the variable model and uh, by the function model dot fit our model is trained it is just like a graph okay so in the x-axis there will be this features and the y-axis there will be labels okay and uh, the graph will be plotted so this is how model is trained so once we have uh, trained our model using the function model dot fit we are finding the accuracy score so first we find the accuracy score of uh, training data which is around 85 percent 84 percentage and then we find the accuracy uh, score for the test data which is around 76 percentage then we are making a predictive system where if we give the features if we give the data it can predict whether the object is a rock or a mine okay so this is how uh, these are these are all the procedures we have used in this use case so i hope you are clear with diabetes or not okay so we will be using one of the important machine learning algorithms support vector machine okay so we will do our coding in python and first of all let's try to understand about this uh, problem statement and let's try to understand about this support vector machine algorithm then let's get into the coding part okay so first of all let me explain you about the support vector machine model so this is one of the important algorithms of supervised learning algorithms okay so in supervised learning we uh, feed the data to our machine learning model and the machine learning model learns from the data and its respective uh, labels okay so here the labels are the most important things so what happens is in this case we train our model with uh, several medical information so such as the blood glucose level and the insulin level of uh, patients along with whether the person has uh, diabetes or not so this act as labels whether that the person is diabetic or non-diabetic so this will be the label for uh, this case okay so once we feed this data to our support vector machine model what happens is it tries to plot the data in a graph okay and uh, once it plots the data it tries to find a hyperplane so in this image you can see a hyperplane so what happens is that this hyperplane separates these two data okay so once we feed a new data to this model so it tries to uh, put that particular data in either of these two groups okay and by that it can predict whether the person will be diabetic or non-diabetic okay so in this case we use several medical information such as bmi of the patient uh, their blood glucose level their insulin level etc okay so now let's try to understand the workflow for this project 
so first of all we need this diabetes data okay so we will try to uh, train our model with the data and uh, the respective labels okay so before feeding this to our model so there are a lot of steps in between so we need to pre-process the data where uh, we will try to analyze the data and this data won't be uh, very suitable to feed to the machine learning model and we need to standardize this data because there are a lot of uh, attributes here a lot of medical information and we want all this data to be in the same range so what we do is we try to standardize all this data so that all this data lies in the same range so uh, all these things will be done in the data pre-processing step so once we pre-process the data we will split the data into training and testing data okay so we train our machine learning model with training data and then we try to find the accuracy score of our model with the help of test data okay so it tells us how well our model is performing okay so once we split the data into training data and testing data so we will feed this to a support vector machine model okay so we will be using a classifier model where this model will classify whether the patient has uh, you know patient is diabetic or non-diabetic okay so once we have trained it we have a trained support vector machine classifier so when we give a new data so it can now predict whether the patient is diabetic or non-diabetic so this is the workflow we will be following for this project okay so now let's get into the coding part so we will be doing it in google collaboratory so in our channel, I have already made a video on how you can access Google Collaboratory from your Google Chrome. So the index of that video is 2.1 and you can search it from there. Okay. First of all. So now we need to import the libraries. So I'll make a text here so that it's clear. Importing the dependencies. Okay. So first let's import numpy import numpy smp now let's import pandas so import pandas spd now we need to standardize the data so for that we need a standardizer function so from sklearn dot preprocessing Imports standard scalar. Okay, so this standard scalar will be used to standardize the data to a common range. Okay, from scalar dot model selection import train test split. So we will use the train test split function to split our data into training data and test data. Okay. From SKL import SVM. So SVM stands for support vector machine. Okay. Now we need to import the accuracy score from SKL dot metrics import accuracy score okay so numpy is used to make numpy arrays so numpy arrays are very helpful in our processing and pandas so pandas is mainly used for creating data frames okay so it is uh, useful to put our data in a nice structured table okay so then we use this uh, standard scalar to standardize our data and then we are train test split function is used to split our data into training and test data and we have of course uh, imported the model support vector machine and now uh, we have imported accuracy score so i'll run this so i'll press shift plus enter this will run this cell and automatically goes to the next cell okay so now we need to do the data collection part data collection and analysis okay so i'll upload the data file here so i'll give the link for this data file in the description of this video it's diabetes.csv okay so this data set is called as pama diabetes data set so i'll mention it here so you can also find this data set in UCA machine learning repository and Kaggle PAMA 
diabetes data set so you can search in the internet so you will find this data set in uca or kagala c set so basically this contains the informations of patient who has diabetes diabetes and those who doesn't have diabetes so it basically contains the data of females okay so there won't be any uh, data for males so it contains uh, various parameters such as the number of pregnancy they have gone through their blood glucose level insulin level etc okay now let's load this C, uh, data data in this csv file to a pandas data frame okay Loading the data set, the diabetes to a pandas data frame. Okay, so I'll create a variable called as diabetes data set. So this is called as a variable. And we will store the date of time in this variable. Okay, so sorry. So diabetes data set is equal to we need to use the function pd dot read csv. So this will load the csv, which is a comma separated value to a pandas data frame. Okay. So I need to co copy the path of this file. So go to this folders and in this options you can give copy path so once you copied the path you can paste it here and run this cell so you can also run it from pressing this run simply okay uh, for example like in some cases you may not sure what does a particular function does okay let's say that you don't know what this pd dot read csv uh, function does so you can uh, get the explanation for this function by typing this function here so pd dot read csv and include a question mark with it and run this cell so you will get this help section where you can see this uh, function and what are the parameters you need to include in this so you don't need to include all those parameters so you just need to in include uh, the main parameters such as the location of the file and other things okay so you can read why this function is used so it read a comma separated value file into a data frame okay so you can see the additional information here and you can see the parameters of this function okay so this features is very much helpful for us to understand what does a particular function does so you just need to mention the function and uh, include a question mark with it so this is one of the important feature of a google collaborator which is very helpful okay now let's try to print the first five rows of this data frame so we can use the function yet for this so we need to mention this uh, data frame name which is diabetes data set okay so so printing the first five rows of of the data set okay so mention this uh, data frame name which is Diabetes dataset dot yet. Okay. Now run the cell. So this will give the first five rows of our data frame. Okay. So as I've told you, this data set includes the data for all the females. So in that test case, so you can see the number of pregnancies, the blood glucose level, blood pressure, skin thickness. Okay. So this skin thickness is taken from the triceps. Okay. So this you know basically tells whether some fat or fat is stored in that particular muscle okay so then we have the uh, serum insulin level then we have the body mass index which is basically calculated by dividing the uh, weight by i squared okay and then we have a diabetes pedigree function which is basically a number which indicates some uh, you know diabetic value okay and then we have age and then we have outcome okay so these are the uh, labels this outcome part is the label where one represents uh, that the patient is diabetic and zero represents that the patient is non-diabetic okay so these are the labels so all these values will be either one or zero so we need to develop a system that can classify this data to either one or zero okay now let's try to see the number of rows and columns for this data set so 
so i hope everyone of you knows this feature but i'm just telling this for uh, new users who are just starting to learn python so we use ash in python to you know write a comment so if i remove this the python will recognize that it is part of the code so if i include a ash it assumes that we are writing some comment or some information about what do, what does this code do okay so you can uh, mention some description of what you are going to do by preceding the line with the ash okay so we are going to get the number of rows and columns in this data plane number of rows and columns columns in this data set okay so mention the data frame name diabetes dot diabetes data set dot shape okay as you can see here we have 768 column sorry 768 rows and 9 columns okay so 768 columns means sorry 768 rows means we have uh, 768 examples that means the data is taken from 768 people and we have nine columns these columns represent the features or parameters or attributes so these are the medical uh, informations that we are going to use for our prediction okay so leave this last column because this is the label and these eight are the important uh, features we are going to be needing for our prediction okay now let's get some statistical measures of this data frame so getting the statistical measures of the data okay so you can use the function describe and this will give the various statistical measures such as the mean of the data the standard deviation percentage etc okay so it will give all these values for all the seven seven or uh, eight columns we have okay so it uh, first count tells the number of uh, data points we have and mean gives the mean value of all these uh, all these columns okay for example this mean gives the mean value of glucose so we get that the mean value of glucose for all these data is 120 and those kind of statistical measures okay so then we have the standard deviation the minimum value 25th percentile 50th percentile 75th percentile and maximum value so percentile basically means let's say for example 25 percentile means so 25 percentage of the value are less than 99 and uh, in the case of blood pressure 25 percentage of the value are less than 62 so 50 percentage 50 percentile means so 72 uh, sorry uh, 50 percentage of the value of blood pressure or less than 72 so that is why uh, percentile is used and it is different from percentage okay so now let's see how many cases are there for diabetic examples and non-diabetic examples so diabetes data set outcome dot value counts so this value counts function so we you can see here i have mentioned this outcome here so basically what happens is it takes this outcome value and checks how many uh, examples are there for this one label and for zero label okay so i'll run this as you can see here so we have 500 values for the label 0 for the non diabetic cases and we have 268 values for the label 1 for those people who are diabetic okay so the proportion of non diabetic cases is more in this data set so this this is a, a pretty smaller data set so totally we have 768 examples so typically in a machine learning or deep learning uh, projects and use cases we generally use you know thousands and even lakhs of data okay so it depends on the data set that is available for us so the idea of this use case th this video i'm making is for you to understand what approach we will take for solving a machine learning project okay so for that purpose this data is sufficient okay now let me make a text here so we know that the label 0 represents 
non diabetic people so non diabetic okay and the label one represents people with diabetes so one represents diabetic okay now we can try to get the mean for all those value for this label 0 and 1 diabetes data set dot group by outcome mean so this will give the mean value for both these cases so it calculate these values for all the data set let's say for example we have this this label 0 and 1 and we get that the mean value for glucose for all those people who are non diabetic is 109 and the mean value of glucose all those people who are, who are diabetic is 141 so it is obvious that the diabetic people have more uh, glucose level in their blood right so and then we have the blood pressure value and all those things so this difference is very important for us because this is what the machine learning uh, algorithm will see and uh, detect that if a person has uh, you know these kind of values they can be diabetic or if, if a person has uh, the value in the range of some other value like say for example 140 or 150 it can predict that the person as diabetes okay so you can also see the age here so it is obvious that uh, uh, people with more age are more susceptible to get diabetes so these are some important insights we can get from this data okay so it's a good practice to always group the data set based on their labels now so what we will do is let's separate this data and label so we want all this data except this label in one particular uh, location and we want this label separately okay so i'll create a variable so let's i'll make a comment here separating data and labels okay so i'll create a variable called as x and we shall store all the data except the labels in this variable x so diabetes data set dot drop columns is equal to outcome comma axis okay so axis is equal to 1 and y is equal to diabetes data set outcome okay so basically what we are trying to do is so we are taking the variable x and we are dropping a particular column called as output so we are taking this data frame so you can see here we have loaded the data frame sorry the data set into the data frame called as diabetes uh, data set so in that i am dropping this particular column okay so that's why i am mentioning that i am going to drop a column and i'm going to drop the column outcome and I mentioned here that the axis is equal to 1. Okay, so if you are using this drop function, you need to specify that axis is equal to 1 if you are dropping a column. And you need to specify that the axis is equal to 0 if you are dropping a particular row. Okay, so I am getting uh, this x for all the values except the label. And now I am storing those all the labels in this variable y. Okay, so as you can see here, I'm taking this uh, diabetes data set. I'm taking only the outcome column. Okay, and I'm storing it in the variable y. So I'll run this. So this will separate the data set. Now let's try to print x and y. So I'll print x. So as you can see here, we have all the data except the outcome, which is the label. Okay, so as you can see here in the previous data frame, we have outcome and the data together. So uh, you can see here now we have separated the data in the variable x now let's print y which contains the labels as either 1 or 0 so 1 represents diabetic patients and 0 represents non-diabetic patients okay so totally we have 768 uh, rows so you have 767 because in python the indexing starts from 0 so totally there are 768 rows now what we are going to do is standardize the data okay so this is one of the important steps in data pre-processing data standardization okay now why we are doing this you can see here 
we have number of pregnancy year glucose value blood pressure value bmi etc so the range of pregnancies is you know 1 2 or 3 in that range and the glucose level is around 100 and 150 level and the blood pressure level is around 60 and 70 bmi is around 25 30 range okay so if there is a difference in the range of all these values it will be difficult for our machine learning model to make some prediction so in most cases what we will do is we will try to you know standardize the data in a particular range and that helps us uh, helps our machine learning model to make better predictions so that is what we are going to do here so if you remember we imported a function called a standard scalar so we are going to use this function for this purpose let me create variable called a scalar and let's load that standard scalar function standard scalar you need to import uh, include this parenthesis so this means we are taking one instance of this standard scalar function so i'll run this now we need to fit this data in this scalar so basically this scalar variable as this standard standard scalar function so we need to give standard scalar dot fit x okay so now we need to transform this data so i'll create another variable called as standardized data is equal to scalar dot transform x okay so basically what we are doing is we are fitting all these uh, inconsistent data with our standard scalar function and based on that a standardization we are transforming all the data to a common range okay so instead of using this fit separately and transform separately you can also use function like you know scalar dot fit transforms so this just fits the data and uh, do the transformation in a single step whereas we are uh, here we are trying to fit it separately and transform it separately you know in both cases it just gives the same values or same you know result so you can do any of them okay so this will fit and transform the data so that we get the data in the same range i'll run this okay now let's try to print this data in the standardized data okay as you can see here all these values are in the range of 0 and 1 okay so this will help our model to make better prediction because all the values are almost in the similar range okay now we can make this simple by giving this standardized data to the variable again to x so x is standardized data and y is again the labels which is diabetes data set outcome actually we have already done that there is no need to do this i'm just doing this so that you can remember that so we have already did this part here so as you can see here but this doesn't make any change okay so we are taking all this standardized data and feeding it to the variable x and we are uh, getting all these labels so you can see the column here so outcome label and we are storing it in the variable y and we will use this x and y for training our machine learning model okay so basically x represents the data and y represents the model okay so let's run this now let me print x and y so print x and print y so now we have all these data in the x and all the labels in y okay now we need to split our data into training data and text data so train test split so we need to mention four variables here x train x test y train y test okay so let me first just make the function and I'll explain you what this particular function does. So we have four variables x train, x test, y train, and y test. Okay. So we can use the function train test split. So you can see here we have imported this function train test split from the 
module sklearn dot model selection okay so train test split the important attributes of x y so x is the data and y is the label and test size so i'll give the text test size is equal to 0.2 i'll explain all these parameters in a minute stratify is equal to y random step is equal to 2 okay so basically what we are going to do is we are taking four variables so what these four variables means so we have x train and x test so this x so this x data will be split into two uh, arrays okay so the first one is x train and the second one is x test so we will train our uh, machine learning model with this x train data and then once the model is trained we will try to uh, evaluate our model with the test data okay so you can uh, compare it with this example consider that a person is studying for a max exam okay so he is solving several uh, questions in a particular book okay so the questions he is solving for uh, you know the questions he is practicing is like the training data and in the exams he will get you know new questions or uh, different questions that he haven't uh, solved or he hasn't solved okay so these questions are test data so that is the similar case we have here so we will train our model with the help of training data and we will test the model with the help of test data the idea here is the machine learning model should not see this test data okay so we want our model to make prediction on this unknown data and we will try to predict its accuracy okay so that is the reasons for having x train and x test okay so this y train represents all the labels for this x train data and y test represents all the labels which is one or zero which represents diabetic or non-diabetic for this x test data okay so this train test split will uh, function will give us four outputs and that outputs will be stored as x train x test y train and y test okay and then we are using the attributes here so x and y so we need to mention uh, the old data set here so the entire data set is given as x and the entire labels are given as y so from this the x train x test and y train y test will be splitted and then here we have the test size is equal to 0.2 so 0.2 represents uh, you know 20 percentage of data so this is for mentioning how much percentage of data you want for test data okay so here i am getting 20 percentage test data so you can also give 0.1 so if you give 0.1 that means uh, you are having 80 percentage of this entire data as, as training data and and the 10 percentage or 20 percentage as test data okay and then we are stratifying based on y okay so based on y means so y basically has the values as either one or zero so we want our data set to be split in the same proportion okay so for that purpose we are using the value y because if we don't mention this there is a chance that all the cases for diabetic will go to one uh, data frame say for example if we don't include this stratify all the diabetes cases may go to x train and all the non-diabetic cases may go to x test so that is the reason we are uh, using stratify y to avoid that where there will be you know similar proportion of diabetic cases and non-diabetic cases as they are in the original data set so that is the reason for stratifying this and then we have random state so random state is like let's say for example you are uh, you know making this similar code and you want to split the data in the same way i did so in that case you need to mention the number two so if i mention the number one the splitting of the data will be different so if you want to replicate that splitting you can represent one this is like an you know index or a serial number for a particular splitting of data okay so if i'm using two and while you are trying this code if you also use the number two so your data set will be splitted in the same way that uh, the data split is splitting for me okay so this is basically for replicating uh, code okay so i'll run this so this will split our data now we can check the shape of our x train x test and the original data set so the original data set is x and let's check the shape of x train 
and dot shape. Let's run this. So now you can see here there are totally 768 examples in our original data set. Out of those, 614 are going to be used for our training data and 154 will be our test data. Okay, so this is a good proportion where we took 20% of the data as test data. Okay, now we are going to train the model. So let me make a text here. Training the model. So I'll create a variable called as classifier. So classifier is equal to. So we are going to use this function SVM. So this is used to load our support vector machine. So classifier is equal to SVM dot SVC. So SVC represents support vector classifier. And we need to represent another parameter here, which is kernel. So kernel is equal to linear so we are going to use a linear model okay so we are using the support vector machine classifier and let me run this now this will load the svm model into this variable called as classifier and now we will fit our training data to this classifier okay training the support vector machine Classifier. Okay. So give so mention this variable which is classifier dot fit. So this is the training part. Okay. So we have to mention the training data. Here the training data is X train and the labels for this training data is Y train. Okay. So we need to mention both of them here. So X train, comma. Y train. So this basically represents the training data and the label for that training data. Okay. So this is a small data set. Hence we don't need much time for training. So if you are using you know thousands and lakhs of training data, it will take a long time for you to do that training. Okay. So this has trained our machine learning model. Now we can evaluate our model. So basically, evaluation is to check how many times our model is predicting correctly okay model evaluation so we will be finding the accuracy score so first let's try to find the accuracy score on training data so we will try to predict all these training data so we won't give the machine learning model this labels so we will uh, try to predict the label for all these training data and we will compare the prediction of our model to the original labels which is white ring and try to predict the accuracy score okay so accuracy score on the training data Let's make a variable called as x train accuracy. Okay, so x train accuracy is equal to classifier dot predict. Okay, so it's not accuracy, so we need to make the prediction. So x train prediction. Classify dot predict x train. So this will basically predict the label for uh, all these x train. Okay, so and we are storing all these labels in this uh, x train prediction variable. Okay, now we need to find the training data accuracy. Training data accuracy is equal to so we have imported the function accuracy score here so we are going to use that so accuracy score extreme prediction
and the original label which is X void train so what we are doing is we are using our trained machine learning model so once we fit our machine learning model here so our the mo our model is trained and this trained model is stored in the variable classifier now we are using that model to predict the labels okay so we are going to predict all the labels for x train so all those predictions made by the model are stored in this variable x train prediction now we are comparing the prediction of our model which is stored in this x train prediction with the original labels that is y train okay so this will give us the accuracy score of our model let's try to print this accuracy score so print accuracy score of the training data so accuracy score between you know if it's above 75 it's pretty good and in this case we are using very less number of data so there is a chance that we may get a uh, kind of low accuracy score okay so if your accuracy score is greater than 75 it's pretty good because you can use other uh, optimization techniques to increase the that optimal that accuracy score okay so now let's see whether our accuracy score is beyond 75 or it's less than that okay accuracy score on the training data so let's print it here so training data accuracy So as you can see here our accuracy score is 78.6 which is almost 79 and it is pretty good so it means out of the 100 predictions our model is predicting 79 times the correct predictions okay now we need to find accuracy score on test data okay so this is the important step because the model has already seen the training data because we are training the model basically with the training data and it doesn't make sense if we only evaluate our model based on that so we need to uh, use the model to predict some unknown data so it tells us that how well our model is performing okay so it's similar to the exam case where the student is exposed to uh, questions to which they are you know not practiced okay so now let's try to find the accuracy score on the test data so let me copy this here and just changes change this to test data so x test prediction Now we need to specify our test data so this will be test data accuracy we need to change all these so we are taking this x test and y test so you can see here that we we have split the data into x train and x test y train and y test so we have uh, trained our model with the help of this x train data now we need to test our data with the help of this X test okay so that is what i am doing here now let's try to find the accuracy score on test data and again we need to print the accuracy score so this time for test data so accuracy score of the training of the test data so i am just going to print this value here okay test data accuracy so the accuracy score is 77 which is again pretty good for this uh, you know small amount of data okay so we are getting the accuracy score as 78 for training data and the accuracy score for test data as a 77 okay so it is a good uh, you know evidence that the model has not over trained okay so over training represents the model just trains a lot on the training data that it cannot perform well on the test data so in that case the training data accuracy will be uh, very high and the test data accuracy will be very low so this exam so this concept is known as overfitting okay so we will be dealing all of those theories and concepts in the later module of our course okay and also we will be uh, you know seeing in detail about all those model examples the support vector machine logistic regression all those models in detail in the later videos okay so we have found the accuracy score for training and test data as of now now we need to make a predictive system that can predict whether a person has diabetes or not given all these data so we have all these data as pregnancy glucose blood pressure level skin thickness insulin bmi and diabetes pedigree function so we have all these data right once we give all these data our machine learning model has to predict whether that person has diabetes or not 
now we are going to build that system okay making a predictive system okay input data so in this array called as input data we need to give all those uh, medical information that is the glucose level insulin etc okay so this will be input data so we will fill this data later now we have to change this input data to numpy array say for example let's get some data so i have i have this uh, data set here let me open this okay so let me open this in notepad So we need to give these medical informations and the model has to predict whether the label is 0 or 1. Okay, so 1 represents diabetic patients and 0 represents non-diabetic patients. So let's just select a random example. Okay, so I'll just select this row. So as you can see here, the label for this, this particular data point is 0. Okay, so you can see the headers here. So the last value represents the outcome so here the outcome is zero which represents the person is non-diabetic okay so we are not including this data so we are taking all these data and we will feed this data to our machine learning model and it needs to predict that the outcome will be zero and which represents the patient is non-diabetic okay so i'll copy this value and paste it here so i'll be pasting this value in this input data okay now oh, I'll change this in input data to an numpy array. So this basically is a list. Okay, so list data type, and we are going to change this to a numpy array because the processing on, on numpy array is more easy and efficient. So we are going to change. So changing the input data to a numpy array. So we have already imported numpy as np as numpy array okay input data as numpy array so you can follow this same procedure for different projects where you you want to make a predictive system okay so this is just like a blueprint so this will remains almost the same for different uh, predictive systems so input data as numpy array np dot as array so this function as array will convert this list to an array so np dot as array so we need to mention this list name so which is input data so i'm pasting this here so this will convert this data to a numpy array now we need to reshape this data so reshape the array as we are predicting for one instance so what is the reason for this reshaping okay so our model is trained on 768 examples right so our model is trained on 768 example and there are totally eight columns in our model training but in this case we are just using one data point if we don't reshape the array what the model expects is it expects 768 data points or 768 values but we are just giving one so this will make a confusion to the model and hence we need to reshape the array and this reshape will tell the model that we are just going to need the prediction for only one data point so that is the reason for this so let me create the numpy array named as input data reshaped equal to input data as numpy array so we cannot do this reshape in list much so that's why we are using numpy array so it's more easy to do the reshaping in a numpy array so reshape is the function we are going to use for this so this reshape function belongs to the library numpy okay so reshape one comma minus one so this is the parameter for this reshaping so this will tell the model that we are not giving 768 examples but we are just 
you know trying to predict the label for only one instance okay so this will reshape that it now there is one more important thing we cannot give this values as such why because while training our model we have standardized the data so we haven't used the raw data as such now what we have to do is we have to do the same procedure here because if we give this data as such our model cannot make predictions correctly so we need to standardize the data in the same manner as we standardize our training data okay so we have already fitted this to the cx which is the training data and we need to use the same function scalar here so you, you don't have to fit it again you just need to transform it based on the scalar okay so you can do that by okay so i'll make a comment standardize the input data okay let me make a variable called as standard data std data is equal to so we have already made the function scalar so scalar dot transform input data reshape so we need to transform this data and store it in the array called as standard data okay now we can feed this standardized data to make the predictions okay let me print this standard data as well print std data now let's make the prediction prediction is equal to so we have made the machine learning model so we have trained the model and we have stored it in the variable called as classifier so this classifier has the trained support vector machine model so we need to use that uh, keyword sorry that variable classifier so classifier and for predicting we need to use the function predict so classify dot predict standard data okay so we are standardizing the data and we are feeding the standardized data to our machine learning model so you can note here that we haven't included the label here so the model has to predict the label correctly so prediction is equal to classify dot predict standard data and uh, I'll also print the prediction. Okay. Now the model has to predict that the person is non diabetic because we have taken the example for a non diabetic case. So you can see the label here zero. So I have to call the values here. Now the model has to give the label as zero, right? So let's try to print this prediction. So I am printing the prediction here. So you can run this. Okay, so module name number is as array. Okay, so I made a spelling mistake here. Okay. Sorry again. Okay. So this first two line represents our standardized data. Okay, so this is the data we are giving and this data is standardized based on our standard scalar function and this is the standard value. So you can see here it is almost in the same range and this uh, value is fed to our trained machine learning model which is stored in the variable called as classifier and we are predicting the label for this standardized data and we got the prediction from the model as zero. So you can check here that we took uh, the values for zero which is non-diabetic case and our model has predicted correctly the label for uh, this you know data so this is how you can use machine learning to predict whether that person has diabetic or non-diabetic let's do one more thing here let's say that if this value is a zero we need to print that the person is non-diabetic if the label here is one we need to say that that person is diabetic okay so we can use a simple if statement there so if prediction so this prediction value is stored in the variable called as predi called as prediction right so this is that prediction value and it is stored in a list okay so if prediction is equal to okay if this prediction value prediction 0 is equal to 0 
then we need to say that print the person was not diabetic else the other cases the person is diabetic if this value is not zero so in the other case the value will be one right so else we need to print the person is diabetic okay so now why i am mentioning this prediction and zero okay so basically this prediction is a list so it doesn't give an integer value but it give a list and this list has only one element okay so that's why i am mentioning this zero so prediction and if i mention the name of this list and mention zero in this uh, prediction it means i want the first value okay so the first value here is zero right so if the first value in the list prediction is zero then we need to print that the person is not diabetic okay otherwise we need to print that the person is diabetic okay so the important point to note here is the output we are getting from our machine learning model that is classifier will be a list and not an integer it doesn't print that you know either 0 or 1 but it prints 0 or 1 inside a list so this is a list because it it is surrounded by this square brackets right so we need to uh, you know mention the index of this value so the in index is given by 0 so if the first element inside this particular list or set is zero, that person is not diabetic. Otherwise, the person is diabetic, okay? So we have already took the example for this non-diabetic case. Once again, try to run this. So the value is zero. So as you can see here, we are getting the output as the person is not diabetic okay now let's try this for diabetic case as well let's again take some random values okay so i'll take this value 5166 so you can see here in this case the label is one that means the person is definitely diabetic okay now it should give the prediction as one and it should say that the person is of course diabetic okay so i'll just change this value and give this new value so this should predict that the label is one and the person is diabetic let's see whether it's predicting correctly so as you can see here it has predicted correctly for both diabetic and non-diabetic cases so this is how you can make a predictive systems that can uh, you know just predict the label with the given input data okay so uh, this is the agenda we wanted to do for this video and we have successfully completed it so let me give you a short quick recap so first of all we have imported all the dependencies so we have imported numpy for making numpy arrays pandas for creating the data frame and we have this standard scalar function to standardize the data and then we add a train test split to split our data into training and test data and we have imported the support vector machine model from sklearn and then we have uh, imported this accuracy score for finding the uh, you know for basically evaluating our model then we have loaded our data set which is which was in a csv file to a pandas data frame and we have named that data frame to diabetes data set so once we add that we just try to see the first five rows to understand about the data in this data set and then we have found the number of rows and columns in this data set and we have found some statistical measures like mean standard deviation percentiles etc Okay, then we have counted the number of values for diabetic cases and non-diabetic cases and here the label 0 represents the person with, uh, with who doesn't have diabetes and 1 represents those who have diabetes. Okay, so and then we have uh, grouped the data based on 0 and 1. So we have found the mean values for uh, patients with diabetes and non-diabetes. Okay, so we found that there was a difference in their glucose level. So basically the glucose level is more for the patient with diabetes and the age is also more for people who have diabetes so it's, it's one of the important insights we get from this data and then we have splitted the data and the labels separately and the, one of the most important step we have done is standardizing all this data because all this data was in different uh, range so we have standardized the data to have a common range between them so once we have standardized the data 
we have splitted the data into training data and test data so we took 20 percentage of our data as test data and then we have uh, loaded our model support vector machine classifier into the variable classifier and we have uh, trained our machine learning model with the help of x train and the their respective labels by train so once we have trained the model we have found the accuracy score on both the training data and the test data once we have a good accuracy score we made a predictive system that can predict whether a person has diabetes or not with the help of this input data okay so in this we have uh, reshaped uh, the array to tell the machine learning model that we are just trying to predict the output of only one instance and then we try to print this prediction and uh, we just uh, you know make a simple if statement that if this label is one we need to print that the person is diabetic if the label is zero then the person is non-diabetic we are going to discuss how we can build a spam mail prediction system using machine learning with python so this is one of the most important and interesting applications of machine learning as spam mails is something that we come across in our day-to-day -day life right so in this video let's try to understand how we can use machine learning effectively in order to predict which mails are spam mails and which mails are non-spam mails okay so that is the uh, end goal of this particular project and first of all i'll explain you more about this uh, problem statement then we can discuss about the workflow which we are going to follow for this particular project and then we can move on to the hands on path where where we will try to build a machine learning system that can make this prediction okay so let's get started as i've told you spam mails is something that we face in our day-to-day -day life and in a day you can uh, receive multiple mails and uh, more than 50 percentage of those mails can be spam mail so these can be something that uh, says that you have a job offer or you can get a discount or offer something like that and most of the time those won't be true and if you have email apps like, uh, like a gmail or other apps so those apps can find and uh, you know classify which mails are spam mails and which mails are non spam mails and the spam mails uh, you know end in the spam folder so we are going to build a similar system using machine learning that can correctly predict which mails can be the spam mails and which mails are non spam mails okay so we can classify mails as two types one is spam mail and the other one is the am mail so sp spam mail is nothing but as, as i have told you before so those mails claim to give you some offers and gifts and most of the time they won't be true okay so they they can be some kind of promotion as well say if, say for example i have given you an example here so this mail says free entry in a, in a, to a weekly competition to win fa cup uh, final tickets 21st may 2005 text fa2871121 to receive entry question so you may receive these kind of questions right so this is an example of a spam mail which is most probably going to be a false one so this won't be true most of the times right and there are other kind of mail called as am mails so am mails are nothing but non-spam mails so they can be the mails sent to you by your family members your friends or your co-workers and so on okay so if you read this message please go ahead with what's i just wanted to be sure do have a great weekend abiola okay so this is you know we can see this mail is nothing but sent by a friend to you okay so that's how you can classify mails one is the spam mails and the other one another one is the non-spam mails and the non-spam mails can be called as am mails and that is what we are going to do in this particular project so we are going to look at a uh, mail and predict whether that mail uh, comes under this spam mail or this comes under am mail okay so this helps us to determine which mails should go to the spam folder and which mails uh, should come to your inbox so that is the end goal of this particular project okay so let's see how we are how we are going to you know do this so this is the workflow that we are going to follow so first is that we need to get the mail data so we need uh, the data for both the spam mails as well as am mails and we will uh, use this data to train our machine learning model okay but we cannot uh, do it directly first we need to process this data and the second step will be data pre-processing as you might know that it is easier for a machine or a computer to understand numbers but it is uh, you know very tough for a computer to understand text and you know paragraphs so we will uh, do some processing where we will convert this text so we know that mails uh, will be in text and we will try to convert this text and paragraph into more meaningful numbers and that will be done in this uh, data pre-processing part and after that we will split our data set into training data and testing data where we know that this training data is used to train our machine learning model and the test data is used to evaluate our model okay so once we split our original 
original data set into training data and test data we will feed it to our uh, logistic regression model so the training data will be used to, to train this logistic regression model so in this case we are using a logistic regression model because it uh, logistic regression models are the best when it comes to binary classification problem binary classification means there will be two classes and we are uh, trying to classify these into two classes the two classes in this case are a, a spam mail and an am mail okay so we will train this logistic regression model with this training data and once you have done that you will have a trained logistic regression model now when you give a new mail your uh, logistic regression model will predict whether that mail is a spam mail or an am mail okay so this is what we are going to do in this particular video so first we will uh, get this mail data and once we process this data we will uh, split it into training data and test data and once we train this logistic regression model when you give a new mail it will uh, try to predict whether that mail is a spam mail or an am mail okay so this is the procedure that we are going to follow so with that understanding now we can move on to the hands on part okay so I'll uh, open my Google Collaboratory. So I have connected my Google Collaboratory system here. And uh, first of all, we need to uh, upload our system, upload our data set to the uh, Google Collaboratory environment. Okay, so just a second, I'll just close this. Okay, so the first step is, uh, updating or uploading the data set to this collab environment so you can go to this files option okay so here you will see an options called as upload to session storage or you can just right click here and give upload option and uh, now you need to upload the mail data set so this is the data set that i have uh, the name of this data set is mail data dot csv okay so csv represents comma separated value i'll give the link for this data set file in my video description you can download it from here you can also get this uh, data set from kaggle okay so it is available in Kaggle as well so once you have uploaded this uh, you know data set now we can do the coding part and if you are not sure about Google Collaboratory if you haven't worked up in Google Collaboratory um, you know I'll just give you a link in the cards where I, I have explained to you about what is meant by Google Collaboratory and how you can work on that okay so you can watch that particular video so now we can get started with our coding so the first part will be importing the dependencies okay so dependencies are nothing but the libraries and the functions that we need so here I'll just create a text as importing the dependencies okay so importing the dependencies so we need to import some libraries here so first of all i'll import numpy as np okay so these are some very important libraries that we generally use in machine learning so second i'll import pandas so import pandas as pd and uh, so numpy library is used to create numpy arrays so in most of the cases we need to create arrays and that's why we need this numpy library in order to create those numpy arrays and i'm uh, importing this numpy in a short form as np so this is the general convention we use okay and i'm importing pandas as pd so this pandas data uh, pandas uh, library is used to create data frames as you can see here these uh data set is actually in a csv format and it is not easy to analyze the data from the csv file so we need to uh, you know put that together in a uh, more structured table and that is what pandas is used for so pandas uh, helps us to create data frames which helps us to structure our data well okay so that's why we are importing the pandas library next we will import from sklearn so sklearn is another important library that is uh, you know used in machine learning and data science applications so from sklearn dot uh, model selection i'm going to import train test split function okay so as i've told you before we need to split our data set into training data and testing data and for that we need this train test split function and next we, we are going to import a vectorizer function so from sklearn dot feature extraction dot text import tf i df vectorizer okay so this the purpose of this tf idf vectorizer is that as i've told you before we need to convert the text data the text data in this case is nothing but the mail data into numerical values so we will convert them into more meaning meaningful numbers so that our machine learning model can understand it if you just feed the text data the machine learning model cannot understand it okay so that's the reason we are uh, converting these uh, text uh, you know text data into numerical values and for that we are using a tf idf vectorizer which we will use uh, you know in order to convert the text into feature vectors so feature vectors are nothing but numerical values okay so that's why we are importing this function tf idf vectorizer and we are importing it from sklearn.feature uh, extraction.txt okay so from this module we are uh, you know 
importing this tfidf vectorizer function and now we are going to import our logistic regression function so from sklearn dot linear model import logistic regression Okay, so I have already made video on uh, what is the intuition behind logistic regression and how you can build a logistic regression model from scratch. And uh, if you want to see that video, you can check out my uh, YouTube channel. So you will find that video there. Okay, so in this case, we are going to use a logistic regression model to classify the mail into spam mail or an am mail. And then we are going to import from sklearn dot metrics import accuracy score. So as I have told you before, we will split the data set into training data and testing data and this training data will be used uh, in order to uh, train our logistic regression model and uh, once we do that, we will use the test data in order to evaluate our model and that is the reason we are, uh, you know, importing this accuracy score function. So this accuracy score is used to evaluate our model in order to find how well our model is performing and uh, how many good predictions it is making. Okay, so these are the dependencies and the libraries that we need. So I'm going to run this uh, particular cell. So in order to run this cell, you can press shift plus enter. So it will execute this cell and go to the next one. Okay, so the first part is done. And now the next part will be data collection and pre-processing. So I'll just make a text here as data collection and pre-processing. So the first step will be to load the data from the CSV file. Uh, we have this mail.csv file, right? So we will load the data from this CSV file to a pandas data frame. So we have already imported pandas as PD, right? So that will be our next step in order to load the data to a data frame. So I'll make a comment here as loading the data from CSV file to a pandas data frame. So that will be the next step and I'll name this data frame as raw mail data. Raw mail data which is equal to pd.readcsv. So pd represents panda. So we have imported pandas in a, in a short form as pd. So pd.readcsv. So this readcsv function will uh, load the data from the csv file to a data frame. So readcsv and uh, we need to mention quotes here and within this quotes you need to give the location of your data set file so you can see this mail data.csv so you have to upload this data set file and once you upload this you can see this options menu here if you click that you can find this copy path option so copy the path from here and you can paste it inside this quotes okay so now i'll run this cell and this will load the data from my csv file to this raw mail data data frame so you can just try to print this uh, raw mail data okay I'll run this so you will have your data set here so the first column is category so which says whether it is a spam mail or an mail and the second uh, you know column is the message so this is the mails that we have okay so now there is a bit of a problem here so this data set contains a lot of missing values and uh, null values so we need to convert them into null strings so that will be our next part so we need to replace the null values with a null string so this is my next step so let's see how we can do that so we have this raw mail data and i'm going to take this data this uh, data frame and i'm going to uh, replace all the null values with the null string so you can think about null values as the missing values so i'll name uh, uh, i'll create a new data frame as mail data so mail data is equal to raw mail data so raw mail data is the data frame which we created before okay so raw mail data dot where pd dot not null so pd is pandas pd dot not null raw mail data comma so double quotes so there shouldn't be any uh, space with between this quotes so you just put double quotes here so mail data is equal to raw mail data dot where pd dot uh, not null raw mail data uh, this quotes so this where uh, function is used to carry out some condition so this condition is nothing but if i have some you know null values i want to replace it with uh, you know 
this uh, empty string or null string so you can call this as empty string because this string doesn't contain anything so it is just empty and we can call this as a null string so that is what represented by this double quotes okay so it's actually not a double quote it is a opening quote and a ending quote so please don't uh, you know use a double quote here i just uh, you know misspelled it so you have to use a opening quote opening single quote and a closing single quote okay so main data is equal to raw mail data dot where pd dot uh, not null raw mail data Comma, uh, one opening code and one single code oh, so this will replace all your null values with a null string so let's run this so i'll uh, press shift plus enter now we can uh, try to print the first five rows of this particular data frame okay so this will help us to see the sample of the data frame that we have so printing the first five rows of the data frame so the data frame is nothing but mail data right so mail data dot yet so this yet function will uh, print the first five rows of the column sorry the first five rows of this data frame okay so this is the serial number that we have and the second column or the first column so let's not consider the serial column uh, okay so the first column is category which says whether uh, the mail is an am mail or a spam mail and uh, the second uh, column is your message your mail okay so the first mail that we have is an uh, am mail the second mail as well as an am mail and the third mail is a spam mail and so on okay so this is how you can just see the sample of your data set now let's try to check how many uh, you know number of rows and columns are there or in other words, words how many uh, mails we totally have in our data set okay so the next part will be checking the number of rows and columns so we are basically uh, you know checking the size of our data set rows and columns in the data frame so as you can see there are only two columns here right so one is the category column and the another one is message column so i'll just try to print this so mail data dot shape so when you run this code it will give you the number of rows and column that you have in your data set so the first uh, value represents the total number of uh, rows you have and the second value represents the total number of columns so if you see the second value it is two so we know that we have only two columns so the first column is category and the second column is messages and the first value which is the total number of uh, rows says 5572 that means you have uh, 5572 different mails and we have the labels for all this mail the labels are nothing but whether that mail is a spam mail or an am Mail. okay so this is the data set that we have so, and this is not a small data set so we have good number of uh, you know data here so which is about 5572 mails right so we can go on to the next part now as you can see the labels here so one label is am and the another label is a spam right so what we are going to do is label encoding so in this case we will try to encode this label to numerical values so basically what we will do is we will try to change this uh, am and uh, we will replace all the you know text as am as one and all the spam value will be changed to one so this part is called as label encoding where we just want to replace this text value with numerical uh, you know numerical values and in this column we just have only uh, two values one is am and the another one is spam so this am will be numbered as uh, uh, you know one and this spam will be numbered as zero and this part is called as label encoding so i'll just make a text here so it's always a good practice to make this text and comments of what you are doing in a particular code because if someone sees your code, it you know it, it will help them to understand what you are doing in that particular cell. So that's the reason I'm making this uh, text and comments clearly. So it's a good practice for you to as well to include this uh, uh, text and comments in your code. So this part will be label encoding. So I'll just make a text as label spam mail as zero and non-spam mail that is am mail so i'll just name this as am mail just remember that am mails are nothing but non-spam mails so am mail as one okay so we have two kinds of mail and one is a spam mail and the another one is am mail so i'm uh, numbering the spam mails as zero and am mails as one so this is how we generally label our data uh, you know in our data set so say for example if you are predicting whether a person has diabetes or not you may uh, you know label a person with all a person with diabetes as one and a person without diabetes as zero and so on so these are called as labels and this is the label that we are encoding so one is zero and the another one is one okay so how we can label the data set is mention the name mail data dot loc i'll explain you what we are doing in this particular code i'll just complete this loc 
male data category is equal to spam okay so it's spam comma again category Mm. And there should be another bracket here is equal to zero. So basically, what we are trying to do here is so I'm taking this mail data data frame and I'm going to locate few values. So what values I'm locating is that so in this mail data data frame, take this category column alone. So we we don't want this message column, right? So we are not uh, encoding this part. We are just encoding the first column, the category column. So I'm mentioning or I'm taking this category column. So that's why I mentioned category. And if uh, the value is spam in this category column, so if the text in this category column is spam, and then in that case, I want to replace all the values with zero so that is what is uh, you know mentioned by this particular line of code okay so and i'll just copy this and now let's do the same for am mails as well so i'm going to name or i'm going to encode all the am mails as one so you just need to change this spam to am okay so i'll just number this as one so let's run this and see whether this works Okay, so what this basically do is the first line of the code will change all the uh, spam as a zero and all the am mails as one. So I'll just make a text here as spam will be represented by zero and am will be represented by one. Okay, so now we can. Uh, split the data set into uh, features and targets say for example what we are going to do is i'm going to separate this message and uh, this category separately so i'm going to separate the message and its labels so this part will be separating the data as text and labels okay so text and labels the text is nothing but the messages and the mails that we have and the labels are the category that you have whether it is a spam mail or an mail so the reason we are doing this is we will feed uh, the data and the label separately to your uh, machine learning model it's like uh, giving the x-axis value and the y-axis value it is similar to it so in this case your x-axis value will be uh, the text the messages that you have and the y-axis value will be your label whether it is one or zero okay so we basically take the features or the input data so in this case the input data is nothing but message and the output or target column is this category column so we generally take this uh, input column uh, input uh, feature or input column as x and this output column or target as y so i'm going to create two variables here one is x and the another one is y and i'm going to save all these messages in this x and all the labels in this y okay so x is equal to mail data which is the data frame that we have messages so the name of this second column is messages so we need to mention this so mail data and within this porch we need to mention message yeah so if there is no yes here so it is message and this y will be your labels so label is nothing but the category column so we need to mention it so y is equal to mail data category okay so this basically will separate your uh, data set into x and y where x will be uh, all the messages and y will be all the categories or labels so let's run this and now we can try and print this x and y separately so let's try to print x so it will print all the messages that we have and now you can print your y so y will be one or zero where one represents am mails and zero represents spam mails which we have encoded here okay so this is the next step and now what we are going to do is we are going to split this x and y into training data and test data so this is one of the most important steps that we do in all the machine learning projects we work on so as i've told you before the reason is one set of data will be used to train our model and the other set of data will be used to evaluate our test our model so this part is train test split or I'll just write this as splitting the data into training data and test data. Okay, so if you remember, we have imported the function train test split, and we are going to use this function in order to split our data set into training data and test data. So 
in order to do this, we need to mention four uh, arrays. So the first array is x train, second array is x test, third array is y train, and your last fourth array is y test. So basically what these four arrays are, so we have this uh, X and Y. So the X is the entire data set that we have. So X and Y are the total data set that we have. And I'm, now I'm going to split this X into two parts. So one part of the X will be your training data and the other part will be your test data. So similarly, we will split the Y. So all the corresponding X values will be split correspondingly. So all the training data messages or the, all the training data mails will go into this extreme and the corresponding labels, all the labels for those training data will go to the this y train and the remaining x test so the testing data for all the mails will go to this x test and the corresponding labels for all the mails in this x test go to this y test okay so this is how we generally split our data set into training data and test data and i'll uh, use the function that we have imported which is train test split function and within this function you need to mention the parameters such as x y because x and y are the data set which we are going to split right so you need to mention this so your train test split function now uh, will split your x and y into two uh, you know these four arrays where uh, two arrays are your training data and the other two arrays x test and y test so your x train and your y train are the training data and x test and y test are your test data okay and uh, there are few other parameters that we need to mention so i'll mention my test size as uh, 0 0.2 test size is equal to 0 0.2 okay so test size is nothing but the amount of uh, data you want in your test uh, you know data set let's say uh, let's say that we have totally 100 data points in our data set so uh, generally what we will do is we will uh, take 80 percentage or uh, 90 percentage of the data as training data and we take uh, 10 percentage or 20 percentage of the data as your test data so generally training data will have will contain more data points okay so here 0 0.2 represents 20 percentage of data so if uh, totally we have a uh, 5571 mails right so out of this 80 percentage will go to your training data which has x train and uh, y train and the remaining 20 percentage of the data will go to the x test and the y test so you need to mention how much uh, number of data points you want in your test uh, data so that is your test size and finally we have random state so random state is not a very important aspect it is actually a very simple one so you can give any uh, values for your random state so i'll just give three so uh, the reason for this random state is when you use this train test split function so each time you use this your data will be split in a different way okay so uh, the first time you split your data it will be in a different manner so and the next time you split the data and different uh, mails will go into the training data and test data so if you want this uh, data to be split in the same way in all the cases then you can mention a random state 3 so let's say that you are practicing this code and you are splitting your uh, data set so if you mention random state is equal to 2 then your data set will be split in a different manner but if you uh, just use this random state is equal to 3 as I have used your data will be splitted in the same manner that uh, my data is splitting so this is just to reproduce the code this is uh, you know used in order to split the data exactly in the way that we want okay so you can give any uh, you know number for this random state so we are creating four arrays which are x train x test and y train and y test so x train is not x train is your uh, training data messages and uh, your x test is the test data messages and your y train is the label for this training data and y test is the label for this test data and we are using this train test split function and we have four parameters here x and y because we are splitting this x and y uh, right so x and y are the total data set and we are splitting them and the next one is uh, test size which is the amount of data you want in your test size so 0 0.2 means 20 percentage of data go into your test uh, data and if you mention 0 0.3 that means you are taking 30 percentage of the entire data set as your test data and finally we have the random state so i'll run this i'll press shift plus enter okay so you can also try to print the shape of x train uh, so i'll just print the shape of x first so x shape so let's print x shape and we can also print x test and uh, let's print x train as well so let this be x test and the second one be x train so let's see how many data points goes into x train and x test okay i need to mention x train dot shape so 
so this will give the total number of rows and uh, columns you have okay so x uh, dot shape contains 5572 rows so the second value is empty so empty means there is only one column as you can see here x contains only one column which is all these messages so you don't need to look at this serial number column so that doesn't comes under column so this is the only column that we have and hence you, have, you don't have any value here okay so your original data set contains 5572 data points and out of those values 80 percentage of the data 4457 will be your x train and the 20 percentage of data triple one five will go to your x test okay so this is how you, we can split our data into training data and test data so the next part of the code is to split your uh, data sorry to convert your text data into numerical values as i've told you before if you feed all this text to your logistic regression model it doesn't understand anything so we need to convert this all this text data into meaningful numerical values okay so that is the next part and this part is called as feature extraction okay so i name this uh, as feature extraction as you might remember that we have imported the tf idf vectorizer uh, function in order to convert this text value in, uh, into numerical values okay so just a second okay so uh, the thing that we are going to do here is transform the text data to feature vectors that can be used as input to the logistic regression model okay so that's what we are going to do now so we need to convert this text data into feature vectors feature vectors are we know that vector is uh we know some numerical values so we are going to convert those text into those numerical values so that we can feed those values to our logistic regression so those uh, numerical values will act as the input data okay so I'll, I'll create a variable as feature extraction and in this feature extraction i'm going to load the tf if tf idf vectorizer okay so this is the function i'm going to use and we need to uh, mention certain parameters here one is uh, minimum df min df i'll explain you what this means i'll just complete this so min df is equal to one stop words Stop words is equal to English and uh, lowercase is equal to true. So these are the parameters that we need. So three parameters. So first of all, let's try to understand what does this TF IDF vectorizer does. So I have made a separate video on this feature extraction of text and uh, uh, what is this TF IDF vectorizer and how this works. And if you want a very detailed explanation on this, I'll give the link for this particular video in this video description. You can check that video after watching this one. Okay. So, but I'll just give you a, a short explanation of what this TF IDF vectorizer does. Okay. So first of all, it looks at this data and if you just uh, see all the spam mails uh, all the spam mails may contain the words like free offer discounts and so on okay so this uh, tf idf vectorizer try to go through all the words in your document so in your in this the document is nothing but the data set that we have so it will try to go through all the words in this document and uh, if the word is repeated several times it will get some values let's say a particular word is repeated thousand times in this entire uh, data set then it will get some score if a uh, word is repeated only under times it in, then it will get a smaller score and so on okay so similarly it will try to uh, give some value or give some score to all the words that has been present in our data set okay and this is uh, the most important one so this uh, value so this uh, importance score or the weight score is used by our model to uh, find which uh, you know uh, mails can be spam mails or which mails can be am mails say for example as i've told you before there is a possibility that uh, the spam uh, mails can contain the words like free offer discounts and so on so these all these words will uh, contain uh, these words and I, we have already named this uh, spam mails as zero right so now what the logistic regression model will do is 
link all those uh, you know words like free discounts and so on so they all all of those things get some numerical values uh, get some feature vectors as numerical values and they will be related to this uh, label spam which is zero okay and other mails will get some other score so uh, you know the first mail is an amel so go until uh, juron point and so on so all these words will get some other score values and uh, all this will be linked to this target so this is our model can find the difference between spam mails and amels by going through that importance value that score value which is given by the tf idf vectorized okay so that is the step which we are doing here so we need to convert uh, this text into uh, numerical values so these numerical values are like the importance number so if a word is re repeated many times it will get get a particular score and if a number is repeated uh, or if a text is repeated less number of times it will get some other score so that is how a tf idf vectorizer works and uh, as i have told you before please watch that uh, video on feature extraction and tf idf vectorizer so if you want a uh, uh, more detailed explanation okay and here we have used uh, some parameters so the first parameter that we use is minimum or min uh, underscore df so this is basically that if the score of a particular word is uh, less than one then we we need to ignore it okay so if the score is maximum if the score is more than one okay so if the score is greater than one for a particular word then we can include it so this basically means that if a word is not repeated if the word is repeated only once in that case we don't want to use those words because those words won't be uh, that important for our prediction okay so this is uh, the reason for using this min df which is nothing but the minimum uh, score uh, that is given by this vectorizer to a particular word okay so this this is value this score will be uh, given to all the words individually and the next uh, parameter that we have is stop words and in this stop words we have this uh, parameter called as english so stop words are those words that will be repeated multiple times in a document so we have the words like kiss was are etc right but these words doesn't make much sense and much meaning say for example you have this uh, the word did is the and so on so all this we don't want all these words so these are common words that will be uh, be there in all the main so we don't want all these uh, words so uh, those words are called as stop words and we want to ignore that those words so when you give stop words in is equal to english uh, it will contain all these set of words that are not important for us and all those uh, words will be ignored from our document or our data set. So that will be your second parameter and finally we have lowercase. So basically all the letters will be uh, you know changed to lowercase letter which is better for the processing. So these are uh, the three uh, main parameters that we have. So minimum df will uh, choose all the words that have uh, more score that our uh, higher score that one and the second parameter is stop words so all the stop words will be removed the words that doesn't have much meaning and the third one is uh, converting all the letters into lowercase letter so i'm basically loading this tf uh, the idf vectorizer into this variable called as feature extraction so i'm loading one instance of this tf idf vectorizer now we need to use this uh, vectorizer function uh, in order to convert this uh, data set okay so that will be our next step so I'll create an array as extrain features and I'm going to uh, convert my extrain as you know this extrain uh, uh, we have split the data set into extrain x test y train and y test we don't need to convert this y train and y test because they they just contain the values as one and zero so we don't need to do anything with it we just need to change the values of x train and x test so it will contain messages like this so we need to convert them and i'm going to convert all these messages into numbers and i'm going to store it in x train features okay so this x train the messages in this x train will be converted into numerical values and those will be stored in this uh, array called as x train features so in this we need to use feature extraction so x train features is equal to feature extraction feature extraction dot fit transform so this feature extraction is nothing but your uh, tf idf vectorizer as you know that we have loaded this tf uh, idf vectorizer into a variable called as feature extraction and now i'm uh, going to use this feature extraction for the processing so extrain feature is equal to feature extraction dot fit transform so this will basically fit your uh, data so the data is nothing but all the mails that we have so it will fit all those mails into your vectorizer function and this vectorizer function once it has fitted to this data it will transform so uh, there are basically two steps that are happening here one is fitting all this data into your vectorizer and after that it will transform all the data into feature vectors which are nothing but numerical values so in that you in this parenthesis you need to mention what we are going to convert so i'm going to convert my x train into features right so we need to mention this x train here 
So this is our next step. And similarly, we need to convert uh, all the messages in this X test to X test features. So that will be our next array, which is X test features. And one main thing that you need to remember here is feature extraction tra dot transform. So here we don't uh, fit the data again. So we will just fit the data only with the training data. Okay. So we don't fit the data again for the test data. So th there are basically three steps. So the first step is fitting the data or fitting uh, this uh, uh, training data into your vectorizer and using this uh, vectorizer to transform your X-train and using the same vectorizer in order to uh, transform your X-test. Okay. So this parenthesis should contain X-test. So the main thing that you need to do is you shouldn't uh, you know write uh, feature extraction dot fit transform in the second case. So we don't want to fit our vectorizer to our X test data because we don't want our model to look at this X test. So that is the reason. So we just want to fit our data with the X train and based on that fit we want to convert the X train and uh, X test into their respective features. Okay, and I'll just also do a small thing here. I'm going to convert Y train. And whitest values as integers. So basically, what we are doing is we have labeled this as one and zero, right? So sometimes this will be uh, considered as uh, you know strings, as you can see the data type here as objects, right? So sometimes the, uh, this is what happens, and we don't want that. So I want to convert all those values as uh, integers. So if we convert all the values as integers, then it is then it is easier for our machine to uh, understand it. So we are going to convert all the values as integers. So I'll just take X train and the X test, sorry, Y train and Y test. So Y train will contain all the labels for X test. So Y train is equal to Y train dot as type in. So I'm taking all the values inside this uh, Y train and I'm converting all of them into integers. So the reason is that this one and zero won't be considered as uh, you know integers. They will be considered as some objects or strings. So that's the reason we are doing it. So this is not a big deal. So next we need to do the same for y test. So y test is equal to y test dot as type int. So it's it's basically the same thing. So let's run this. Okay, so the first part of code is uh, loading the TF-IDF vectorizer. So once we load it, we will convert all the X train and the X trace into uh, their corresponding feature vectors. And after that, we are uh, converting the Y train and Y test into integer values, which are one and zero. Okay, so now you can try and print your X test and uh, X train. I'll print X train. Now, as you can see, I Sorry, so X train is nothing but uh, your data which is not been transformed. So X train is your original data, this uh, text data. Now let's try to print our X train features. Okay, so this X train features will contain only numerical values. So now I'm going to uh, print X train features. Okay, let's see how this looks like. As you can see here, now it contains a lot of numbers. So basically what happens is, if you take this uh, first sentence, uh, as I've told you before, each sentence will get some score based on the vectorizer function and it will be given that score. So this is how you, you can convert uh, your text data into numerical values. It's not like you can convert them into any numerical value. So it's not like that it should have that meaning and that meaning will be given by this TF-IDF vectorizer. Okay, so this is how your x looks like and this is how, how your x features look like. Okay. so now uh, we don't use this X train, but we will use this X train features because they are numbers. And as I've told you, machines understand numbers better. Okay, so this is the training data that we are going to use. So uh, I'll just uh, clear this output because uh, uh, it is not that much tidy. Okay, so we have X train, which is all the messages, which is in the form of text, and then we have X train features. So it is basically the same X train, but it is rep represented in a numerical way. Okay, so that is the difference. So and now we are in the end stages of our code. So now let's. Uh, uh, train our logistic regression model okay so this part of the code will be training the machine learning model that we have so in this case also mention another text as logistic regression okay so model so i'll create a variable as model so i'm going to load an instance of logistic regression model and if you remember we have imported the logistic regression function from uh, sklearn dot linear model okay so I'm going to load this model is equal to 
logistic regression parenthesis okay so this will load your logistic regression model to this particular variable i'll run this and now you can fit your extreme features and your y train to this logistic regression model so this part will be training the logistic regression model with the training data okay so i'm going to use the word model so model is nothing but your logistic regression so model is a model dot fit so model dot fit is so as i told you you need to give two values one is like the x-axis value and the uh, other is y-axis values kind of things so your x-axis value is nothing but your x train features and your uh, y-axis value is your y train okay so x train features is nothing but uh, all the training data but it is represented in a numerical form and y train contains all the corresponding labels okay so label in the sense one represents a male and zero represents a spam male so all those males so let's run this and once you run this your logistic regression model will be trained okay so now if you give a new male it will tell you whether that particular male is a spam male or an am male so this is how uh, this generally works okay so before going into the predictive system now we need to evaluate our model so we need to check uh, how many good predictions how many correct predictions our model is making so that is the next part and this is called as evaluating the model so evaluating the trained model okay so that will be our next step so first i'm going to predict on training data prediction on training data so basically what we are doing here is so we have used this x train features and y train in order to uh, train our model now what i'm going to do is as our model is trained i'm going to give only this x train features and i'm going to ask my model to predict the y train values so i'm going to give all the males and, I, and i'm going to ask my model to predict whether it is a spam male or an am male so it will basically try to predict whether the value is one or zero okay so and i'm going to check how many correct values it is predicting so i'm going to uh, store all the values predicted by my model as prediction on training data okay so prediction on training data is equal to model dot predict so fit is the function so as you can see here fit is the function which is used to fit our logistic regression model to the data set so it is like training our model and for predicting we are we are going to use a different function called as predict so model dot predict x train features okay so as you can see here i'm just giving the x train features values alone but i'm not giving this y train so my model will now find this y train values and it will be all those values one or zero so all those value values will be stored in this prediction on training data okay and now i'm going to compare the values predicted by our model and the true value so the model the values predicted by our model is stored in this particular array and the true values are nothing but y train so we need to compare them so this will be your accuracy on training data okay so accuracy on training data is equal to accuracy score so uh, as you may re remember that we have imported this accuracy score function from sklearn.matrix so i'm using this function again so accuracy score on accuracy on training data is equal to accuracy score so you need to mention two values one is the true value and the predicted value so the true value is nothing but your y train values and your predicted value is prediction on training data okay so prediction on on training data okay so let's run this and now let's find the accuracy score value okay so let's try to print the value i'm going to print accuracy on training data so accuracy on training data is equal to accuracy on ea let's name this as data i'll just copy this value and you will get some value here so let's see what is the value so the value is 0 0.967 so 0 0.96 basically represents 96 percentage that means 
out of 100 predictions so if you use your model to predict 100 different males it will give you correct value for 96 males so that is your accuracy value so 0 0.9 means 90 percentage 0 0.8 means 80 percentage and 0 0.96 means 96 percentage okay which is a very good accuracy score so if you get an accuracy score of 75 more than 75 percentage 80 or 85 percentage then we can say that it is a good model and you are getting an accuracy score of more than 95 percentage that means your model is working really well okay so that is one main thing that we can remember and now we need to find the same the you know accuracy score for test data as i've told you before we will train our logistic regression model with training data which is x train and x test and then we will test our data with sorry x train and the y train and we will test it or evaluate it evaluate it with x test and y test right so we need to evaluate it with the test data and you might wonder that uh, you know why i am doing this with training data like uh, i have told you before that we need to test it with test data but if if you can see here i have tested it with uh, training data so that is one main thing or uh, one main reason why i have uh, done this so i'll just explain you in a minute but before that let's do the same thing with test data as well so i'll just copy this code i just need to change few things so i'm going to predict using test data okay so prediction on test data so i'll change this to test okay and this will be your x test features x test y test and uh, accuracy on test data so i'm basically repeating the same thing the only difference is that so instead of using this explain features i'm using the x test feature so this is predicting using the test data set so prediction on test data prediction on accuracy score okay so everything is perfect so let's run this and again we will try to find the accuracy score Let, let's print it so i'll just change this to test data and this should be copied and pasted here let's see what's our accuracy score on test data okay so your accuracy score on test data is 96.5 percentage which is not very much different from your training data accuracy now the reason i am trying to find the accuracy score on both training data and test data is that in some cases your model may overfit so overfitting is a problem that occurs uh, you know uh, most of the times in machine learning so in that case what happens is your model performs well on your training data set so you will get a very high accuracy score on your training data but when you predict it using the test data you will uh, get a very minimum test uh, accuracy score say for example let's say that we are getting an accuracy score of 96 percentage in the training data and let's say that if we get only 60 percentage accuracy in your test data that means uh, the difference is so huge in your training data and test data in that case we can say that our model is overfitting that it basically means that our model has over trained from the data okay so and we don't want that we want a general solution we don't want our model to over learn anything from the training data and that is the reason we are checking the accuracy score on training data and the testing data as well so the reason we are doing this is i'll give you an analogy for this uh, overfitting let's say that there is a person and this person is a uh, studying for some exam so let's say that he is studying for a max exam and uh, he has practiced all the questions that has been uh, given in a particular book okay so if all the questions are asked in the exams he can perform well but if the examiner asks different questions that are related to those which have studied he may not uh, perform well so this is basically what happens in the case of overfitting so if you just uh, test it with all the data that uh, that the machine has studied which is training data so it is nothing but all the you know problems that a person has uh, solved in that particular max book so if you ask all those questions you can perform well but if you ask something outside uh, the book he cannot answer so we don't want that kind of a case in our machine learning model so it should uh, perform well in the mail or uh, in the data set that the model has not seen so this basically what this means is like if all the mails is similar to those that you add in your x train your model can perform well but if you use a new mail if you you know give a new mail that your model has not seen it may not perform well so in that case what you will have is a very low accuracy score on your test data okay so the one main thing that you can uh, you know uh, do in order to find whether your model has not overfitted is to check the accuracy score on time in return test data if the difference is not uh, very huge then you can say that your model is working well and your model is not uh, overfitted as you can see here the accuracy score are very uh, you know similar so in that case we can say that our model doesn't overfit okay so that uh, that is the reason for it and we get a very good accuracy score of about uh, more than 96 percentage which is really good okay and uh, now we are in the final part of our code now what we are going to do is build a predictive system so this predictive system what it will do is if you type in a new mail your trained logistic regression model will predict 
whether that mail is a spam mail or am mail so what it basically does is it will try to predict this uh, zero or one value so if you give a new uh, you know mail it will try to predict whether uh, the label is uh, zero or one so if the label is zero we call it as a spam mail if the label is uh, one we, then we can call that as an am mail okay so that's what we are going to do in our next part of code and this is building a predictive system okay so i'll uh, create an array as input mail and store the data in a uh, list format so what i'm going to do is i'm going to choose a mail from my data set i'm going to uh, paste it in this particular list so i have my uh, mail data set here i'll just open this with notepad okay so you can just copy any mail here so we can just copy some mail so i'll just uh, you know randomly copy some. okay so i'll just take this mail so if you can see here this mail is an am mail so the first word all the first word in each line represents its category it's a target which is spam or am and the second part of this line represents the mail so i'll copy this uh, particular line so and i'm going to feed it to my uh, machine learning system my logistic regression model okay so i have pasted the mail here so now i need to give this to my uh, model so and another main thing is you need to enclose it within a uh, coach so i'll enclose it within double quotes here so the reason i'm using double quotes is as you can see a single quote here right so if i just use a single quote here what it will consider this uh, it will consider this i as a string so we don't want that so in that case you can just use double quotes so double quotes and uh, here there should also be double quotes okay so i'll enclose all the string uh, in this double quotes and now i'm going to feed this to my machine learning system so if my model is working correctly then it should predict that this particular mail is an am mail or it should basically give the target value as my target value for am mail is one okay so it should give the value as one so that's what we are going to do now so input mail and I'm going to convert this as, as you know that we need to convert this text to numerical values, right? In order, in, we, we need to convert it to feature vector. So in order to do that, we are going to use the feature extraction. So it is the same thing that we have done here. So we will take this particular message and we will transform it using this feature extraction dot transform. Then it will convert this to numerical values. So the second part is convert text to feature vectors okay so i'll name this as input data features so input data features is equal to feature extraction dot transform input data so i'm sorry input mail okay so basically what i'm doing is i'm taking this input mail and i am fitting it with uh, this feature extraction dot transform so that it can convert it into feature vectors which are nothing but numerical values and i'm storing all those numerical value to this input uh, data features okay and now we can try to make our predictions so the next part is making predictions and uh, your prediction will be i'll store my prediction in the keyword prediction so prediction is equal to model dot predict as i told you we will use the fit function in order to train our model and we will use the predict function in order to predict the label value so model dot predict input mail features or input data features input data features and i'm going to print my prediction value okay so this is actually a very simple step so i'm just taking a new mail and i'm converting this mail into a uh, numerical values using this feature extraction part okay and i'm trying to predict the value so model dot predict so this particular line will give you the value as either one or zero and i'm storing that value in this variable called as prediction and i'm trying to print the prediction so we know that this mail is an am mail right so this mail is an am mail so i should get the label value as one because we have labeled all the am mails as one so i'll run this as you can see here we get the label value as one so we know that one basically represents 
and am male so uh, as we know that this is uh, basically an am male so we can say that our model has predicted correctly okay so I'll just uh, include uh, another simple part here so i'm just going to create an if else condition so this prediction value will basically be you know contained in a list as you can see here uh, there is a square bracket and within the square bracket uh, there is one so basically when you predict something using your model that value will be stored in a list so uh, what i'm going to do is i'm going to check this value and i'm going to tell that if this value is equal to one um, then I, I i just want to print it as am mail and if this value is equal to zero i want it to print as a spam mail okay so i'll just create an if condition here so if prediction so prediction is nothing but the list you get as your output okay so if prediction zero is equal to one so this zero basically represents the first element in your prediction list so let's say that uh, uh, let's create a list as my list okay so my list is equal to so let's say that my list contain some values as one two three and so on so if you want to print the first value so what you will do is my list um, no you mentioned square bracket and zero so i'm going to print this so it will print the first value which is one okay so this is how you can print the first value in a list so my list zero is zero is nothing but your first value and if you want to print the second value you just give one as uh, your value so similarly my list contains only one value right so we need to uh, mention the uh, you know index of the value so prediction zero basically means i am having a prediction list and i want to print the first value in that list so that's the reason we are doing this so if prediction uh, square bracket zero is equal to one so this basically means is if the first value in my prediction uh, array is equal to one then i want to say that it is an am mail okay so it is an am mail or else so the other condition else is nothing but it is in spam mail okay so print spam so if the value that okay so it's spam mail so we need to enclose it in quotes so basically what we are trying to do here is yeah i'm trying to find the value of this prediction and if the value of this prediction is equal to one and i'm going to call this am mail if uh, i get the value as zero which is the else condition it uh, it will print it as a spam mail okay so we can just enclose this in a bracket and now let's run this it will give you the label as well as it will tell you whether the mail is an am mail or spam mail so you can uh, what you can do is if you take some uh, spam mail example and if you paste that particular uh, line in, inside this bracket so you can just remove this uh, part and you can instead of this mail you can print uh, you know you can copy and paste a spam mail and you can try to predict uh, the label as well as uh, you know when you do that it will basically give you the label as zero and it will tell that it is a spam mail so that is the predictive system that we are making so that's it for this particular pro project and i hope you have understood all the things covered in this particular video i'll just give you a quick recap of all the things that we have done here okay so that it will be useful for you so the first part is importing the dependencies so the dependencies are nothing but the libraries and the functions that we need so we have uh, imported the numpy and the panda so we know that numpy is used in order to create numpy arrays so i think we didn't use numpy anywhere in this particular code but in most of the cases you will need numpy array so it is a good practice to import it so i mean i have imported numpy as cnp and then i have imported pandas so pandas is used to create a data frame like this okay in, they are used to put put the data in a structured data frame and i'm importing it in a short form as pd then i'm importing the train test split function which is used to split my data into training and test data where training data is used to train my model and test data is used to evaluate our model and we are using tf idf vectorizer in order to uh, transform the text into numerical values and we are importing the logistic regression model and finally accuracy score in order to find how accurate our model is so that is the first step and then we are uh, you know uh, uploading our data set to the collab environment so i'll give you this data set file you can uh, download it from this from the link in the video description okay so, and we are taking this uh, csv file and and we are loading it to a data frame so after that we are uh, replacing all the null values with null string and next part is checking the first five uh, rows of the data frame and the next part is checking how many rows and columns th there are and then we are replacing this spam uh, by zero and am as one so we are basically doing label encoding and then we are splitting the x and y so x is nothing but all your messages or mails and your y is the category so category is nothing but spam or am which 
which is represented by 0 and 1 okay and we are trying to print it and then we are splitting our data set into training and test data and the next part is converting your text data into feature vectors which are numerical values and after that we can feed those data to our logistic regression model and after that we are evaluating our model so here we are trying to find the accuracy score both on training data and test data as well and the final part is building a predictive system and this system will tell you whether that mail is a spam mail or an am mail if you put that in this particular bracket okay so i hope everyone is clear up to the things covered in this video and i